Crime and Curses R.I.P. Magic Academy Paranormal and Supernatural Prison Series Book 2 By E. Hall Copyright 2020 E. Hall All Rights Reserved December Chapter 1 J.J.'s smile stuns me. However, when it slides over to Honey, cheering from a nearby seat in the rumpus stands, my heart sinks. Their eyes hold and lock. Her grin suggests a kind of cockiness that can only come from Reptivik's Queen Bee. I don't know how to feel about J.J. It was my suggestion we pretend our kiss didn't happen. Anyway, it was less of a kiss and more, let's prove that we can't be friends or anything more. Going from hating each other to friendship is a bridge best not crossed. How could we trust each other? I'd always doubt and wonder. Anyway, the only sure thing in my life right now is that he despises me. I can count on his cloudy, grim expression to ruin my day. JJ, playing for the red team, the underdogs, scores. From across the aisle, Honey's shouting gets louder and I sense her focus is on me. Does she think we're competing for JJ's attention? Do I have a tattoo on my forehead that says conflicted feelings over Reptivik's resident moody, mysterious, and mean guy? I replay the scene from earlier today in my mind. We hate each other. End of story. But my heart tells a different tale. I get to my feet. Yassi tugs on my sleeve. The game is just getting good. Where are you going? Washroom, I say, and don't bother smiling. It's not a lie, I need to splash some cold water on my face. Since I missed classes earlier, she'll probably think I'm under the weather. As I squeeze past the others to the stone stairs, the crowd roars when the red team scores another point. JJ lifts his wand in triumph at the shot. I snag on the curl of his lips. Not quite a smile like before, but just the notion of his mouth brings back the recent memory of his against mine. There was craving there that I only recognize now, as my stomach grumbles. Maybe I should get a giant, ever-twisting pretzel. No, that won't satisfy the hunger. I sigh. Leave it to JJ to make me feel, unlike myself, the happy-go-lucky, cheerful, confetti lover turned conflicted and confused wish-witch. One minute I'm walking down the stairs and the next I'm tumbling head over heels. My wand slips out of my pocket. I extend my hand, reaching for it at the same time I meet Honey's eyes. I grapple for something to break my fall as my arms windmill. The look on her face isn't of concern or apology. No, it's glee. Pure evil. The crackling of magical energy surges like the ball during rumpus and explodes out of me. Sharp waves of silver light blast across the stadium. There's a roar. Not from the crowd, but from a dragon. At least I think it's the head of administration, Storch, who happens to be a dragon that I blasted with magic just now. I scramble to my feet. It was an accident, I say to anyone who can hear me, but the crowd is screaming, clapping, and stomping, because it seems that at the same time my magic erupted out of me. JJ used his own to blow up the concession stand, including the condiments containers. A diversion, or was he celebrating his score? Ketchup, mustard, and relish cover everyone closest to the stand, including Storch. I lost my appetite. JJ's eyes skate toward me as though he saw what happened. Disapproval streaks across his face. He's called for a foul and the use of unnecessary force. As the referee reprimands him, I hurry to the washroom. I'm shaking as I splash water on my face. I expect Honey to come in to gloat or the Office of Magical Management to find me or send me to the Iron Tower, but I'm alone until the crowd cheers again. The Red Team won. I emerge into a flurry of people tossing confetti and cheering. I scan the field for the players. No JJ. He's the kind of guy who's gone before he's even arrived. He slips in and out of situations, conversations, and the rumpus arena like a whisper. Everyone chants his name, including Honey. After his big win for the red team on the field, instead of sticking around for the postgame celebration, he disappears. Probably off brooding somewhere. 
Yassi, Audra, Winnie, a few other girls are all dressed in gold to support Bobby Gold. They meet me on the edge of the field, cheering as everyone casts more confetti into the air after the underdog red team's big win. Don't get me wrong, there are some sore losers. In fact, only about half of the losing team sticks around. I keep my eyes out for Bobby Gold, but as the Gold team captain, he's probably off dealing with the spoil sports. Even though everyone is truly rooting for the same team, the way recruiting goes for Rumpus is you earn your way up. I finally understand that part of the magical sport. Wish I could say the same about my magic. Actually, considering I'm allegedly a wish witch, I don't say that. Not out loud at least. This was JJ's first time playing at Riptivic. Apparently, Rumpus fans haven't seen skills like his since Lemonster Stevens back in the 1920s. At least that's what I overhear and what Dewey confirms. I've had three different people explain Rumpus to me in three different ways. I still don't fully get it. Not like I do soccer. Even if you're not good enough to make the red or gold teams, learning the game is a requirement here at Riptivic Reform, they've already taken most of the fun away, I guess they reason that this keeps us active and out of trouble. It's probably my worst class. Ask me the rules and I'm lost. It comes as no surprise though. One day, I was walking through life like everything was okay. It's not. Now, I'm trying to adapt to a new normal. Or thinking about it another way, a world that is as far from normal as they come. By Great Gregor's Mighty Axe. Did you see JJ on the field? Dewey calls. The dude was an animal. I wonder whose place he's going to take. He's a clinch for the gold team long fielder, but no way would Bobby Gold give up his spot. Winnie shakes her head. Coach Niffenadler has the final say. Plus, Bobby is a second year and JJ is a first. So once Bobby graduates, the spot opens up. At the word graduate, everyone looks at her with dismay. Yassi snorts. Unless you know something we don't, we'll all be awaiting release rather than having the professors see us on our merry way. The positions aren't fixed for the year. If the coach wants to move Bobby he can, Dewey says. But he'll still be captain, Winnie interjects. He was voted in by the team. She's the resident Bobby Gold expert. I can hardly keep track of it all as half the campus continues to cheer for the red team. They never win. Not until JJ came out of nowhere, a gray streak on the field, and scored point after point, probably flexing his skill for Honey Oaks, the resident popular, pretty girl. All the guys on the field were probably showing off for her. Eventually, the violet shadows of dusk push everyone toward the dining hall. I keep watching for Bobby. It's not like we have a thing, but he is irrefutably hot and seems interested in me. Also, I'm supposed to be spying on him. However, he never shows up, probably strategizing for the next game. Neither does JJ. Likely he's flirting with Honey somewhere. She's also conspicuously absent. Typically, she makes herself the center of attention even when it isn't her win to celebrate. While I eat my slop, I can't decide if I'm surprised about the way JJ smiled at Honey, if it's just part of his typical mysterious behavior, or something else. Usually, after gold wins, the team and fans revel and recount the plays and scores for the next hour while eating dinner, pie, and lingering for a bit longer. Unfortunately, I'll see JJ later to continue our seminal seminar mind wall training. Even though the butterscotch pudding pie is delicious, I'm not hungry for another bite. I push it away when the bells ring, signaling it's time to return to the dorms. Everyone grumbles as groups of students wait to leave with our constabulary coven chaperones. Why do we still have to do this, a vamp complains. So you don't get sucked up by a demon, duh, a wargirl retorts. I have a thing or two to say about sucking, the vamp says, getting in the wargirl's face, before adding, blood. Yeah, well, if you want to keep your teeth, you better shut up or, she pounds her fist into the mitt formed by her other hand. Audra leans in and says, I heard the CC only managed to capture two of the six demons, before they dispersed. I heard it was three of nine, Dewey says. Someone told me they're multiplying, a cyclops, Guy says. 
They can't multiply, interjects Quince, easily the nerdiest kid at Riptivic. Yassi and I know better than to be caught between him and any sort of technicality, so we rush off to join the next group to leave. I also happen to know that I killed one of the demons and JJ vanquished the other. Then again, if Quince is wrong and the Cyclops was right, who knows how many there are total. Everyone holds hands as we cross the campus to Penny House. The stars twinkle against the dark night sky. It doesn't seem like we're in danger at all. At least not until I get inside and find JJ waiting in the entry. He's the last person I want to see, even though the little leap in my chest tells me otherwise. Chapter 2 JJ must be waiting for honey. The memory and disappointment of thinking he'd smiled at me and then spotted her rushes to mind and I push it away. Although, earlier, we did discuss how we're better off hating each other, so maybe he's moved on to prettier pastures. It's not that I think I'm ugly. Quite the contrary. Just ordinary. Naturally tan skin, brown hair, green eyes. The only guy who's ever looked at me twice was the boy next door, Riley. He was friend-zoned the second he challenged me to a spitting contest in sixth grade. Yassi passes me a look of commiseration at the sight of JJ's sour expression and then waves as she rushes upstairs. Come find me later. No doubt I'll want to rant about how much I can't stand him. You don't look like someone who just won the rumpus game of the season, I say to JJ sharper than I mean. Who cares if he smiles at honey? All the guys do. It shouldn't matter. What do I look like? His gaze pins me in place. His hair, longer now than when we first met, sticks out at sharp angles from beneath his top hat. The gray eyes that fixate me hold history, meaning, secrets. And his lips. I look away. Several things come to mind, miserable, sad, maybe even lonely. You look like J.J. Thorne, I say instead. He snorts. No, I don't. He always says the most cryptic things. I've pretty much given up on trying to get answers out of him. Okay, mystery man. Let's get this over with. He follows me up to my dorm room where we have special permission to study, but before I open the door, I have a flash of inspiration. I vow to learn more about my wish witchery, and, seeing as I've exhausted the small study downstairs, the library is my next option. Seeing as I rarely have time during the day with my packed schedule, perhaps JJ will escort me across campus since curfew hasn't yet lifted. Aside from the members of the Coven Constabulary and the Chancellor, he's the only person I know of on campus who can do that and ward off demons. It seems even they have no interest in him. However, an idea pops into my mind. I stop before turning the doorknob and say, I just remembered that my roommate is using the room tonight. A pixie study group. Do you think we could go to the library? My voice is an octave or two higher than usual. I'm a terrible liar, but I'm careful to conceal the truth under thoughts of how delicious the pie was at dinner lest JJ goes poking around in my head, which is why I need these lessons in the first place, my mind is like an open window as opposed to a brick wall. JJ looks me over and then shrugs. Sure. But we'll use the back door. He waves his hand vaguely in the air. I don't feel like dealing with crazed rumpus fans. Wow. That was easy. Is that why you weren't at dinner? I ask, calling out his absence. His eyes snag on me. You noticed? I walked into that one. Of course, I did. J.J. Thorne is the only person I love to hate. I also noticed the way he looked at the Queen of Mean just before I went tumbling. As if reading my thoughts, though I know he's not at least not right now, he says, you took a shot at Storch, huh? What are you talking about? You can thank me for covering for you. He holds out his hand for me to take, a protective measure, when traveling across campus after dark. Reluctantly, I fit my palm against his and take this conversation away from curious ears. JJ, I did not try to use magic on the head of administration, I hiss. His shoulders lift and lower. Felt that way to me. Should I bother asking what you mean? I huff. I can feel your magic, Maya. He speaks the words slowly, 
as if bearing a secret. I fouled against the other team to cover it up. Could have scored another point, he adds as an afterthought. I should say thank you. I don't. We reach the library and I follow him to the third floor and to the back, past stacks of old, leather-bound books. Figured we'd go somewhere quiet, he says. It's a library, I counter at a whisper. The Libravens, librarian raven shifters, watching over the books take their job very seriously. JJ settles into one of a pair of high-backed leather chairs. A table with a reading light sits in the middle. He's at ease for once, as if he sits here often. You first, he says. Such a gentleman tonight, I retort in a sarcastic tone. He sighs as though he's tired, he did just single-handedly win a rumpus game. I close my eyes and center myself. I find the threads of energy between us. I catch a glimpse of him standing inside a store. A sweet shop. We're in Tippleton. He carefully picks out chocolates. When he reaches the register, the door whooshes open with a gust of cold air. Just then, he notices someone through the window. His thoughts suddenly lift. They seem lighter. More spacious. Buoyant. Almost happy. He sees me coming toward the shop. The shelves and jars of candy fade from the background. Black uniforms and the rumpus pitch replace them. The smile on his lips blooms. The one directed at honey. There. I shout, breaking concentration and smacking back into the current reality. Say judge, he scolds. I slap my hand over my mouth. Sorry. Not sorry. I was right. You almost smiled that day, I say, triumphant that I was right and forgetting about my disappointment from the game. If color rose to his cheeks from embarrassment, I don't see it. And you were wrong. Wrong about you smiling? Are you allergic or is it part of this carefully cultivated, I run my hand through the air between us from his head to toe. This moody 19th century gothic vibe you've got going on. The dark circles under his eyes deepen. You wanted to see me smile. It's a statement and not a question, reminding me how easily he can see my thoughts. Mind wall, Miyaja. Make a mind wall. Don't let him see my true desires. A faint hint of amusement plays on his lips, because he's smug about being right. Fine. I do want to see him smile again. The first and only time I saw a true smile was at the rumpus game, and it was, well, magnificent, but it wasn't a smile at me. Maya, you're wrong, he repeats. The air sucks from between us. His gray eyes hold mine. Frustration. Fury. I step backward, and understanding dawns. He showed me the sweet shop memory, followed by the rumpus game memory, on purpose. You weren't smiling at honey? Wanted to clear that up. He brushes his hands together. Thoughts tumble onto each other, he may have modified his memory. I'll have to ask Yassi if that's possible. Or perhaps he wants me to be sure everyone knows he's not after Bobby Gold's position on the rumpus field and his rumored ex-girlfriend. That spells disaster. Just as soon as these thoughts cross my mind, his face falls. I belatedly realize he saw into my mind again. I clench my teeth together. JJ, just because Chancellor West assigned you to teach me how to block my thoughts and memories, you can't just dig around in my brain. Then don't let me in, he challenges, getting to his feet. I sense him trying to access my memories again. I meet him, toe to toe. I won't let him know that I was excited to see him almost smile at the sweet shop or actually smile earlier at the rumpus game. I won't let myself know that either. I muster all my energy to keep him out of my head. He recoils suddenly, looking paler than usual. His eyes meet mine, stunned. You stung me again. I what? I gaze at my hands. They don't shimmer with a charge of magic, but my head has a peculiar vibration. I must have used my magic mentally, what Yassi called internal magic like Faye have. JJ cuts me a glare and then storms off. I call after JJ, temporarily forgetting I'm in the library. I didn't mean it. 
but he's gone. Hashtag which fail. I slouch into the leather chair. It's cold. I didn't mean to do that again. It was an accident. I swear. But he's not here to listen to my plea or read the honesty of it in my mind. Not sure where to begin, I sighed the rows and rows of books. I may as well take this opportunity to do research. That's why I tricked JJ into coming here, after all. I find the history section and browse a few books, finding an unauthorized biography of Imogen Hawks. I flip through, but much of it is about her life as an entertainer. I'm looking for information about her wish witchery, the loophole, the prophecy, and all of the vague and mysterious things that may or may not connect me to her. Downstairs, I locate several articles from years ago when she was at the height of fame. She wanted to open a school to develop magic further in young people. There was opposition because several of her critics thought it was an attempt to divine their youth for her own purposes. She reminds me of the Queen from Snow White. Lost in a sea of books, articles, and recounts from former classmates, friends, and relatives, I'm no closer to finding out what exactly happened. Much of it is secondary information and speculation. The bells toll in the distance. A shadow crosses the page I'm reading. We have to go back. I startle and glance up. JJ's expression is as faded as the old coat he wears over his uniform. Then he blinks his eyes a few times, surveying the piles of books surrounding me. I hastily close them. Research project. He grunts and walks off. I hurry, putting the books away. Minutes later, I find him waiting by the doors. Just then, a sparkly figure flits by. Hey, Rumi, Bree says. I give a little wave, thankful she and I are on better terms than when I set her bed on fire. What are you doing down here, she asks. I thought you guys had special permission to study in our room. I mumble something, but there's no recovering my lie. JJ glares at me. I bite my lip and make a show of shrugging. Without a word, he holds out his hand. Instead of making the usual fuss about taking it, so he doesn't think I like it any better than he does, I hold it loosely in mine. This time I flinch, as though being stabbed by an icicle. Why are you always so cold? I ask as we step outside. For the same reason you're safe with me. His accented voice goes a register deeper when he says this, as though their words meant to be kept just between us. And why is that? Are you a ghost? I ask, joking, not that it would be a laughing matter. As usual, he doesn't answer. Back when life was normal, I read an article in one of Chelsea's magazines about how some guys tease, ignore, or act mysteriously as a way to get girls. Not that he's trying, but then again, I'm not honey. In the foggy night, I pause mid-stride, recalling his memory, as though something emerges from the murk of my mind. If what he showed me was true, perhaps he's not interested in her after all. Was he trying to tell me the smile was meant for me? Then again, everyone is interested in honey. Except for Dewey. His heart belongs to Audra. Poor guy. He raises his eyebrows in question, wondering why I stopped. I clear my throat and say, I'm sorry, I stung you. Don't be sorry. I wasn't expecting it. My mistake. I don't even really understand what I did. Deflection. Advanced skill. There are three levels, block, deflect, and then there's. But I don't hear what he says, because a chill slides through me. He falls silent, looks at me carefully, and then surveys our surroundings. Come on, we shouldn't be standing here. My legs feel heavy, frozen. Staring into the night, his eyes darken and he tenses. Maya, there's a demon by that hedge. Maybe two or three others nearby. It senses you. Please walk otherwise, I'm going to pick you up and carry you back to the dorm. I have to let West and the coven know I sighted one on campus. I sip the air as though through a straw. I'm so cold. Not as cold as you will be if it gets much closer. His voice is matter-of-fact and his grip on my hand tightens as he pulls me onward. 
I managed to shuffle beside him until we reached the lantern-lit path that leads to Penny House. Despite our shared animosity, I feel safe with him and shake off the chill once inside the cozy dormitory. I've never appreciated doilies and floral wallpaper so much. But JJ rushes back into the night, leaving me feeling strange and empty. And maybe not only because of the demons nearby. Chapter 3 it's been nearly a week and there haven't been any more demon sightings. But ever since that night, I've had a harder time waking up in the morning. Perhaps it's the janky heating system in the dorm. The old iron radiator clangs half the night, whistles, and wakes me up. Either it's cranked, roasting half a penny house, or as cold as I was the night JJ walked me back to my dorm. One morning, I was so hot, I was as red as an apple in the orchard. Yassi fixed my complexion with a cosmetate spell. The next morning my hair was blue, as though it was frozen, but thankfully it washed out with a special shampoo Yassi brewed up. Chelsea probably would have loved the vibrant hue. But I don't think that was related to the heat or lack thereof. I glance in the mirror at the end of the hall on my way to the bathroom. Thankfully, I look normal. When I reach the door, Alicia, one of Honey's minions, bumps into me, sending my shower caddy scattering. She helps me pick up a few things, but then as if remembering she's not supposed to be nice, per Honey's orders no doubt, she rushes off, saying, watch where you're going. I harumph and finish getting ready. Donning the knit hat and scarf I got from Finland years ago, I step outside. The crisp skin of winter covers the earth, but it still hasn't snowed as I crunch across the grass to grab a bowl of porridge from the dining hall. Afterward, I rush to my first class, getting to my seat only a moment before the bells. I take notes during creation while Popperwell tells stories about his encounters with Jabberwockies. It seems most of my teachers are intent to lecture, which does little to help me learn how to use my magic. Since Riptivic became a reform school, I suppose that's the point. By the time I arrive at Darrington's class, I need a new pencil. She's in what Dewey calls her dare you to mood. That is dare you to say the wrong answer when she calls on us randomly to make sure we did the reading the night before. If you hesitate or get it wrong, the penalty is instant detention. As in, dare you to speak without raising your hand. Detention. As in, dare you to disagree. Detention. About halfway through the class, she calls, Maya. Section 3b. Name three uses for August's Pearl. Easy. I did do the reading, thank you very much. I reply, to remediate the rapid growth of Spiori, to alleviate, but before I finish, I shut my mouth. Try again in your normal voice, Darrington warns. Everyone stares at me like I sang, instead of spoke the answer. Because I did. I try again. To remediate the, I clamp my hand over my mouth. Have I mentioned my singing voice has been compared to that of a goat? Ask Yassi. Darrington plants her hand on her hip, dangerously close to her wand. Is this supposed to be funny, Ms. Wessels? Have I mentioned she lacks a sense of humor? I discovered this on my first day here and would never dare challenge this fact. I shake my head. Young lady, use your normal, inside voice to answer my question, she says, repeating it. The first note of the first word resonates from my lips. I'm sorry, I start, but it's also in song. I can't. Stop singing, Darrington commands. Perhaps a detention will make my point. I actually can't control it, I sing. It's like the hiccups or a yawn. Try as I might to stop it, I fail. You dare interrupt me? Go to the infirmary and then detention. Go, she orders, losing patience. I gather up my things and rush from the classroom, red-cheeked and frustrated. If this were Hamilton High School, where I used to go, laughter would have followed me down the stairs. However, no one dares defy Darrington. Except, at least in her opinion, me. This means I'm officially on her radar. Instead of going directly to the infirmary, I detour to the bathroom. My face is a deep, dark shade of embarrassment. Honey, Alicia, and her other minion, Polly, are in there, speaking in hushed tones. 
they fall silent when I come in. Oh, hi, honey says. A little birdie told us you were rather entertaining in conservation class. I open my mouth to say that little birdie is named Polly, she's in my class. The first note echoes off the bathroom tile. I pinch my lips tight and sweep to the hall. I'm probably the only person who's ever been glad to go to the infirmary. I've never been to the infirmary before and certainly don't feel ill. But when I get to the brick building, I test my voice before going in. Professor Darrington sent me. Sure enough, it's a song. My mother would call it operatic. She's a singer, so she has an ear for these things. I sigh and open the door. The nurse asks for my info. I sing my name, my dorm, my year, and my ailment as if the nurse couldn't tell. She sends me to a waiting area while she tends to a student with a gash on his arm that's weeping real tears. It's weird and gross, and for a minute I'm thankful the worst of my problems is that I can only sing. That minute turns into several frustrating hours as cases more severe than mine, cold, flu, fever, festering clabberstones, etc., come in one after another. When the nurse finally sits down on the edge of my bed, taking my temperature, I ask, or rather, sing, is it usually this busy? No, today is relatively quiet, well, except for you. Please tell me what happened. I crack a smile. At least she has a sense of humor. Not that this is funny. I was called on in class and couldn't talk. Could only sing, I sing. Back up. Start when you woke up. I do so, and then she asks me at least 20 questions. I sing my most dreaded question, which doesn't feel quite so weighty in song. Do you think it has anything to do with the demons? She replies, a capella. Certainly not. She smiles and winks. In her regular voice she says, No, I think you're simply a victim of a jinx. It should clear up by the morning, but you'll stay overnight to be sure. I try to argue, but like my mom does when I insist that I'm fine, though this time I know I am, she's firm in her response. I spread my homework out on the bed, making sure to do Darrington's first. I'm certain she'll call on me tomorrow, and probably every day afterward. Dewey says when it comes to professors, like her, the survival rate is higher if you stay off the radar. His dwarf teachers, growing up, were harsh. I'm deep in the conservation assignment when a knock sounds on the door. I look up, but don't dare answer. I heard you were here, JJ says, taking off his hat. You're okay, he says. I nod, fighting the urge to smooth my hair. Couldn't help but serenade Darrington, huh? There's almost an amused lilt in his voice. Almost. He looks around the sterile room. Want company? I shrug. Did you get all your assignments? He asks. I nod. Yassi brought them to me. You're not going to open your mouth, are you? I shake my head. For once I have an excuse not to talk to him. I brought you something, he says, pulling a book out from the pocket of his coat and passing it to me. I saw you were interested in, he clears his throat, Imogen Hawks. I don't answer. I've heard people comment that they think you look like her. For the record, you don't. Not at all. His gaze softens for a fleeting moment and he gets to his feet. I mouth a word thanks. He steps into the hall and then leans back in through the doorframe. He opens his mouth then closes it as though unsure if he should say what's on his tongue. And you're certainly nothing like her. His boots echo down the hallway. I turn the book over in my hands. It's no bigger than a diary and bound with a leather cord. However, books like this aren't entirely unusual in the magical world. There are at least a dozen in the study at Penny House. I part the yellowed, crisp pages and discover it's Imogen Hawks's journal. The script is old-fashioned, slanted, and slightly difficult to read, but I lean closer to the lamp, reading about a woman with a fantastic singing voice, a clever mind, a determined attitude, and an intense insecurity about aging. The entries suggest it was winter because of the weather, comments on the scent of pine, and time spent in the old family house. 
She describes it as a grand mansion with enormous rooms, each with a fireplace. Mostly, the entries seem like memos to herself, but not so private that should anyone read them, they'd find out whether she'd actually trade a soul to be young forever. But could she have wished for one? I still don't understand the full extent of wish witchery, but at the most basic level, I understand soul trading is wrong. I wouldn't, couldn't do it. But what could I do once I understand how to grant wishes? This is something I think about often. If I could have anything, would I? How far would I go? I learn that mages are humans who learn magical arts, but witches are born with power. She writes about them being magical royalty. I imagine myself in a crown. I read more about Imogen's desire to erase evidence of the past and become desirable and adored by her fans again. There's one entry about trouble with her husband. I feel like I'm eavesdropping, but can hardly put the book down, especially when she comments on how she doesn't believe him when he continues to tell her she's beautiful. Perhaps more beautiful than when they'd met. How romantic. The door to my room opens. I startle, dropping the book. A few pieces of the old paper float loose. I hurriedly gather them up. The edge of one of them is folded over to reveal the edge of a compass rose like on a map. On another, I catch my name. Maya, there is a star in your heart, burning bright, show the world what can be created from your light. Ordinarily, I'd say it must be a strange coincidence, but it's written in the same penmanship as the other notes and signed with the same scribble at the bottom. I read it again. A star in my heart. My light. For one second, I wonder if J.J. is the romantic poet. Then I laugh lightly to myself. No way. His dark heart isn't the kind that would write love notes. Okay, let's hear it, the nurse says, startling me. Try to answer this question without singing. What are you reading? I take a deep breath and remind myself I'm not reading the nurse's journal, so I shouldn't feel guilty. An old journal for a research project, I croon. We both shake our heads with disappointment that the jinx isn't gone. Why don't you get some sleep? If it's not gone by dawn, I have an elixir, but it'll make you mute for a day, so I'd rather let it wear off naturally. She sweeps from the room before I can try to speak. Maybe what JJ meant about how I'm nothing like Imogen Hawks is she had a beautiful singing voice and I don't. Then again, he's never heard mine. However, he'd agree unless he has a thing for goats. No. I tell myself that he has a thing for honey oaks, just like most of the guys at Reptivic. Not that I care. Not really. I'm on a mission and must focus on finding out about my wish witchery and why we're all imprisoned at this reform school. Chapter 4 I wake up in the morning, drowsy and dazed. I have a moment of confusion about where I am when I look out the window. Instead of sky, there's the sight of an old ivy and brick building. It must be the boy's dorm. JJ's dorm, incidentally. And I'm in the infirmary. Singing Jinx. The nurse whisks in, already harried. All right, is your voice back to normal? She puts a fresh uniform on the table, a plaid skirt, button-down shirt, and cardigan. Standard issue. The sound is a croak, and I grimace. I clear my throat and try again. Good morning, I say in my regular speaking voice. The nurse claps her hands together. Cured. She shuffles me out of the bed. Off you go. I need this room. We had another outbreak of Belgrave blisters, with no thanks to the vamps. She mumbles something about too much kissing as I gather my things. Yassi stands by the door in the waiting area with her stack of books shielding the lower half of her face and glances at a row of vampire boys waiting for the nurse. They look halfway between smug and pained. She whispers, I don't want to take any risks. I giggle. Those guys don't have a chance with her. She only has eyes for Wyatt. When we're outside, she passes me something in a folded paper napkin. A piece of pie left over from dinner last night. I know from experience the food in the infirmary is enough to make you feel like you have to stay there an extra night. Not that the dining hall food is much better. 
I take a bite of maple walnut pie. This is delicious, I say around a mouthful. How West convinced the dining staff to continue to make pie when everything else is little more than slop is beyond me. If I never see porridge again, it will be a good day. Wyatt on the other hand. I met him this morning for a breakfast date, she says. Since it's so difficult to get together after sundown, we've started meeting early. The sunrise was beautiful this morning, she says wistfully. We're trying to figure out a way to get together over solstice break. I halt. Solstice break is in a holiday? Vacation? Christmas? She nods. That's only a few weeks away. They're going to release us? She lets out a stiff exhale, as though this news isn't as sweet as the pie. I've heard, or rather seen, that parents will get suspicious if they keep us locked up here too long so we'll get a vacation. Summer too? Don't count on it. By then they plan to go into full reform school lockdown. I overheard some of the professors talking. She nibbles her lip. I'm sorry I didn't visit you last night. You don't have to apologize, not even if you were studying with Wyatt at the library, I say, gently teasing. She lets out a contented sigh. You're the best. At least you didn't have to see JJ for seminal seminar, she says. Actually, he stopped by. I've never been so thankful to hear my regular voice. But we didn't practice. Since Yassi has mind-reading abilities, I've let her in on my lessons so I can test out my mind while attempts on her. She pauses on the sidewalk and raises an eyebrow. He brought me a book. That's, uh, thoughtful. I shrug and start walking again. Then I realize she's not beside me. As I turn around I say, yeah, I suppose it's thoughtful. I tilt my head as she gazes toward the woods. Yassi? I ask. She shakes her head as though emerging from a trance and says, I thought I saw something. Demon? I ask at a whisper. Her eyes are narrowed. Thankfully no. Audra, Winnie, and Reese catch up with us and chatter about whether teachers are tougher on first or second year students. As we walk toward the classroom buildings, Yassi glances over her shoulder every so often. After the recent encounter when JJ and I were returning from the library, chills pebble my skin and not because it's brisk outside even though it is. For once, I wish he was here. Popperwell is chipper as usual and regales us with stories of his time in Greece, getting very animated when he helped excavate ruins and discovered the bones of a hydra, still connected to the rest of the still alive body. Apparently, even if one head dies, the others continue to live. Spellwork is infinitely better now that I have a proper wand, the professor doesn't seem to keep her fire extinguisher so close at hand now, and Bobby Gold is my in-class arithmetic study partner. It's a constant battle between spying on him and swooning over him. He makes my brain mush and my pulse pound even when I have a bit of walnut between my teeth from the pie. I'm so distracted I'm lucky to make sense of Professor Frickman's scrawl when he jots down equations for us to practice. I heard you had an unfortunate encounter with Darrington yesterday, Bobby says with a sympathetic smile. I roll my eyes. Who'd you hear that from? I ask, belatedly realizing the entire class probably blabbed about my singing instead of speaking the moment they were out of Darrington's dungeon. Honey mentioned it during lunch. She said she felt really bad. Honey felt bad? For me? I let out a chuckle. I don't think so. She doesn't like me. His fingers inch toward my forearm and then wrap around. His eyes meet mine. I get the golden smolder and melt inside. Well, I like you, he says. You're really good at math. And I noticed all you girls dressed in gold at the rumpus match the other day. He smirks. I didn't. Not me. Good, uh, game. I swallow hard. Why can I talk to JJ so easily even though I hate him and when I'm around Bobby, I'm suddenly tongue-tied. Though I guess that's better than singing. He shakes his head and beams a competent smile. It was a fluke. Next weekend, Gold will be back on top. And I'll be there watching. No doubt, 
my cheeks are red like apples again. What would you say if we got together before then? Maybe meet after curfew? He waggles his eyebrows, meaningfully. Just then, Professor Frickman shushes us, and we return to the assignment. When the bells ring, Bobby whispers, 11. Gould Hall, the basement room. I take my time packing up and processing the invitation. I couldn't possibly sneak out. Not without a chaperone or J.J. The demon wraiths are still on the loose. I doubt he'd sneak to my dorm and then escort me to a secret meeting with Bobby Gold. J.J. and I hate each other, but it's nothing to the animosity between those two. I'm in a confused daze when I take my seat in Darrington's class. I'd only come to my senses when I feel her cold eyes on me. Planning on entertaining us today, Maya, she asks when class begins. No, Professor Darrington, I say in my regular voice. The nurse thinks someone jinxed me. Strange things have been happening to me all week. Doubtful. Remember, you have to serve detention with me this afternoon. She's moodier than JJ, and that's saying something. Regular class and detention pass painfully slow. I remain in my seat, waiting for Darrington's wrath. But it doesn't come. Instead, she sits at her desk, correcting papers. I pull out the journal JJ brought and begin to read. There are a few musings, suggesting Imogen sought a solution to the passage of time, aging, and the inevitable loss of youthfulness. According to the entries, it seems like a lark, like a flippant wish, something she seems very clear on, given the anecdotes about the various people she helped with her talent. I've read several more passages, and she doesn't seem like an altogether terrible witch. In fact, she's rather charming. I understand why so many people adore her. I start in on another passage, when a shadow crosses the page. I half expect, J.J., but it's Darrington. What are you reading? she asks. I hastily close it. Oh, a journal someone gave me. Her eyebrow pitches sharply, and she holds out her hand. I pass her the book. She carefully schemes a few pages. Imogen Hawks. Interesting. It hasn't escaped my notice. I have my eye on you, Maya. She may as well join the club. Storch said the same thing. I was supposed to be spying on her. Too bad she terrifies me. The sassy part of me wants to tell Darrington just one eye, that's convenient to know, because I'll be sure to do whatever it is you suspect me out of view of the other one. I throw up my mind wall and bring my fingers to my lips. Hopefully, she's not the nosy type. She purses her lips, and I realize it may have been too late. Did she read my mind or my expression? You're curious about Imogen? Let me tell you something about her. Darrington braces my desk with both her hands and leans close. Please do, I say more boldly than is wise. Darrington shoves off, pacing a circle around me and then back toward her desk. She abused the laws of conservation and contrived a way to alter the advancement of years. So I've heard. I assume then you know it's grim magic and contrary to the rules of wish witchery, including that wish witches only get three wishes. She eyes me carefully. I've read that historically three wishes are the limit. It's ironic Darrington cares about preserving the laws of magic when she's prime suspect number one for being the person who'd abuse it. Case in point, this detention, her class, and the events on Hallow's Eve. I heard Imogen found a loophole. Do you seek this loophole? With all due respect, Professor Darrington, I'm not concerned about aging. Talk to me again in 80 years, but right now, no. She scoffs. Fair enough. You know that wish witches cannot use wishes for themselves, but there are workarounds if you're clever. And my oh my, was Imogen clever. She shakes her head with disgust. Ruthless, sinister, some would argue evil. Is she still alive? I ask. If you have any inclination to seek her as your heroine, I warn you against it. This time I shake my head. No, I was just wondering. Wonder all you like. Seek her if you must. Just don't idolize her. 
I don't have plans to do any of that. No? Darrington asks with obvious interest. Her forehead wrinkles. What has West told you about the prophecy? Nothing. I thought that people who speak about it risk imprinting their magic on it. The Chancellor doesn't have to worry about trivialities of that nature. I thought he was preparing you. Preparing me for what? The room narrows, and I find I'm leaning in, waiting to hear what she's going to say. To reverse the curse. The bells ring and Darrington dismisses me without another word. Chapter 5 Yassi meets me after class. I'm sorry, she says. I take it to mean about the misery I've endured for the last 24 hours, practice with JJ, getting in trouble with Darrington, and then singing instead of speaking. I'm convinced someone jinxed me, but the detention was odd. I thought I'd get a stern talking to, but Darrington seemed interested in me and like she despises me at the same time. I can't tell. JJ too, for that matter. Speaking for the entire student body at Riptivic, at least that's better than her straight up hating you. I start walking toward the rumpus fields for our weekly practice. Instead, Yassi yanks me in the opposite direction. Where are we going? I was apologizing before for making you skip rumpus practice. Listen, if this has to do with you and Wyatt, let's consider a trade. Bobby asked me to meet him in Gould at 11 tonight, so if you could. She stops short. Wait a minute. Firstly, this doesn't have anything to do with Wyatt. Secondly, under no circumstances will you sneak out after sundown and break curfew. Are you insane? She asks, checking over her shoulder before stepping off the path and into the woods. No, but I'm thinking you are. What are we doing? I ask at a whisper, afraid something in here might hear me. Dewey takes great pleasure in telling everyone at the dinner table spooky stories of the creatures that dwell in the forest surrounding the school. There's a path in the woods leading to West's cottage, but it's on the other side of campus. She shushes me as she scans the ground, stepping silently over the frozen ground. Meanwhile, twigs snap under my feet and leaves rustle. I lament the fading daylight as clouds roll closer overhead the woods close around us. Yassi, please tell me what we're doing. If you need a soil sample or a, I throw my hands up, knocking into a branch and sending a shower of tiny dark red flower petals that should be well past blooming to the ground. I don't know what. Yassi crouches and then pops up, holding a tuft of fur. This was exactly what I was looking for. Listen, if you're a secret fur trapper, I want to talk to you about how foe is far more humane. She nudges me and gazes deeper into the woods. She stiffens. I knew it, she breathes. Shadows grow and fade in the distance, then disappear. Yassi leads me back out the way we came. I tremble all the way. Dark clouds roll across what little remains of the sky. Once safely on the sidewalk, I demand, explain. I've been noticing some signs. She takes a deep breath. Have you ever heard about the cinder beast? I glance at the tuft of dark fur, to Yassi, and to the woods. Dewey may have mentioned something about it being the most fearsome creature in the northeast. The beast of the east, I think he called it. Afraid. Endangered, she eyes the woods again. Hungry. What do they eat? Demons, Yassi answers. And other things. I shiver and glance up at the sky. I have to go to the library. Me too, she says with concern. I have to figure out what it needs. I'd, uh, leave taming this kind of beast to the professionals, I say as we hurry along the path to the library. My, uh, I'm a wood nymph. When it comes to creatures that live in the forest, I am a professional. I don't add the tag in training. Once in the library, we go in opposite directions. The light through the windows dims further. I hurry along, returning to the section where I found books about Imogen. I'm hoping something will jump out at me as I skim the pages, not a demon or a cinder beast whatever, but a new resource, answers. The name Ivanka Stormanov comes up repeatedly. The storm clouds render it nearly dark when I get to the S section. 
my mind races to the last time I left the library. Do demons only come out at night or if it's dark during the day too? Like during a storm or an eclipse. I should have paid more attention during Darrington's lesson. I start toward the main floor of the library to check out a couple of books, but they're not overly promising. I pass a group of students gathered around a small table, speaking in hushed voices. I'm not eavesdropping, but I'm not not eavesdropping when I hear one of them say, Eleven at Gould. There's no way they're talking to me. I'm kind of behind a shelf. No, seriously, a novel caught my eye so I stopped to check it out. When was the last time I read For Pleasure? I don't know either. Bobby asked to meet me after curfew. The only other thing I hear is the word marauders before someone coughs. Then someone else zips up their bag. Also, now I'm starting to feel like I look suspicious. I hurry back to Penny House, racing against the clouds and more questions. That night, snow falls heavy and fast. It's no surprise JJ doesn't show up for our seminal seminar practice in my dorm room. Yassi knocks on my door and plops on Bree's bed, spreading out several books to do her homework. It's warmer up here. I thought you liked the cold. I do. I prefer the company. Audra is in a fight with her cousin. Have you met Hannah? I shake my head. You're lucky. I don't blame Audra for being annoyed, but I can't hear the story again. Any headway on the cinder beast? I ask. A bit. Though with this storm, she trails off as her attention lands on a page in the book she holds. A few minutes later I say, so about Bobby's request. She slams her book closed. No way. Wait. There's more. Kind of. I tell her about what I overheard in the library. Yassi bites the inside of her lip. I've heard, in a roundabout way, about a group of students calling themselves the Marauders. Does a roundabout way mean you've been seeing people's thoughts? Her silence is answer enough. Does it have anything to do with Bobby? I ask. She shrugs. I don't know about that, but maybe it's connected to the hive. The group that wants to purify magical bloodlines? That secret group that some students were trying to get attention from back in October? Listen, I said it was roundabout. I oversaw, in a recent memory of a fellow student, the plan to break the circle on Hallow's Eve and then unleash the demons. I guess they have a new plan. My eyes widen. Yassi says, sometimes it helps to be nosy, but it also means we have to do something about it and I can't figure out what. She counts off on her hands. We can't go to the administration, the Office of Magical Management, or West. The Chancellor has been gone since the trip to Tippleton. Who was thinking it? I have no idea. It was in the dining hall a couple of weeks ago, and I sensed it. It could have been anyone. But remember how I told you that my sight doesn't always mean that's what's going to happen. Does this have anything to do with the cinder beast you were talking about? I'm not sure. We make our own plan and agree to meet at dawn the next day. As I lay in bed, watching the clock get closer and closer to eleven, I consider sneaking out, this is the perfect opportunity to spy. Maybe Winnie would come with me? She has a crush on him. Every girl does. There is something irresistible about Bobby Gold. Despite my better judgment, I cannot resist it. I consider tossing stones at JJ's window and having him bring me to Gould. I consider forgetting all about this magical world and going home. Then I dream about sheep. The next morning Yassi and I meet at the edge of the woods. She makes our tracks in the snow disappear with a flick of her wand. In the light of a new day, the forest doesn't seem so spooky. The sun casts its winter silver light. The sky is pale blue. I tell myself Yassi hasn't quite honed her nymph skills, mistook the fur for this alleged beast, and we're simply taking a stroll through the snowy woods on a crisp morning. Yassi moves more slowly and listens more carefully the farther we go, forcing me to do the same. I hear every tickle of wind through the crooked branches, cause from distant crows, and the pounding of my blood in my veins. She shushes me a few times. 
When my fingers feel like ice cubes, I ask, what exactly are we going to do if we find this thing? We are going to be very, very quiet and very, very still, she says, coming to a stop. I look up and swallow hard. Ahead, on the edge of a clearing, next to a tree, I spot a giant, mangy beast with fangs the size of my hand. I let out a little whimper. It looks up. I yelp. Yassi and I both run. When we reach the path, I stop to catch my breath. Yassi says, that's what we weren't supposed to do. I'm sorry. It's terrifying. And starving. It didn't look hungry except for a couple of students who stupidly wandered into the woods. They only remain stationary when they're hungry. And shedding is a symptom too. Yassi is deep in thought while we walk to the dining hall to get our breakfast. The demons drew it here, but why isn't it feeding? My brow wrinkles. Now that I know what I'm dealing with, I can help it, hopefully, she mutters under her breath. I sit down with a bowl of porridge when someone rushes in from outside and shouts, there was a demon attack last night. At the same time, JJ blusters in from outside and scans the room until his eyes yank to a stop on me. I can only imagine he's disappointed they didn't get me. Chapter 6 The first-year dwarf remains in the doorway as though not sure what to do now that he's told everyone the news. The dining hall has never been so quiet. Then a fork clatters to the floor, giving us all permission to speak at once. There's shock, questions of who, what, where, how. No one can answer these questions so speculation spreads like wildfire. It was a teacher. It was a merperson. It was a giant named Leroy. It was that quiet girl with the white stripe through her hair that always sits at the back of the futurism classroom. It was a goat. The only thing that anyone can agree on is that it happened last night. Even though it's daylight, everyone travels toward their first period in groups of two or more. Once the bells ring to begin creation with Professor Popperwell, half the class raises their hands. The professor says, I know you're going to ask about the attack. He wrings his hands over his ample belly. I've been advised that there will be student meetings this evening in your dormitories. He gestures everyone lowers their hands. That's all I'm at liberty to say on the matter. Instead of his usual storytelling, we read and take notes on the developments in magical travel through the ages, typically, a subject he's passionate about discussing at length. The remainder of the day slogs by. My thoughts fixate on Bobby's request to meet me last night, the cinder beast, the attack, and of course, the outrageous amount of studying I have. I tuck all thoughts of JJ to the very back of my mind. I don't notice anyone missing from my classes who may have been attacked. However, I do hear more rumors the attack was on a vamp sneaking out to see his girlfriend, a second-year boy from Moscow, and me. I wave my hand at the students mentioning the girl with the frizzy hair who sits behind them in arithmetic and is always flirting with Bobby Gold. I wasn't attacked. At least not last night. They continue talking about me as if I hadn't said a word. I interrupt again. Guys, I'm right here. And Bobby Gold isn't. There is a big rumpus game later, so maybe he's practicing. Dewey said that ordinarily rumpus games during this time of year happen in the evening, but it's not safe after nightfall even with the stadium lights. Usually, on a game day, it's all everyone can talk about, but this afternoon is different. I don't know who, but someone is missing. A thought lands like a thud. Bobby Gold. He was the one attacked. I have the urge to rush from my class, but I'm not sure where I'd go or who I'd talk to. All of my teachers assured us that we'll learn more at the dorm meeting tonight. Later, at conservation, Professor Darrington announces they're still awaiting details and no one dares to ask her anything more. After classes, Yassi, Audra, Winnie, and a few other girls from our dorm go to an empty classroom to practice defensive spells. One of them says, I grew up in a dodgy part of London and had to watch out for creeps. Never thought I'd need to know how to defend myself against demons. We all agree. Yassi is the most proficient and teaches us some blocking spells and others that cause confusion and obfuscation. 
Winnie says, my aunt used to have a difficult pack of goats. They'd always get into her bluebells, so she'd send blasts into the air nearby her gardens to keep them from wandering in. She lifts her wand and explodes a ceramic statue of the head of a bald man wearing a bow tie. Oops. We all laugh as Audra goes about using a mending spell. On that note, that's probably enough for today, Yassi says. Winnie is pink-cheeked, but I nudge her with my elbow to let her know it's not a big deal. You should see what I did to that magenta vase in Popperwell's classroom. She laughs as we all exit. We chat about the game later when the smell of burnt paper fills my nose and someone thuds down the stairwell behind us. No student gatherings permitted, Storch says, startling us all. Yassi clears her throat and makes apologies. Winnie is as red as ever, though probably from terror. I avoid eye contact until I'd sense Storch's amber gaze land on me. Maya Wessels, I figured you were involved. Come with me. As for the rest of you, let this be a warning and a demotion to the red class. I give them a withering look as I follow Storch back into the empty classroom. She wheels on me and flares her nostrils. Always the troublemaker, I see. Can't follow rules. She shakes her head. I should send you to the Iron Tower, she lets the threat hang. My knees wobble. My throat is dry. She could do so. Right now. No one would ever hear from me again. But I didn't break a reasonable rule, not that there's a chance she'll see my side of things. I didn't ask to be here for that matter. My hand drifts to my wand. I could blast her like that statue Winnie exploded. I wonder if she'd shift in time and breathe fire, or if she'd be little more than dragon dust. These dark thoughts thunder in my mind. The sight of Storch's lip lifts in a sinister smile. You could go to prison, never to return, or you could do something for me. The words are as close to my tongue as my wand is to my hand. Why should I help you? I think I've made that clear. I hold the power here, Maya, and the keys to your freedom. Is reform school freedom? I counter, feeling defiant. Her nostrils flare, and it's almost like she sniffs the air. I'm seeking someone. You can help. You will help. She blinks, surveying me. Her demanding and threatening tone leaves me with no choice, I listen. Storch leans in. You will use this clever little wand of yours and assassinate an enemy. A ghost, she hisses. Then she speaks the slaying spell. Her breath is hot as it gusts by my ear. I shiver even though Storch makes me feel like she's going to roast me alive. Who is this ghost? I can't possibly hurt anyone. No, I will warn them, but Storch doesn't need to know that. You will know him by his eyes. Her own flash. I need a little more than that. Name, location, weaknesses. His sole weakness is you, Maya Wessels. Can't think of who that would be other than Riley McMillan, and no way he's a ghost. Will you do it? She asks. I will, I reply, but I don't say what I'll do. You will or you'll find yourself in a cell at the Iron Tower, and I can promise you, I won't regret sending you there. There's something about you. I can't put my finger on it, but you don't belong here. At that, she sweeps from the room. I want to shout after her that she's right. I don't belong here. Instead, I say, can you give me a name at least? The son of Imogen Hawks, and you must do it by the sweetheart dance. My eyebrows lift. Oh yes, I know all about West's intentions to make this reform school the way it once was. Not on my watch. I'm the one in charge, and even if you think he's getting away with pie and other events, it's all me. The old man is on my leash. I wait until she's gone. Still shaky, I catch up to my friends walking in a pack down to the fields. To be honest, I expected them to cancel the game, Winnie says. It seems like the respectful thing to do, Audra adds. Nothing stops a rumpus game. Not hail, thundersnow, loss of limb, or a demon attack. Also, I guess the rival team was already on their way once the attack was confirmed, Yassi says. Where did you hear that? Audra asks. 
She doesn't answer, and we all know she saw the info in someone's thoughts. I know, I know. I have to stop. It's kind of a violation of people's privacy, Winnie says gently. It was an accident. I went to ask Professor Darrington a question and several of the teachers were having a meeting. Why? I start to ask why she'd go to Darrington, but then realize it probably has something to do with the cinder beast. When we get to the field, the chatter and cheering in the stands are already thunderous, silencing the conversation. I guess everyone has a little energy to burn after the fright and uncertainty from this morning. The opposing team, the Cherrywood Woodchucks, are already warming up, Rumpus isn't limited to magical academies or in our case, reform schools. There are leagues throughout the magical world. Meanwhile, our team lingers on the sidelines. Coach Niffenadler talks animatedly and waves his hands. Our team, the Golden Max, looks somber. I imagine they don't feel much like playing. It only takes me a moment to spot one player sitting on the bench, gazing at his shoes. JJ was immediately upgraded from the red team. Dewey slides into the seat beside us. His mouth forms a thin line. Dewey is never, ever quiet or grim. We all gawk at him. He clasps his hands and shakes his head. Pierce Pierpont was attacked. How do you know? Winnie asks. Number 13. Clinch man. He juts his chin toward the field. It's then I see the black numbers 1 and 3 on JJ's jersey. 13. Maybe Pierce is in the infirmary, Winnie squeaks. Something is going around. I feel like I'm catching a cold. She squeaks a sneeze. Oh, he's in the infirmary all right. They're waiting until he's stable to bring him to Cryer's clinic. Audra leans close to me and explains, it's a magical hospital. So he survived? I ask. Did they snatch his essence or whatever? Yassi says, supposedly West got there just in time. One of the custodians cleans up a spill. He must have overheard the faculty discussion and Yassi overheard his thoughts. She bites her lip guiltily. A whistle sounds, pulling us from the conversation and directly into the most aggressive game of rumpus I've ever seen. That's not saying much since I've only seen a few months worth of play, but it's also saying a lot because I've never seen such a violent sport in real life, period. Only 20 minutes in and the ref has already called 22 fouls. Primarily, the antagonism is between the gold team and JJ. It's as though they resent him for taking Pierce's place. I can't imagine JJ would have instigated the attack to get on the team. Sweat breaks out across the back of my neck and palms. I try to erase the thought from my mind, hoping he never sees it during our seminal seminar lessons. I'm mortified. JJ may be a jerk, but I don't think he's evil. I don't think he'd be behind an attack to get on the team. He was a shoe in anyway. The Max and the Cherrywood Chucks are neck and neck, each pulling ahead until the ball reverses play and the other team scores. During the halftime break, I watch as the coach lays into the players. Sadie, one of the war girls from my dorm, looks fierce on the field, but practically cowers as the coach reprimands her and the others. The second half moves slower and with less aggression on JJ and more on the Chucks. Nevertheless, JJ manages to gain a five-point lead for the Max. They race against the sun as it settles over the tops of the trees in the distance. When the buzzer sounds, we win by nine points and once again, JJ is a hero. Unlike the other day, there's no time for celebration. An announcement urges us immediately to the school-sanctioned meeting in our dorms. Nervousness from the meeting with Storch accompanies me with each step. She asked me to assassinate someone. Imogen Hawk's son. Even though I'm still outside, I feel like I'm in the hallway of a scary movie. The music slows. My skin prickles. There is only one way forward unless I want to go to jail for real. She told me the spell. Even having it in my head fills me with the gravest sense of unease. Miss Mayweather gathers us in the common room of the dorm. We pass around boxes of pizza. I hardly have an appetite. She winks and says, sorry, girls. 
I didn't feel like cooking. But you'll be pleased to know there is dessert. Times like this call for comfort. Personally, I find that in butter, sugar, and chocolate. Do not tell anyone. The scent of cookies baking prompts me to promise myself to someday repay Miss Mayweather for these little joys in the otherwise dreary reform school culinary life. I want you all to listen very carefully. She goes on to confirm it was Pierce Pierpont attacked by the demons. He was out of dorm after hours, somewhere between his dorm and Gould Hall. I swallow hard, wondering why Bobby invited me there. Miss Mayweather continues, protection is built into Penny Legion House. You're safe here. However, under no circumstances are any of you to leave the dorm except during daylight hours unless under the supervision of a chaperone. If you're found breaching this, there will be severe consequences, aside from potentially being attacked. Is that understood? There's a murmur of agreement. She claps her hands together. Trays, piled with cookies, appear. We spend the next half hour eating and gabbing as if the threat isn't real as long as we're together within these four walls. When Miss Mayweather dismisses us, the long day sends me upstairs to my room where I ignore the pile of homework on my desk and flop down on my bed, wondering and worrying. Through the window, the sky is a starless canvas. My eyes dip closed, but before I drift to sleep, a knock sounds on my door. Come in, I call. The knob doesn't turn. Come in, I repeat. The knock sounds again. I said you can come in, I holler at the same time as I get up to open it myself. To my surprise, a boy with a top hat fills the doorway. Chapter 7 J.J. Thorne is the last person I expect to see at my door for four reasons. 1. Generally boys aren't allowed up here. 2. I thought we were confined to our dorms. 3. I figured our nightly practice would be suspended given the current situation. 4. He hates me. As if reading my thoughts, he actually might be, he says, we should still practice. Also, after Storch reached you through the dragon eye, West wants you to guard your mind. Uh, come in then, I say, stepping aside. Possibly for the first time, I notice how tall he is. Also, how he takes up a lot of space, but also none at all. I've always had the sense he's here and somewhere else at the same time. He clears his throat, standing closer to me than usual. I can't help but inhale his fresh air scent, except tonight it mingles with soap. Good game earlier. He takes his hat off and taps it on his thigh before running his other hand through his hair. It sticks up in odd directions. Yeah. Shame about the circumstances though. None of the players were too pleased to see me take Pierce's place. I told Niffenadler I was happy to stay on the black team, but she insisted I play clinch man. This is the most J.J. Thorne has ever spoken at once. Get the guy to talk about rumpus, and he opens right up, I mutter. His gaze rakes over me, causing my insides to flutter and twist. It takes me a moment to figure out what to say. Where'd you learn to play like that? I mean, you weren't immediately put on the gold team when you came to Rip Tivik. Dewey says they recruit for the best players. It could be the shock from earlier, the semi-late hour, or something in the air, but trying to have a so-called normal conversation with him is about as easy as one of Darrington's exams. Nonetheless, he wears an almost smirk on his lips. Are you saying I'm one of the best players? His lips quirk. I tear my gaze from them. Note, apparently, J.J. is not an overly humble person. Well, you show up out of nowhere, were on the red team before, and obviously crush it on the field so, I shrug. Part of the mystery. His eyes linger on me and then travel over to my bureau, desk, and my bed. Do you want to sit down? I ask, suddenly feeling awkward. Maybe he's tired. Usually, when we practice in my room we stand at opposing sides as if we're in a duel until it's time to block thoughts. West said proximity is a factor except for the most advanced witches and wizards and of course for magicals who have the natural talent. JJ folds himself into the chair at my desk, and I sit on the edge of my bed. About the attack. Did you hear anything more? Is Pierce okay? 
I ask, weighing whether I should mention what I overheard in the library. I keep a wall up around my thoughts, just in case he's being nosy. Too late. His eyebrows go up. Interesting, he mutters. His gaze turns far away for a moment. So, uh, I guess we should get to it, given I still can't seem to keep my thoughts private from you. His eyes snap to me, and he gets to his feet. I face him. We're only about a foot from each other. Gosh, he's tall, and, and well-built. It's like he grew since he started playing rumpus. For the first time, I notice the ripple of muscles beneath his uniform. The energy shifts between us, the threads thicken, but instead of sensing him poking around, trying to find a way into my mind, he suddenly reads like an open book, like he let down his impermeable force field. First, I see us, facing off during our first lesson, with Chancellor West. It was when he saw my memory of our meeting on the beach. The night I saw my name in the stars, and right before I found out about Riptivik. I couldn't sleep and was thinking about his eyes, eyes I could get lost in. Then I see it. Or rather, feel it. J.J. Thorne's internal smile when he saw this secret thought of mine. It's a buoyant, joyous feeling, and warm, unlike his skin. The threads of energy twist abruptly. He's in the library early this morning. It must have been shortly after the attack. He rushes outside, races along the path, and stops when he sees me in the distance, sneaking out of the woods with Yassi. He catches his breath. I feel his relief as it washed through him. Then I feel something in my hand. It's cold. Snow? No. My pulse races. JJ's fingers twine with mine in real life. I look down. He lets go and leaves me with his chill. We break eye contact, and I step back, unsure what to make of this. I should go, he says, and steps toward the door. When I hear the knob turn, I say, wait. He turns slowly. My heart pounds so hard I'm afraid he can hear it. J.J.? Maya? His English-accented voice is like gravel, deep and dark. I have a trillion things I could say to him. Instead, I pick up the book he gave me when I was in the infirmary. Thank you for bringing this to me. Did it answer some of your questions? He asks, letting go of the doorknob. No, it left me with more. Just like you. He's good at this skill, keeping me wondering and asking, never answering. His silence begs me to fill it. I think I'm glad you think that I'm nothing like her. But I want to know exactly why the comparison has been drawn in the first place. Well, aside from us both being wish witches, which is rare. That's exactly why. Us both being wish witches? She violated the laws of nature. Then came the prophecy. It's a cause and effect formula. Action, outcome. Bad deed, consequences. Disdain drips from his voice. What is the prophecy? No one will explain it fully to me. That's because they're afraid to bind their magic to it. Complacency, if you ask me. But there are risks, I suppose. So I'm doomed to forever live in wonder. I blink a few times wondering for a moment whether I mean the topic at hand or the mystery of this moody guy in my room. His expression brightens and then just as quickly fades. I'll tell you or rather, show you. What about the risk? He shakes his head. No risk, no reward. I believe in taking chances if it means change. And I'm involved in the prophecy, so I can openly talk about it. Wait. What? The room is suddenly warm, even with JJ in it. The light seems to dim, and I lean in. You're part of the prophecy? I ask, confused. Some might argue I am the prophecy. J.J. Thorne, you lost me. He looks stricken. Neither one of us moves. I mean that I'm confused, I say. Prepare for more of that. What do you mean? I ask. He reaches into his pocket and then drops a dark stone in my palm. I toss it from hand to hand like a hot potato. Only it isn't hot. 
rather, it's cold. Colder than an ice cube. So cold I can hardly handle it. Blow on it. My forehead furrows. JJ nods, urging me. When I don't, he cups my hands in his, drawing them closer to my lips. Our eyes meet for a moment. Gray eyes so close that my head spins and my chest lurches. You wanted to know. Go ahead. Breathe on it. I cup it in both hands and breathe onto it. Like an egg, the dark exterior cracks, letting out white light. Close your eyes, he says. I'm not sure if I hear, see, or simply feel the next part, but it's like I download the prophecy. Suddenly, I know it. Then the stone is plucked from my hand. I open my eyes. JJ returns to his seat and says, two stars, shining light. One dim. One bright. What came before cannot be undone unless the latter frees the sun. I blink my eyes a few times. Shaky, I flop back on my bed. Why all the theatrics? Why couldn't you have just told me that? I say to the ceiling. I didn't think you'd believe me. It's something you needed to experience to believe. That a bright star will free the sun? I'm pretty sure the sun is free. It comes up every day, does its thing. Sets in the west. All that. No, Maya. The sun. The slight inflection of his accented voice suggests he means a person. Me and you. I bolt to sitting, but he's out the door. Just then, Yassi comes up the stairs. Her eyes widen as he replaces his new top hat. I torch the other one. What are you doing here? She asks him, abandoning all pretense. Aren't you supposed to be in your dorm? Attacks, curfew, and all? Her eyes narrow. Should I ask what you were doing in the woods this morning? He growls. Neither answers as they brush by each other. Just before JJ is out of sight, he says, Good night, Maya. Once again, my heart races. The next day, I am determined to learn as much as I can about wish witchery. I scour all available print materials in the school, leading me to linger in Darrington's classroom after we're dismissed. It's risky. Probably stupid, but if anyone has these materials, it's her. And bingo. I find a book titled Crimes and Curses, an investigation into rare witchcraft on a low shelf, stuff it in my bag, and hurry to the library. I go to the rear of the building and the same set of chairs JJ and I occupied recently. Opening the book, I land on a page bearing the familiar image of Imogen Hawks. It's the same picture as the one Dewey Dunkel showed me the first time someone commented on how we seem alike. I've wanted to distance myself from her and not be compared to someone else because I'm me. Not a gorgeous, beloved, talented witch who lived long ago. I skim the first paragraph, outlining her early life, born to two human non-magically talented parents. We have that in common. Then her time at Riptivic, where she was a star student, impressing everyone with her powers. Also popular, a star rumpus player, everyone's sweetheart at the sweetheart dance. That's where the similarities end. I continue reading. She left the school and briefly took a job at the Office of Magical Management and didn't find it suitable for her ambitions. Then she had a stint singing in private clubs, performed in multiple theater productions, grossing the most for the company in history, traveled the world and then started her empire. In a word, she was charismatic. It turns out many of the things she did later in life were considered controversial, including alchemical potions, for maintaining youth. I've gleaned that magicals believe that with age comes wisdom and to deny the natural processes is defying nature. She also thought all witches and wizards should have more years of formal training at a special school she created. She studied with several figures known for being suspects in magical crimes and being in and out of litigation for supposedly not following magical law. She even did a stint at Iron Tower for protesting a policy enacted by the OMM. I skim some more. She married, but it doesn't say anything about her family life other than that she kept them out of the limelight while maintaining her public persona. 
I'd like to know more about her wish witchery, but don't come across anything significant other than that she briefly helped the terminally infirm realize their last requests. I skip to the WS in the index and find the term wish witchery. The pages referenced aren't in Imogen's section. Instead, I read about a witch named Ivanka Stormanov who exposed several crime rings and later took to investigating criminal activities in the magical world, including Imogen Hawk's alleged loophole. There's little more said about Ivanka Stormanov other than that she dedicated the rest of her life to proving Imogen abused a wish witchery loophole, but died before she succeeded. Her dying wish was that Imogen be found guilty. This was a wish Imogen didn't grant. I flip back to Imogen's section, but it doesn't indicate when she died. Dewey Dunkel plops down in the other chair and drops a book as tall as a double layer cake in his lap. Darrington assigned me makeup work. Tell me everything about Imogen Hawks, I blurt, resting my chin on my hand. Dewey narrows his eyes. What's in it for me? All my pie for a week. Cool. But I would have told you anyway, because it gives me an excuse to procrastinate. Her story is fascinating. He exhales. Some say Imogen Hawks violated the laws of nature. The very laws magical energy is built upon. How? Dewey frowns. Supposedly, she traded essence, in the non-magical world, it's kind of like the soul, I guess. Isn't that something demons do? They steal magical essence. She used alchemy and her wish witchery, along with some very grim magic, to obtain youthful essence so she could delay or deny the passage of time. To stall getting older. His voice is grave. Do you mean like eternal youth to achieve immortality? He nods. I gasp. Is she still alive then? No one knows. Gregor's axe. If she was guilty, I hope she realized her mistake and reversed it, but the prophecy suggests otherwise. What's the prophecy? His voice lowers, and we walk away from the one of the Libravens passing. There's a lot of superstition surrounding prophecy. Some think if you speak one aloud, you imprint your magic upon it, thereby reinforcing it. No one wants to be associated with it in case it bodes ill. This confirms what JJ said. Dewey smiles. Lucky for you, I'm not superstitious. However, we weren't quiet enough because the Libraven hushes us and goes so far as to put a muting spell between us. Chapter 8 I meet up with Yassi later and she slams the door to my room. I see why you despise JJ. He's so unpleasant. It's none of his business why we were in the woods unless he knows where I can get trifolos. She crosses her arms in front of her chest. Trifolos? It's what cinder beasts eat when demons aren't available. They're fierce and will attack, but they're just doing it to protect. I don't hear the rest of what she says, because something becomes clear. Well, kind of. The memory of JJ seeing me coming out of the woods, and the relief he felt that I was safe. My heart gallops. Then skids to a stop. Now, I'm really confused. What do you know about Imogen Hawks's prophecy? I blurt. A lot mostly from seeing people thinking about it. Loads of people know the gist of it, but no one will speak it aloud. They don't want their magic associated with it, I add. But I don't understand why. If the prophecy is meant to solve a problem, why are people reluctant? They're afraid. Prophecies are very powerful and can change the future significantly. They can even influence the past. Remember, time doesn't always move in a line, one hour ticking past after another, at least not in the magical world. As you know, these kinds of forecasts aren't definite, but there's a loophole. If the subjects of the prophecy fail, say for instance, there's an evil overlord wizard and a young wizard is meant to overthrow him. Are you referring to Voldemort and Harry? I ask around a laugh, surprised at the reference. She nods. I've read the books. I've been meaning to ask you about magical fiction, I say, going on a tangent. Sadly, there aren't a lot of magical novelists that portray things true to life. Anyway, back to what I was saying. 
If the boy who lived failed at the task, the prophecy set out for him, for instance, if he lived in our world and according to our laws, the inverse would have unfolded. He who shall not be named would have lived and reigned in terror forevermore. That would be the result of Harry failing. Sort of. The way prophecy works is once the subjects agree to try to carry it out, the equal and opposite become a possibility. So if Harry never tried to defeat Voldemort, he would have just continued to vie for power indefinitely. Well, I'm not inside the author's head, but if it were a prophecy in our world, essentially, yes. Once Harry accepted the prophecy and committed to it, if he failed, game over. Voldemort, ruler supreme with no way to defeat him ever. Past and present altered as if Harry had never existed. I give a big nod, coming back to our present reality. So in other words, if I accept this prophecy, I have to carry it out otherwise. Otherwise, what was done before cannot be undone. And whatever grievous misuse of magic caused the prophecy to be formed in the first place would continue, possibly strengthen. JJ's words echo. What was done before? I ask. JJ knows, she says. It's strange, I can't read his mind, but I know he knows. Yeah, JJ knows, I repeat and then I do too. I experience the prophecy after all. Not in words, but it becomes clear. There were two curses as the result of Imogen Hawks messing with magical law. She created the demons, and she did something to her son. I don't know what. But she did something unforgivable. Maya? I hear my name. Yassi comes into focus. She shakes my shoulder. Are you okay? She asks. I snap back to reality, but I'm not sure I'm okay, because I just realized who Imogen Hawks's son is, and who I'm meant to assassinate if I'm to follow Storch's orders. Yassi's voice sounds remote. Listen, it's almost lights out, but I'm getting my hands on Trifolos even if I have to steal them from the school apothecary. You'll help me, right? I nod, not exactly sure what all I just agreed to. I don't find out what Trifolos are for a full week, during which I wake up each day with a new and exciting curse, because there's no other word for it. Day one, I'm covered in fur, thick, black, hot, itchy, also, I think I have fleas. Day two, my mouth feels on fire like I just ate my mom's hottest chili sauce, also, flames fire from my mouth when I sneeze. Day three, my hands are glued together, I was stuck in my room for hours until doing noticed I was absent from all my classes and sent Winnie back to the dorm. Day four, I can only walk backward, I do get the hang of it after a while. Day five, I have an ongoing case of the giggles, FYI, it's worse than hiccups. Day 6, I smell like rotten eggs, most embarrassing thing ever. Day 7, I can only say two words, yes or no. To say I've become very familiar with the infirmary is an understatement. By the fourth day, the nurse was expecting me. When I could finally speak beyond yes and no, she started me in on a line of questioning, what have I eaten? Where do I sleep? How long? She asked about my bathroom habits my uniform storage, and on and on. Magic leaves traces, of course, but I can't seem to find the signature. Multiple people, wands, and piggyback spells are used to keep the source secret. It's surprisingly advanced. I haven't seen anything like this since the Borworm Jinxes of 1972. She pauses. Oh. Oh. Her eyes widen. I recently read that they just released the files. It must be a copycat. A smile blooms on her face. I know just what to do. Listen carefully. Next time this happens, don't do anything to try to stop it. Come right to me. Do you understand? I nod. Literally. Even if you're naked, come straight here. Naked? If you attempt to get dressed or change your hair color back to normal or say anything other than yes or no, or whatever the jinx is, the spell effectively bores deeper and the signature from the person who performed the magic disappears. Hopefully, it won't happen again. She smiles wryly. See you tomorrow. Yassi, Dewey, Audra, Winnie Tarbell, and Wyatt wait for me outside the infirmary.
I got them, Yassi answers. Got what? I ask. Oh good, you can talk normally again, Winnie says. I got the trifolos, Yassi says. You mean I got them, Dewey corrects. I helped, Winnie adds. My uncle has a farm. What are trifolos exactly? I ask. Instead of answering, Yassi says, I wish it had snowed again. The slush makes it harder to track the cinder beast. It's supposed to storm the day after tomorrow, Wyatt says. Which makes it all the more important we find the poor creature soon. Yassi quickens her pace. Everyone is in on this now? I ask. She couldn't stop talking about it, Wyatt says. And I have an uncommon knowledge about the things that dwell in the woods, especially given that I'm a dwarf. I put two and two together when she started asking questions. I don't think any of us should go into the woods alone, Dewey adds. I'm keeping lookout, Winnie says. Also, Dewey knew about my uncle's farm and used my connection at the quail mail office to get them expediated here. I didn't know about any of this until about five minutes ago, Audra explains. I'm still not sure it's a good idea. But you're a wood nymph, Yassi says. We're talking about a cinder beast. A beast. A deadly creature, Dewey says dramatically. Audra rolls her eyes. It's very big and very hairy. The teeth, Dewey says. The claws, Winnie adds. It has poor eyesight and if it feels threatened, it will indiscriminately attack, Audra says. And you want to feed this thing? I ask. I told you they're endangered. These aren't its native woods. I'm guessing it's lost, or drawn here, by the demons. Are you planning to give it a map to get back home? No, I'm going to bring it home. How, we all ask at once. She pulls out a silver rope. Audra's eyes widen. Leopold's lasso? Where'd you get that? It was passed down from my grandmother. I always knew it would come in handy. Chilly, I bounce from foot to foot and blow into my hands. The bells toll. We've wasted too much time, Yassi says. I can't skip class, Audra says, already edging away. Let's meet before the rumpus game, Wyatt suggests. Yassi's shoulders fall. Come on, you'll be late, I say, leading her away. She glances back at the woods and I make her promise not to go alone. Aside from my daily jinxes and the ongoing fear of demons, the campus begins to undergo a magical transformation in preparation for the holidays. It must be West's doing. Garlands of pine line the paths along with fairy lights, not the plug-in kind, but rather, tiny orbs of shimmering light the fae make that turn silver, gold, copper, and a shade of purplish-gray that reminds me of JJ's eyes. I've also been smelling butter and sugar, which can only mean one thing, pie. I'm daydreaming about what kind of pie we'll have for Christmas when I spot Yassi through the window of my conservation class. I grab a hall pass while Darrington has us revise our essays on the 12 forms of fire and their various uses. I should ace this one. I pass the girls' bathroom and hurry down the path toward the forest. I catch up to Yassi just past the tree line. Don't be so loud, she whispers. What are you doing? I hiss. What do you think, she asks. I thought Winnie had the trifolos. I, um, went to her room to save her the trouble. Yassi, this is dangerous. Yet I don't leave her side. She puts her finger to her lips, shushing me. I'll be back before nightfall. We have to be quiet, Yassi hisses. She steps into the woods, and I follow. If for some reason, the cinder beast doesn't respond well, run and stay low. The trifolo supply should last about a month. But I really want to bring it back to its home. Wouldn't it be useful to track the demons though? Yes and no. Their blood is prized by grim mages, so it's better they live in the wilds and far from civilization. I sigh as we follow what appears to be intermittent tracks, belonging to a two-legged elephant with claws. Yassi finds a thin tuft of fur on a branch and continues in that direction. Chapter 9 
Yasi and I keep running until we reach the edge of the woods. When we cross to the other side of the hedge and onto the path, Darrington waits for us. Dare I ask what you're doing? Her voice could freeze ice, which is to say, it's colder than cold. Neither one of us answers. Oh, you know, tracking a scary beast and being attacked by some people disguised under hoods. Just a regular day here at Riptivik. Maya, you took the hall pass and ran. Literally. The class was over almost an hour ago. The two of you can join me for detention. Yasi says, Professor, I have to meet my study group in the library. You can tell them that you have detention, she corrects. As we follow Darrington back to the building, I internally scold myself for leaving my bag in her classroom. I only meant to stop Yassi from going into the woods alone, not join her. Darrington walks swiftly ahead while we lag a few steps. Who do you suppose was in the woods wearing those capes? I ask, knowing full well JJ was among them. Cloaks? Sounds like the secret society? They probably can't meet at night. Wait a minute, Yassi says a little too loudly. I will not wait a minute, young lady, Darrington says. I'll add another minute onto your detention. We pick up the pace and take our seats in Darrington's classroom aka the dungeon. Unfortunately, it's freezing in here. I imagine warm, sandy Jamaican beaches when we'd go there to visit my mom's family. Darrington's voice breaks my trance. Yes, Yassi. She lowers her hand. I, um, no we probably weren't supposed to be in the woods. Not probably, you definitely weren't supposed to be in there. The forest is off-limits unless you're accompanied by a teacher or authorized personnel. She clears her throat. We, uh, saw someone else there. Darrington leans in eager to catch people breaking rules, which is interesting because she seems to take great pleasure teaching us about all the magical rules that can be broken. She says it's so we know what not to do. I expect Yassi to say something about the cinder beast, but instead, she says, there were several students in black cloaks, and one in. I cut her off. Have you heard of the marauders? I ask. Darrington leans back. The marauders, she repeats. Maybe an offshoot of the secret society, the hive, Yassi says boldly. Darrington's mouth forms a thin line as though she's unsure whether to continue this curious conversation or silence us since, technically, we're in her detention. Yes, I've heard murmurings. Do you think there's a secret society on campus? Yassi is brazen. I know there is, or there wants to be. And I know they were behind the spectacle on Hallow's Eve. Her eyes narrow. Black capes? In the forest? Interesting. She nods and gets to her feet. Just before she's about to sweep out the door, it flies open. What's interesting to me is that if Darrington is in cahoots with Storch, they don't know about the descent on the campus. A second-year elf catches her breath. Annabelle? What are you doing, bursting in here? Darrington exclaims. Professor, the lake house has disappeared. Faculty meeting right now. Without a backward glance, Darrington departs. Detention over? I ask Yassi. She nods and along with half the campus, we rush down toward the lake house. I've never been down here before, but there's a lake, all right. Is it for boats? I ask Yassi. No, it's where the mere students used to learn. Now it's little more than an underwater prison. We think we have it bad with reform school, I've been down here a few times, when I was trying to get a lead on Trifolos, and they're treated worse than we are. The structure consists of a shelter for the teacher and any other students who assemble on land. It was open on one side and out over the water. Kind of like a dock with a roof and a few walls, she says. Everyone gathers around in shock. Chancellor West paces, pausing after a length and pondering. I avoid his eyes because I've hardly been spying for him. I wish had more information. Though the black-caped people in the woods along with JJ could be useful. Unless, of course, he's also a spy and was following them. I stagger. He caused the snow squall. 
Piles of slush border a perfect rectangle where there used to be a building. On the other side of the crowd, I spot the top hat, but no black cloaks. Storch marches down the hill, her eyes slits and her nostrils flared. West calls, students, if you know anything about this, I demand you come forth. Punishment for withholding information will be as severe as for those guilty. The water gently laps the shore. No one says a word. A slick voice says, it had to have been the giants. A deep voice says, what would we want, with an outbuilding? Someone else says, it was probably the elves. They're upset because they have to live in dorms and the mere students get to stay in their lake. West calls, silence. There will be no false accusations. We do not tolerate this kind of hostility at Riptivic. If you have a verifiable piece of information, please see me or the administrative head, Mrs. Storch. Otherwise, if I'm not mistaken, there is a rumpus game to be played. Anger laces his voice. Everyone disperses, but the insults continue to fly as soon as West is out of earshot. Changelings, were students, vamps, and fate all accuse each other of making the building disappear, but for no good reason. What if it just vanished on its own? I ask Yassi. It's inanimate. Magic doesn't work that way. What if it was that group we saw in the woods? The ones in the black? The marauders? She takes a deep breath. Maybe. I glance into the crowd for JJ, but as usual, he ghosted. The antagonism carries over to the rumpus stands with gold against black this afternoon. JJ is still number 13. But the team doesn't seem to aim their aggression at him. I want to ignore JJ. I cannot. I need answers, or I need to be reminded of one sure thing amidst the ongoing uncertainty of life at Reform School, that we still hate each other. Anger and irritation build up and by halftime, but I'm not sure if it's at him or my situation. Despite my magical abilities, I feel powerless. How did this become my problem? I march down to the field. When I reach JJ, he takes off his helmet and rakes his hand through his hair. My eyes narrow. JJ, I saw you. Saw me what? Playing, he asks, still slightly out of breath and distracted. No, in the woods. I'm about to say more, but I start barking. Like a dog. Yapping is more like it. I move to clap my hand over my mouth, but remember what the nurse said. The barking goes on. In a different setting, or if I knew it was temporary, this might be funny. However, given the fact that I've lost, count how many times I've been jinxed and now, in public, tears pierce the corners of my eyes. JJ gives me a sideways look as I continue to bark. There's laughter as attention falls on me. The teens, the people into the stands, and especially Honey and her minions are hysterical. They're quick to forget the disappearance of a building on campus and the animosity at my expense. The heat of embarrassment builds under my skin. My magic moves to the surface. I fight the urge to blast them all into silence. Instead, I let him into my head. Then as though quickly putting two and two together, JJ whips out his wand. I've rarely seen it, but it's obsidian and powerful looking. He makes a complicated swishing motion and incants something in a low voice. The barking slows as what appears to be a thick, vaporous worm with red eyes magnetizes to the tip of his wand. I feel sick at the sight of what must be the boarworm jinx, but the barking stops. I look around before wiping my eyes. I see laughter on the faces of those nearest me, except JJ, I've never seen him laugh, not even when I shared my most hilarious memories with him. Not even now. Delicate snowflakes drift toward the ground. Not trusting my voice, I mouth a thank you and rush away, embarrassed. I could go to my dorm room and cry into my pillow. I could punch something. I could use an outlet for all this emotion. Instead, I find myself by the dining hall. The smell of something chocolatey baking reminds me of my mom, who I could really use a hug from right now. I step inside, inhale deeply, and go to the water bubbler. It's quiet except for the clanging of pots and pans from the kitchen. I sit with my thoughts for a minute, 
wondering who's been targeting me. A few weeks ago, I would have thought it was JJ who had it in for me, but I don't think that's quite true anymore. When I step outside, written in the thin dusting of snow, is the message, if you fall, I'll be there to catch you. If you rise, take me too. Someone at Riptivic obviously hates me, as evidenced by the boreworm jinx. Someone else doesn't hate me. I wipe the edges of my eyes and continue walking, down the lane, toward the front gates of the school. I imagine them festooned in holly and garlands of pine. Gold and red bows bordering each side and in the middle an enormous wreath. While walking to class, Yassi described how much the campus has changed since last year. I guess West's influence doesn't reach the edge of the school. It's nearly the solstice and then winter break. I could try to blast my way through the gates and leave. But what would I do? Walk home? I'm in a faraway country. I don't know anyone and have little more than the pocket money I came with when I thought I was being sent to a magical boarding school. The barbed wire and faint shimmer of magic remind me that leaving wouldn't be easy. Then again, someone here vanished a building. Maybe the same could be done to a person. I exhale because I've committed. To this magical life. To this prophecy. I feel it all the way in my bones, or wherever it is magic comes from. The energy inside and around me. I'm on this path now. There's no leaving. I pass back under the willows and linger there. They whisper about the building that disappeared, apparently, it was officially called Aquinash Lake House, the result of the rumpus game, gold one, and something about a girl who couldn't stop barking. That was me, I call without thinking. Someone was playing a trick, or more accurately, a jinx. The snow continues to fall as the trees make their apologies. At least that's what it seems like. It's not so much that I hear them speaking, but feel their message. I drop down and lean against a trunk and explain everything that happened, the fur, the hands stuck together, the nurse in the infirmary warning me about the boreworm. The snow is so pretty, and I feel so content under the trees, I don't notice it's nearly dark until a figure approaches. There you are, JJ says. He's no longer in his rumpus uniform. You must be freezing. He pulls me to my feet. His hands are freezing. So are you. He looks up at the trees, shakes his head, and then starts down the lane. When he notices I'm not beside him, he backtracks. What were you doing in the woods earlier? I ask. Research. What are the black cloaks about? I'm finding out. His words are clipped. Simple. Maybe he's afraid if he says more, he'll reveal too much. Why'd you help stop the barking? I ask. His lips quirk. Why wouldn't I have? Chapter 9 Yassi and I keep running until we reach the edge of the woods. When we cross to the other side of the hedge and onto the path, Darrington waits for us. Dare I ask what you're doing? Her voice could freeze ice, which is to say it's colder than cold. Neither one of us answers. Oh, you know, tracking a scary beast and being attacked by some people disguised under hoods. Just a regular day here at Riptivic. Maya, you took the hall pass and ran. Literally. The class was over almost an hour ago. The two of you can join me for detention. Yassi says, Professor, I have to meet my study group in the library. You can tell them that you have detention, she corrects. As we follow Darrington back to the building, I internally scold myself for leaving my bag in her classroom. I only meant to stop Yassi from going into the woods alone, not join her. Darrington walks swiftly ahead while we lag a few steps. Who do you suppose was in the woods wearing those capes? I ask, knowing full well JJ was among them. Cloaks? Sounds like the secret society? They probably can't meet at night. Wait a minute, Yassi says a little too loudly. I will not wait a minute, young lady, Darrington says. I'll add another minute onto your detention. We pick up the pace and take our seats in Darrington's classroom aka the dungeon. Unfortunately, it's freezing in here. 
I imagine warm, sandy Jamaican beaches, when we'd go there to visit my mom's family. Darrington's voice breaks my trance. Yes, Yassi. She lowers her hand. I, um, no we probably weren't supposed to be in the woods. Not probably, you definitely weren't supposed to be in there. The forest is off-limits unless you're accompanied by a teacher or authorized personnel. She clears her throat. We, uh, saw someone else there. Darrington leans in eager to catch people breaking rules, which is interesting because she seems to take great pleasure teaching us about all the magical rules that can be broken. She says it's so we know what not to do. I expect Yassi to say something about the cinder beast, but instead, she says, there were several students in black cloaks, and one in. I cut her off. Have you heard of the marauders? I ask. Darrington leans back. The marauders, she repeats. Maybe an offshoot of the secret society, the hive, Yassi says boldly. Darrington's mouth forms a thin line as though she's unsure whether to continue this curious conversation or silence us since, technically, we're in her detention. Yes, I've heard murmurings. Do you think there's a secret society on campus? Yassi is brazen. I know there is, or there wants to be. And I know they were behind the spectacle on Hallow's Eve. Her eyes narrow. Black capes? In the forest? Interesting. She nods and gets to her feet. Just before she's about to sweep out the door, it flies open. What's interesting to me is that if Darrington is in cahoots with Storch, they don't know about the descent on the campus. A second-year elf catches her breath. Annabelle? What are you doing, bursting in here? Darrington exclaims. Professor, the lake house has disappeared. Faculty meeting right now. Without a backward glance, Darrington departs. Detention over? I ask Yassi. She nods and along with half the campus, we rush down toward the lake house. I've never been down here before, but there's a lake, all right. Is it for boats? I ask Yassi. No, it's where the mere students used to learn. Now it's little more than an underwater prison. We think we have it bad with reform school, I've been down here a few times, when I was trying to get a lead on Trifolos, and they're treated worse than we are. The structure consists of a shelter for the teacher and any other students who assemble on land. It was open on one side and out over the water. Kind of like a dock with a roof and a few walls, she says. Everyone gathers around in shock. Chancellor West paces, pausing after a length and pondering. I avoid his eyes because I've hardly been spying for him. I wish had more information. Though the black-caped people in the woods along with J.J. could be useful. Unless, of course, he's also a spy and was following them. I stagger. He caused the snow squall. Piles of slush border a perfect rectangle where there used to be a building. On the other side of the crowd, I spot the top hat, but no black cloaks. Storch marches down the hill, her eyes slits and her nostrils flared. West calls, students, if you know anything about this, I demand you come forth. Punishment for withholding information will be as severe as for those guilty. The water gently laps the shore. No one says a word. A slick voice says, it had to have been the giants. A deep voice says, what would we want, with an outbuilding? Someone else says, it was probably the elves. They're upset because they have to live in dorms and the mere students get to stay in their lake. West calls, silence. There will be no false accusations. We do not tolerate this kind of hostility at Riptivic. If you have a verifiable piece of information, please see me or the administrative head, Mrs. Storch. Otherwise, if I'm not mistaken, there is a rumpus game to be played. Anger laces his voice. Everyone disperses but the insults continue to fly as soon as West is out of earshot. Changelings, were students, vamps, and Faye all accuse each other of making the building disappear, but for no good reason. What if it just vanished on its own? I ask Yassi. It's inanimate. Magic doesn't work that way. What if it was that group we saw in the woods? The ones in the black? 
the marauders? She takes a deep breath. Maybe. I glance into the crowd for JJ, but as usual, he ghosted. The antagonism carries over to the rumpus stands with gold against black this afternoon. JJ is still number 13. But the team doesn't seem to aim their aggression at him. I want to ignore JJ. I cannot. I need answers or I need to be reminded of one sure thing amidst the ongoing uncertainty of life at reform school, that we still hate each other. Anger and irritation build up and by halftime, but I'm not sure if it's at him or my situation. Despite my magical abilities, I feel powerless. How did this become my problem? I march down to the field. When I reach JJ, he takes off his helmet and rakes his hand through his hair. My eyes narrow. JJ, I saw you. Saw me what? Playing, he asks, still slightly out of breath and distracted. No, in the woods. I'm about to say more, but I start barking. Like a dog. Yapping is more like it. I move to clap my hand over my mouth, but remember what the nurse said. The barking goes on. In a different setting, or if I knew it was temporary, this might be funny. However, given the fact that I've lost, count how many times I've been jinxed and now, in public, tears pierce the corners of my eyes. JJ gives me a sideways look as I continue to bark. There's laughter as attention falls on me. The teens, the people into the stands, and especially Honey and her minions are hysterical. They're quick to forget the disappearance of a building on campus and the animosity at my expense. The heat of embarrassment builds under my skin. My magic moves to the surface. I fight the urge to blast them all into silence. Instead, I let him into my head. Then as though quickly putting two and two together, JJ whips out his wand. I've rarely seen it, but it's obsidian and powerful looking. He makes a complicated swishing motion and incants something in a low voice. The barking slows as what appears to be a thick, vaporous worm with red eyes magnetizes to the tip of his wand. I feel sick at the sight of what must be the boarworm jinx, but the barking stops. I look around before wiping my eyes. I see laughter on the faces of those nearest me, except JJ, I've never seen him laugh, not even when I shared my most hilarious memories with him. Not even now. Delicate snowflakes drift toward the ground. Not trusting my voice, I mouth a thank you and rush away, embarrassed. I could go to my dorm room and cry into my pillow. I could punch something. I could use an outlet for all this emotion. Instead, I find myself by the dining hall. The smell of something chocolatey baking reminds me of my mom, who I could really use a hug from right now. I step inside, inhale deeply, and go to the water bubbler. It's quiet except for the clanging of pots and pans from the kitchen. I sit with my thoughts for a minute, wondering who's been targeting me. A few weeks ago, I would have thought it was JJ who had it in for me, but I don't think that's quite true anymore. When I step outside, written in the thin dusting of snow, is the message, if you fall, I'll be there to catch you. If you rise, take me too. Someone at Riptivic obviously hates me, as evidenced by the boarworm jinx. Someone else doesn't hate me. I wipe the edges of my eyes and continue walking, down the lane, toward the front gates of the school. I imagine them festooned in holly and garlands of pine. Gold and red bows bordering each side and in the middle an enormous wreath. While walking to class, Yassi described how much the campus has changed since last year. I guess West's influence doesn't reach the edge of the school. It's nearly the solstice and then winter break. I could try to blast my way through the gates and leave. But what would I do? Walk home? I'm in a faraway country. I don't know anyone and have little more than the pocket money I came with when I thought I was being sent to a magical boarding school. The barbed wire and faint shimmer of magic remind me that leaving wouldn't be easy. Then again, someone here vanished a building. Maybe the same could be done to a person. I exhale because I've committed. To this magical life. To this prophecy. I feel it all the way in my bones, or wherever it is magic comes from. The energy inside and around me. 
I'm on this path now. There's no leaving. I pass back under the willows and linger there. They whisper about the building that disappeared, apparently, it was officially called Aquinash Lake House, the result of the rumpus game, gold one, and something about a girl who couldn't stop barking. That was me, I call without thinking. Someone was playing a trick, or more accurately, a jinx. The snow continues to fall as the trees make their apologies. At least that's what it seems like. It's not so much that I hear them speaking, but feel their message. I drop down and lean against a trunk and explain everything that happened, the fur, the hands stuck together, the nurse in the infirmary warning me about the boarworm. The snow is so pretty, and I feel so content under the trees, I don't notice it's nearly dark until a figure approaches. There you are, JJ says. He's no longer in his rumpus uniform. You must be freezing. He pulls me to my feet. His hands are freezing. So are you. He looks up at the trees, shakes his head, and then starts down the lane. When he notices I'm not beside him, he backtracks. What were you doing in the woods earlier? I ask. Research. What are the black cloaks about? I'm finding out. His words are clipped. Simple. Maybe he's afraid if he says more, he'll reveal too much. Why'd you help stop the barking? I ask. His lips quirk. Why wouldn't I have? I open my mouth and imitate a bark. I see the spark of a smile, but it vanishes behind the curtain of snow falling between us. JJ steps closer. You never laugh. You never smile. You never get embarrassed, I say. He shakes his head. You're so self-possessed. He shrugs. You're so impossible. He holds his hand out and his palm curves like a question mark. It's not dark yet, I say, indicating the precaution against the demons. Just in case, he says in his English accent. It's the kind of voice that can charm girls into doing anything, low, a bit growly, commanding. He nods at his hand. I hesitate because if I answer him, there will be no turning back. I meet his eyes. I lace my fingers in his. I guess those easily charmed includes me. We walk back to the dorms in silence under the softly falling snow. Nope. No turning back now. However, when we start singing, I lose track of everything but hope. Hope that we can figure out how to get along and live in peace, we can continue our rumpus winning streak, I won't be sent to the Iron Tower. Hope I still get to eat pie every day, and that maybe, just maybe, whatever lies ahead between JJ and me, the prophecy, and my future won't be impossible. Mostly, I feel on the brink of change. I think we all feel it, like we're all one, despite our differences, at least at this moment. We've been planted, and now we're growing. On the edge of the ring, Storch leers and stings. Her eyes glint in the low light and a grim thought burns away the others, leaving little more than ash. What if this fire is just the beginning? To my shock and awe, the next day, Miss Mayweather announces we're officially permitted to go home for the holidays. Parents would become suspicious if we were detained on campus for this long without leave. Then again, Belgrave blisters are still going around. But it's not without precautions by the corrupt OMM. All the students line up along the lane by the gates. One by one, we each take a voice vow along with drinking a tracking potion so there's no chance we'll resist returning to campus. We are not permitted to speak of the reform school, the rules, or the demons. As the spell is cast, my jaw tightens and my head swims for a moment. It's a small price to pay for my temporary release. While home, I will try to find a way to convey to my parents what's really going on, get help, and get our freedom. But the prospect of home, Filbert, Chelsea, and my old life is almost too overwhelming for me to think about on top of an exit strategy. My parents are overjoyed to see me. We talk about the last couple of months at school, unwillingly, I leave out important and potentially incriminating details. We decorate our tree with candles, I insisted my mom convert to the flameless kind, go to the beach and make a snowman out of sand, it's cold, eat smoked fish, finish tradition, and we stay up late playing games, including my favorite, charades. 
The day after Christmas, I arranged to get together with my old friends, but can't stop thinking about my new ones, wondering what Yassi's doing in the forest, Bree, my roommate, with the Pixies, Dewey and Winnie, and all the others. I suppose I'll find out after the new year. Mostly, I wonder about JJ. Maybe he had to go home early. But where is home? England? Then I remember. Scary Street. I tell my parents I'm going to take a walk before I go to Chelsea's for pizza, movies, and time catching up with everyone. I pass the familiar convenience store, the library, and houses of friends from grade school. I wonder what my life would have been like if I knew I was a witch all along. I stand at the end of Scary Street, dismissing my childhood fears about the haunted house, and walk cautiously toward it. Nonetheless, my pulse quickens. Snow clouds hang low and dense in the late day sky. Even off campus, probably especially off campus, it's not safe to be out in the dark with demons on the loose. According to Dewey, the demons mainly want magicals, so they aren't as enticed by non magicals, making me a prime candidate. I hasten toward the house. As I stand on the sidewalk opposite, I glimpse a figure in the window. I'd recognize the silhouette anywhere. I step closer. It looks like JJ, only it isn't. I remember Chelsea said that he has a brother, but JJ has never mentioned him. Then the window is empty. I knock on the door and no one answers. I try again and then listen. JJ, I call. I jiggle the handle and the door falls open. My voice echoes through the halls. My pulse races. This is the part in scary movies when everyone yells at the screen, turn back. Don't go in the house. Don't be stupid. I linger by the door, squinting, trying to discern shapes in the near darkness. JJ, I whisper. I feel the soft brush of his breath on my cheek. JJ? I push the door open further. The boy that I've spent so much time avoiding at Reptivic stands before me, yet it's as if I see right through him. I tell myself to breathe. Instead, I run. January. Chapter 11. Christmas is a flurry of delicious food, friends and family visiting from out of town, and snow. Lots of it. It's truly the most wonderful time of the year, if not a smidge overwhelming. Usually, the Wessel family holiday celebrations are relatively quiet with most of my extended family living overseas. Not this year. Nope. I get the sense my parents weren't quite prepared for me to leave the nest so soon. Magical boarding school wasn't in the original plan. When they had me, they'd already had successful careers as Olympic athletes, had traveled the world, and pursued their other interests, my dad as an architect and my mom as a singer and vocal coach, and other side hustles, she calls herself a multi-passionate woman. They'd settled down when I came along. I became their focus, they created the blueprints for me to have the perfect childhood. And mostly I did, except for never feeling like I measured up. I lived in the shadow of their glory and strived for perfection even though I perpetually fell short of it. But I'd never tell anyone this. So life was okay until I found out I was a witch. They knew about the possibility, thanks to a visit from the OMM after I was born, but they tucked it away along with my first binky, the cute little onesies, my favorite set of wooden blocks, the kindergarten drawings, and all the other mementos of an ordinary childhood. As it turns out, I'm a wish witch, specifically requiring me to attend a secret magical academy. But it's actually a reform school, which they know nothing about. Nonetheless, they boast proudly about my acceptance into a prestigious private school overseas. My mother has a loud personality and voice, but without me here, perhaps the house is a little too quiet, prompting her to fill it up this holiday season, and the time between Christmas and New Year's is no exception. The revolving door of guests has left me little time to contemplate my visit to Scary Street even though it's always there when the conversation dries up, when people turn in for the night, and I lay in bed unable to sleep. Collectively, I've probably slept six hours in as many nights. My sister already went back to New Jersey where she goes to school at Princeton. Before she left, we talked about how we think our mom has been a bit lonely without us around. Well, not today. The first day of the new year. 
It's only 7 a.m., and a baby is crying, it's my aunt and uncle from Helsinki's seven-month-old, and a great-uncle is hacking, it sounds like he's going to explode. My parents' old friends from the Olympic days watch sports coverage, we have all the TV channels, and my mother and her sister are in a heated debate, likely over whether to cook the frittata over low or medium heat. Oh, and my cat Filbert, nestled in the crook of my arm as I lay in bed, is purring. I wish falling back asleep was as easy as closing my eyes. I could use a catnap or a month of hibernation. Not only that, but the semester of newness at Riptivic, the tension, the fear, the attacks, and all the questions pile up, leaving me exhausted. But I can't sleep. I pull out a notebook. Sometimes journaling helps. Chelsea calls it a mind dump, which sounds kind of gross. This is not to be confused with a mind wall or mind window. I start to write. I'm not worried about demons, okay, maybe a little bit, or homework and exams, well, kind of. I'm certainly not thinking about boys or dramas or anything like that, really, I'm not. The mystery of my wish witchery is on my mind. What do I know really? From what I've gathered so far. Wish witches can grant desires of the heart. Wish witches may not violate the laws of nature or magic. Wish witches may not use the wish for selfish reasons. How to perform wish witchery will reveal itself when the time is right. And that's it. I sigh. It's all so vague. Couldn't West have told me straight and save me hours of wondering and reading? But where to start? I promise myself to scour the rest of the campus when I return. Then a dark fear strikes me, catching my breath in my chest. If wish witches aren't allowed to use wishes for themselves, did I already break the law by making a wish on my birthday candles? It was inadvertent, but still, I did it. I wished that I'd fall in love this year. Does that mean if it happens, it's less true? Am I horrible for doing so? A lawbreaker? A terrible witch? Am I no different from Imogen Hawks? The house groans as it shifts and settles, something my parents claim is charming about owning a home that's over a hundred years old. I think it's creepy. Have I mentioned we were without electricity with this house full of out-of-towners for three days after a huge snowstorm wiped out power in our town? Have I mentioned that when we got power back, flights were still delayed, so almost everyone stayed a few extra days? The more the merrier as my mom likes to say. Have I mentioned I think J.J. Thorne is a ghost? Have I mentioned ghosts terrify me? Have I mentioned my grandmother is sitting on the end of my bed, knitting? Have I mentioned she's dead? I leap from under the safety of my covers and cross the room, backing against the window because she's on the side closer to the door. I lean against the shade and it whips upward, startling me. My grandmother doesn't flinch. I try to swallow the lump in my throat. I stutter. I mutter. I shake. Filbert sniffs the air and then goes back to sleep. Uh, hello? I manage to stammer. My grandmother, who died a few years ago in one of the spare bedrooms and then haunted us for a little while, doesn't look up. She continues to loop the red yarn around the needles as if this situation is totally normal. As if. I stand there until my feet get cold and consider jumping out the window there's a covering over our porch, so I could technically get down. I also consider screaming, but there's that lump in my throat. I could run, but what if she, I don't know, gets me? To my knowledge, I've never had a ghost in my bedroom before. What am I supposed to do? Scratch that. I have. J.J. Thorne. My witch training at Riptivic didn't prepare me for such an occasion. Plus, my wand is stuffed somewhere in the suitcase in my closet. I'd like to be back in bed sleeping. Or downstairs eating the frittata and what smells like banana bread fresh from the oven. I clear my throat. Moo Moo. She's from Finland, and this is what I always called her. Mamu, I repeat. She doesn't waver from her knitting. Hi, I say. Um, I haven't seen you in a while. She doesn't speak. My stomach growls. I'm going to have some breakfast. Would you like to go downstairs? 
I don't wait for her answer, grab Philbert from the bed, and rush out the door. When I reach the kitchen, my mother pauses mid-sentence, she was saying something about scallions versus shallots, and says, dear girl, you look like you've seen a ghost. The second one this week, actually. I nod my head and look around. Everyone except my mom and aunt, her sister who's also magical, are in the living room, so it's safe to speak openly and not break any major magical laws. Moo Moo is upstairs, I blurt. The dish till my mother holds falls to the floor. What? I didn't invite her, Aunt Ida says innocently. My mother quickly gathers her wits and gives her sister a pleading look. She rolls her eyes. You know, this is Ma's territory. Ma isn't here, my mother says sharply, recovered from her initial shock. Aunt Ida pauses and grudgingly says, Come on, Maya. I shake my head. You need to learn how to send them back, Aunt Ida says with a hand on her hip. Sometimes they get lost. Common around the holidays. I grip the back of a chair, memory of the ceremony on Hallow's Eve flooding back. My mom sighs. After Mumu passed, she stuck around a little while. Scared Maya half to death. She was haunting you? Aunt Ida asks. That's a strong word but Maya was young and not familiar with the supernatural. My aunt shakes her head. I lived with a ghoul for three months in college. It's no big deal. My mother clucks her tongue. What? He was cute. Listen, Maya, you don't have anything to worry about. You have magic. Ghosts are dead. Well, except for demons. Those you have to watch out for and a boy named J.J. Thorne, who I'm not sure is alive or dead or somewhere in between. Go ahead, my mom says. Aunt Ida knows what she's doing. Hurry though, your father doesn't need the stress of seeing his dead mother. I reluctantly trail behind my aunt who reminisces about her fling with the cute ghoul all those years ago. When we reach my room, Moo Moo is gone. Chapter 12 Aunt Ida circles the room once, closes her eyes, and circles it again. I swear I saw her, I say. My eyes fix at the end of my bed where my dead grandmother sat knitting. I believe you. Magic leaves traces. I sense she was here. But why? Maybe she was lonely. Family. Holidays. She shrugs. Moo Moo wasn't a very warm and cuddly person. In fact, I think she preferred to be alone. Dying can change things. My aunt pokes around. She must have had a reason to pay you a visit. Hopefully, she'll be back soon. Uh, no. Maya, when someone dies and they choose not to proceed to the spirit realm, there's usually a good reason. She was just generally mean. It's fitting that she'd stick around and haunt people. Maya, that's a terrible thing to say about your grandmother, my mom says, bursting into the room. It's true, I grumble. She wasn't very friendly, but, my mom fails to provide a convincing counterpoint. I heard, Aunt Ida says. I was saying to Maya, she'll probably be back. My mom suggests, show her how to deal with ghosts. Ma, should be the one. My mother holds her sister in her gaze, insistent. All right, all right, my aunt says. Where's your wand? Aunt Ida stares at it a long moment as surprise flashes across her face. But if it means anything to her, she doesn't say. We spend the next few minutes reviewing spellwork to clear the air of ghosts. It's not the same as the one Storch gave me. I don't quite get the hang of it when my mom calls us for breakfast. But that's okay. I don't plan to meet Moo Moo again. I'll sleep on the couch from now on. Keep practicing, my aunt encourages as we follow our noses downstairs. Questions about magic spark to my lips, but I can't ask her now. Even amidst the lively conversation gathered around the kitchen table, it's hard not to dwell on the fact that I woke up to see a ghost in my room. But that leads me to think about JJ. When I went to Scary Street, thinking he might be there, I'm pretty sure I saw a ghost, his ghost. Though now I'm starting to doubt myself. 
my cheeks warm. It's not as if I never thought about JJ before. I've thought about him plenty. Specifically how frustrating he is. How much he hates me and how much I hate him. It's kind of awful. But the last few encounters we had, it feels like something is shifting. It's easier for us to maintain the status quo and go on despising each other. That's familiar territory. Then again, it all couldn't change, because I kissed him, and I can't lie. I liked it. He also let me glimpse some of his memories. Then he held my hand, and not because he had to. Maybe I was concentrating so much on trying to figure out our new, um, situation, I guess I could call it, that I imagined seeing him in the doorway of the old haunted mansion in town. If I've learned anything since being a witch, magical energy is a powerful thing. It was dusk. I was tired. I'm spelled under a voice vow, preventing me from saying anything about my actual circumstances at Riptivic. I could certainly have been thinking, okay fine, obsessing, and just thought I saw him. Maya? I hear someone saying my name and look up, blinking my eyes a few times as I pull myself from thought and finish bringing the forkful of eggs to my mouth. I'd paused midair. What are your plans for today? my dad asks. We're all going into Boston. Faneuil Hall. Our guests have never been. You should come with us. Cool. Yay. More crowds, I think dismally. You love the chowder they have there, he says. I think I'll stay home today. I have a few assignments I should do. Chatter breaks off about how my parents should be so proud that I'm committed to my education, a debate about New England clam chowder versus Manhattan, and a few New Year's resolutions get tossed into the mix. Are you sure? My dad asks me. I nod. My aunt winks and discreetly swishes the air, the same way she showed me earlier. After I wave goodbye to the three carloads of people, I don't even go back inside. Not with the chance that I might encounter my grandmother again. Nope. I'm putting on my big girl breeches, and hat and scarf, and seeking out another ghost. In the light of day, I can do this. My boots crunch in the snow as I march over to Scary Street. My thoughts rush ahead with two possibilities. One, the regular JJ opens the door, invites me in, we have hot chocolate, and we chat like two normal, fully alive people. Two, no one answers the door, and I go home to an empty house. No ghosts on Scary Street or on Broom Street, that's where I live. I square my shoulders while I wait for a stream of cars to pass before crossing. Just then, a car honks wildly. A blue SUV pulls over and Chelsea rushes from the passenger side. What are you doing out this early on New Year's Day, she asks. Why were you crossing to Scary Street? Oh, don't tell me. It's a New Year's Day dare. You're, like, getting over your fears and stuff. Something like that. We were just out getting bagels and breakfast. Want to come back to my house, she asks. Logan pokes his head out of the driver's side. Happy New Year, he shouts. I wave to Chelsea's now boyfriend. They're official. Maybe after I finish my walk. Another car pulls behind the blue SUV. I thought we were heading back to Chelsea's for bagels and a ping-pong tournament, Reggie says. His breath clouds the air. Hey, Maya. Want a ride? There's a blueberry bagel with your name on it. Those were always my favorite. I glance toward the house at the end of Scary Street. Maya's New Year's resolution is to get over her fear of ghosts, Chelsea calls. It's not, I start to argue, but another car honks. Inside, Carter, my former crush, and a few others call. Good morning. Happy New Year. Why is everyone already up and out this early? I ask. My voice almost quavers. I've seen my friends numerous times since I've been home, but two painful truths collide in my mind. Their lives have gone on me. My life, at least as far as they know, is a lie. I cannot tell them that I'm a witch, am a veritable inmate at a reform school, or calling on a ghost in the most haunted house in town. Instead of answering, Chelsea says, Come on guys, we're going to scary. 
Time to put the ghosts and ghouls behind us once and for all. She leads the way like a lit torch with her dyed red hair. The others park nearby and soon eight people trek along the sidewalk toward the old white house with peeling paint and missing slate shingles. Chelsea leans into me and I'm washed with the comfort of her perfumed scent. He broke up with Marissa and is on varsity basketball now. He's looking pretty good, she waggles her eyebrows. I don't say anything. Her mouth drops open. Wait. Don't tell me you don't have a crush on him anymore. Who is this girl, Maya Wessels, I hardly know her anymore. She laughs. Seriously, you have to keep me updated on these things. I can't go to winter formal and not know whom you would have gone with if you were still attending Hamilton. Wait, do they have a winter dance at your school? I nod. It's called the Sweetheart Dance, and it's next month. At that reminder, we're almost to the old haunted house. The one where the brothers Thorne supposedly live. Guys, let's just head back to Chelsea's. My voice is lost under the crunch of snow and chatter. I try again. I'm hungry. I could really go for that bagel. In truth, I'm full from breakfast. I want to dye my hair blue. I blurt. This stops Chelsea in her tracks you do? That's so funny because I'm coloring my hair blue today. Well, pale blue, like ice, since I'm going with the seasons and all that. She bounces up and down. I can't believe it. I thought you'd never do it. You look so good with blue hair. A darker shade though. Like electric blue. I backtrack. Oh yeah, I mean, I want to dye my hair blue, but there are rules at my school. Wait, Chelsea says. Doesn't that guy who we met the night before we went back to school live here? Funny, he never showed up at Hamilton. She shrugs. Twin brothers, right? Reggie says. I once heard about a set of twins who had psychic, whatever else he was going to say. Likely about an expose he saw on TV is lost. Snowballs fly. The guys whoop. Someone makes a ghost sound. They're loud and intrusive this early in the morning, but they're my friends and I don't know what to do without telling them the truth, which I can't. Even if I could, it would get me in serious trouble with the coven constabulary. Or they'd think I'm nuts. This house is haunted, Marissa, Carter's latest girlfriend, says, planting her arms across her chest and not moving a step farther. I dig in my heels too. I didn't mean for this to be a group activity. Exactly, that's why Maya wanted to come. To get over her fear of ghosts, Keiko says, ushering us forward. Ooh, ghosts, Logan says in a spooky voice. Legit haunted, Chelsea says, eyeing the wooden door, the cracks in the windows, and weeds creeping up through the snowdrifts. I was just taking a walk and movement in an upper window catches my eye. I try to finish my thought, but I see JJ. It's him, and yet it isn't. I'm not sure. What's unmistakable though, is the glare I receive. I blink my eyes, and he's gone. I shiver. I shake my head. Guys, come on. Let's go. The look on my face must be enough, because they all fall silent and we return to the cars. I glance back, and a dim version of JJ in his top hat fills the window again. His gray eyes are as steely and sharp as a blade. Chapter 13 After spending the better part of the day with my friends, not doing homework, and stressing over the strange figure I saw in the window and how going to Scary Street wasn't meant to be a public spectacle, I recline in the den, watching TV until my stomach growls. I sneak into the kitchen for leftover coconut cream pie. It's my mom's specialty. She's made it on the first of the year every year for as long as I can remember. My aunt beat me to the table and has her fork in the tin, but slides it over to me when I sit down. I miss your mother's baking, she says. And singing. And laughter. Believe it or not, I even miss our bickering. She chuckles. I tried to smile around a mouthful. Still worried about your grandmother's ghost, she asks. Ghosts in general, I mumble. Have you seen more than one? 
I could blame it on the late hour, the pie, or not having too many people to talk to outside of school about the magical world, but I ask. Can a person be alive and dead? My aunt thinks a moment. There are living dead liaisons. Used to be a branch of the OMM. They're unique spirits who are alive and dead. Before the brightening, they helped protect us from demons. Like they can go out at night and not be affected if attacked by a demon? My aunt nods as she takes a bite and lets out a long, mmm. JJ has this rare ability too. I set my fork down. How does someone become one of these spirits? Grim magic. Usually, a curse is involved. They remain in between and go into service as a liaison between the living and dead. It's rare, but it does happen. Are those the only ways? Aunt Ida gives me a knowing look. Don't worry, your grandmother is just a straight-up ghost. If a person is in the in-between, they're required to register with the OMM. Otherwise, they become a zombie. Seriously? My aunt cracks a smile. Generally, no. If a person is in the in-between, formally called the liminal space, they either work for the Office of Magical Management or are permitted to go on to the Sea of Dreams. No one is allowed to stick around half alive and dead. So there aren't exceptions? They couldn't go to Riptivic, for instance. As a student? She chuckles. Not likely. There are many classifications of ghosts, ghouls, and those in the liminal space. Then she adds, why? There's someone there who, I shrug. He seems faint, like he's fading as if he's almost a ghost, but not quite. There could be exceptions, I suppose. Very little in the magical world is fixed. But he probably just needs some sun. When are you coming to visit me in Jamaica, anyway? Your grandmother wants to see you. She's an expert on these things. We end up spending the next hour talking about living as witches, magical beings, and of course, boys. Namely, Bobby Gold, because he's easier to talk about than JJ. Gold. That name is familiar, she says, and then splits the last bite of pie with me. The house is quiet when I go back to my room. I flick on all the lights. I know that won't keep away a ghost, but it feels warmer with my room aglow. I practice the spellwork my aunt taught me, just in case. I wave my wand and recite the spell in my mind, over and over, until I feel my energy connect with the threads of magic surrounding me. Thankfully, there's no ghost so I summon the red hat my parents picked up for me in Finland and magic it onto my head. Feeling accomplished, I smile at my reflection in the window, but then my face falls. The curtain in the neighbor's bedroom opposite swoosh is closed. It's Riley McMillan's room, the boy next door who had a crush on me for years. I'm sure it was him and not an apparition. Cold sweat prickles my neck. I hope he didn't see me with my wand. What would happen? I pace until I can hardly keep my eyes open. Worried that I broke the voice vow, or worse, I get into bed. I'll ask Aunt Ida in the morning. When I wake up, the house is silent. It turns out, nearly everyone left early for the airport, including my aunt. My parents left a note, reminding me an officer from OMM is picking me up, I glance at the clock over the kitchen sink, in ten minutes. I overslept. I scramble to get ready and pack, hoping it's not a gin. What would happen if I didn't answer the door? If I refused to go back? There was the tracking potion and I have a feeling Storch would hunt me down. Also, I feel like I owe something to the other students there. I haven't figured out how to rebel against the reform school, but I will. As I fly on the back of a double broom back to campus, I'm torn about returning to Riptivic. I didn't miss classes or studying. I did miss my friends and the magical world. I didn't miss nightly curfew because demons are on the loose. I did miss Penny Legion, my dorm. I didn't miss Professor Darrington's nastiness. I did miss learning about wish witchery. After I'm inspected and cross through the gates, I spot JJ in his top hat, turning a corner on the nearby path. I feel a strange tingling inside. I call to him, but he doesn't stop. 
I have questions and want to know about Scary Street. I have an apology and want to tell him about my grandmother's ghost. I catch up to him at the foot of the stairs to his dorm and am nearly out of breath. Hi, I say, Raliti appears to be his relatively solid, yet grayscale self. Have you ever been to Jamaica? I ask the first thing that comes to mind. He looks me over, but doesn't answer. The food there is so good. My mom's Jamaican. She's a great cook. She and my dad lived there for a little while before I was born. She refused to live in Finland even though she loves to visit. That's where he's from. So they compromised and moved to the States. We're the only ones from both sides of my family that live here. Well, my grandmother from Finland lived here for a little while before she died. I realize I haven't stopped talking. Did the breaking of the voice vow leave me with an abundance of words? Or did I miss J.J. Thorne? He nods with certainty. I tilt my head, unsure what he means. I know about your grandmother. I sent her to you to deliver a message. I wanted you to, he shakes his head. Instead, you, never mind. He goes into his dorm, letting the door slam behind him. She didn't give me a message, I call after him. I stand there a moment longer before staggering down the stairs, confused. After depositing my bags in my dorm, I wander to the dining hall before it gets dark. I hardly care that slop replaces the delicious home-cooked meals I'd been eating and sit with my friends at our usual table. Hungry? Dewey asks when I don't touch my food. Not waiting for an answer, he helps himself to what's sure to be a stale bun, gurg bread, I think Yassi called it. Yassi and Wyatt lean in close to each other as they catch up after the long holiday. Audra, Winnie, Reese, and a few others gab about their time away. Wyatt, nabbing something else from my tray, says, Did you hear? Hear what? I respond, because that's what I'm supposed to say. JJ wasn't supposed to say anything about knowing my dead grandmother. JJ wasn't supposed to storm off. I don't think JJ is supposed to be a ghost or whatever I saw on Scary Street. Dewey replies, remember the hive? Well, it turns out they are recruiting after all. My uncle says not only do they want to purify magical bloodlines, but they're against magic being a hidden art. They want to take over and rule the world. Basically. Audra interjects. Dewey, your uncle is a little paranoid. She shakes her head and explains, he told me the same story and your mom apologized for her brother's conspiracy theories. Everyone goes quiet. How do you know his uncle? Yassi asks. Winnie adds, and his mom? Audra glances down at her hands, folded in her lap. Oh, um, we met up over break. Dewey Dunkel doesn't hide his smile. My family wanted to meet her. Winnie shrugs. Right, because nymphs and dwarves usually get together over Christmas pudding. Things are changing, Wyatt says. They sure are, Dewey adds. The non-magicals are in danger if this splinter group comes into power. Not only that, but they're anti-integration. My uncle said they think humans should serve them. What about the Coven Constabulary? The Office of Magical Management? I ask. It's corrupt. They've infiltrated. No one is safe. Dewey nods his head. Dread slithers into my belly. West said something along these lines. Audra scoffs. That's according to Uncle Wiley. Uncle Wiley also lives in the outer reaches of Greenland. She rolls her eyes. He's a bit extreme. There's a fine line between magic used to create and conserve, and grim magic, Wyatt says. And a fine line between his uncle and banana pie, Audra says. Dewey plows on, the hive are recruiting. They want to take over the magical world and the non-magical world. It's all over the daily vine. My cousin was the first dwarf reporter for them, Winnie says proudly. We go round and round the table until the bells toll, signaling we return to our dorms. In the crowd of students waiting for a chaperone, I spot JJ. He looks everywhere but at me. 
I feel small and confused as I jumble up against everyone, rushing to get to the front of the line. With the demon still on the loose and the attack on Pierpoint, a rumpus player, last month, we can't be too careful. I press through the throng until I reach the side of the tall boy whose hand has safely guided me through the night numerous times. But when I try to fit my fingers in his, there's nothing there, and I realize he's gone. Chapter 14 The next morning, when leaving Penny House for classes, Yassi stops me on the stairs. Hey, you seemed preoccupied yesterday. If you need to talk, I'm here. I shrug. Are you homesick? She asks. Getting back into the groove is tough. Especially since we attend a reform school and had to lie because of the voice vow. My aunt suspected something, I'm sure of it. I quickly guard my thoughts. Yassi is my best magical friend, but she's also a snoop, she accidentally sees people's thoughts. I have a friend who has this problem, I clear my throat as we exit the dorm into the wintry morning. Go on, she says, but then abruptly stops. Wait. Your friend has a problem? I think we have a bigger one right now. Literally. There's a hole in the hedge along the path. Although, hole isn't quite the right word to describe the massive, trampled space where greenery once formed a tidy barrier. Yassi reaches for one of the broken branches and pulls away a tuft of dark fur. The cinder beast, she whispers as she steps through the opening in the hedge and follows a set of tracks in the snow. They're so big and so deep, I can see the dead grass below as well as the sharp indents left by the beast's claws. Then they disappear. I've officially seen the cinder beast twice now, and that was enough. I call after Yassi, but she continues toward a sandstone building and rushes around the corner. I find her standing behind Gould Hall, staring at the back of the building. The bells ring in the distance. Every morning I'm grateful Darrington isn't my first class, but especially today. I can't afford any more detentions with her. Yassi, I say, tapping her gently. Class? She, on the other hand, does have Darrington first. She eyes the pair of double wooden doors, a wide window, and then her attention slides to a bulkhead, presumably leading to the basement of Gould. She pulls on the rusty, metal door, but it doesn't budge. She draws her wand and says something complicated, but nothing happens. Someone magic this locked, she mutters, finally acknowledging that I'm there. With her eyes closed, she runs her hand along the hinges. She pulls away a hair. Seeing where this is going, I say, it could be anyone with dark hair. Even yours, for instance. She strides up the stairs and thrusts open the door. The building's heating system groans. I groan. Then something from deep within the basement groans. I knew it. She hurries toward the stairs, but they lead to a set of boys' and girls' bathrooms. I chase her through the maze-like building in search of access to the below-ground level. We interrupt an advanced arithmetic class and futurism with Professor Nuruddin, also my teacher, but during a different period. The professor flashes a stern look. What's worse is the disregard I receive from JJ, seated in the row nearest the door. Sorry, left my schedule at home. Oopsie, I say hastily rushing back down the hall after Yassi. Let's come back during lunch. We can talk to a custodian or Dewey, he knows his way around, a low, lamenting moan cuts me off. Yassi rushes toward it only to meet a brick wall. It's halfway through the period, and I have an essay to turn in. I'm not typically a nail-biter, but my ring finger is under attack. She shakes her head. Very clever. A concealment charm, she says. Aiming at the wall, she chants something that I don't hear over the sound of crumbling brick. As the dust settles I say, I thought you said it was a concealment charm. Couldn't you have dispelled it? Whoever was behind this hid the door. I'm tired of looking. I figured the easiest way through is, well, through. She steps through the hole in the wall, just as she did the hedge. In the corner of the room, the cinder beast, an enormous, hairy, hulking figure, sits with its head lowered. Yassi pulls a brown sack from her bag and makes rude chewing noises, as though to entice the creature, before sharing the contents with the beast of the east. It's chained to the wall. 
It moans mournfully, but takes the food. Good thing you had some cinder beast food in your bag, I say, masking my worry with a stupid joke. We skipped class, destroyed school property, and are in the presence of a cinder beast. All on the first day back at school. Terrific. And terrifying. I can't imagine the consequences. Yassi watches it eat with fond tenderness. I try to silently clear my throat. How do you think it got here? Some awful, wretched, nasty, she goes on to describe, using increasingly impolite words, the kind of person who'd trap a cinder beast and lock it up. Then she looks at me and says, we have to get the cinder beast back to the woods. What if one of the professors brought it here for? No, they're bound by oath not to commit such a crime. Not storage, I'd bet. But if that's the case, let's have them help us. They'll have to report it. Isn't that a good thing? She shakes her head. The cinder beast will be taken into custody, detained, examined. Used to hunt demons. Don't you think she's been through enough? Yassi moves her wand down her body, as though fitting a dress over her head. Protection spell. Hopefully, it will hold. She reaches toward the chain, buried in the cinder beast's fur, and does more spell work. Maya, I'm going to bring the cinder beast far from here. I'm calling upon the Nymphia. Please, do whatever you have to do to keep this secret. I want you to restore this room. Make it appear as if nothing happened. I want whoever is behind this crime to come back, confused, outsmarted, and red-handed. I nod, forcing back a smirk at her use of the non-magical expression, rare for a nymph. What? I read the mystery novel you got me for Christmas during the break. It was good. I want the sequel. With that, she and the cinder beast turn loquescent. It's almost as if I'm looking at them underwater and camouflaged into their surroundings. Yassi's outline fills in as the wooden door, then the radiator and the cinder beast does the same. They flow to match what remains of the brick wall, the wooden stairwell, and then they're gone. Thankfully, I'm at the end of a bend in the hallway, but when the bells ring, someone might come down here, the vamps are always sneaking around with their girlfriends. I don't want to be caught red-handed and accused of capturing a cinder beast, freeing a cinder beast, or destroying school property. But I don't know how to fix the wall. I bite my nail again, thinking. Ah, uh ha. -huh. However, I do know how to create a butter note, the little fluttering messages teachers send between classrooms. I pull a scrap of paper from my bag, jot down a message, and fashion it into a little origami butterfly. Minutes later, JJ appears in the hall, looking as moody as ever. I rush up to him. I know you're back to hating me, as if you'd ever stopped, but I need your help. It'll only take a second. His gray eyes don't meet mine, but he follows me anyway. However, his eyes do widen at the sight of the busted wall. I thought you said it would only take a second. His accented voice is as thrilling as ever. But there's no time to get mad at myself for the way it makes me feel. Can you fix it? I ask. Before he answers I confess, Yassi found a cinder beast locked up in here and he lifts his chin and wand, chants something, and then one by one, the bricks fit themselves back together. Nine seconds, I say, trying for a joke. He doesn't smile, laugh, or respond. Not that it's unusual for him to be completely frustrating. But relieved to see the wall intact, I say, thank you. He grunts and strides back down the hall. I call after him. JJ, wait. He whirls, the tails of his jacket, slicing the air. I thought I could trust you, Maya. His eyes tell a different story, maybe a sad one, if he feels anything like I do. My heart falls into the space between his words and my understanding, leaving me there to wilt and wonder. I didn't mean for all my non-magical friends to be there when I went back to Scary Street. Chapter 15 Yassi has been gone for two days. I tell Miss Mayweather, our head of dorm. She's ill. I tell the nurse she's too weak to make it to the infirmary. I tell her teachers I'm bringing her medicine and her homework. I tell myself not to worry. 
I keep my ears open for clues about who may have been behind imprisoning the cinder beast. I keep my eyes open for Yassi. I'm on edge, as if at sea, my stomach rolling, my skin cold, and with tremulousness in my limbs. It's not until the third day when I'm on the upper floor in the library, seated in one of two leather chairs by the window that I see two figures emerge from the woods. One is from the north side and wears a black cloak. The other wears winter white against flowing dark hair. I rush to the stairs, in hot debate about whether to confront the cloaked figure or seek my friend. When I reach the ground level, a throng of students swallows the person in the cloak. I rush toward Yassi. She's strangely calm for someone who has been gone for several days on a questionable journey with a giant beast. The nymphy helped me. The cinder beast is safe. I'll tell you everything later. I should get to class. I've been covering for you for days. She's rushing up the hill, nearly out of earshot. Then I add, if anyone asks, you had a terrible case of Blorkman's chromitis. She turns and raises her eyebrows, perplexed. I shrug. I made it up. I made a lot of stuff up this week, and I feel somewhat awful. JJ's words about thinking he can trust me don't just ring in my ears, but it's like they've replaced the blood in my veins. At lunch, I make my apologies to our friends. I knew she was up to something, Dewey says. You can't fool the old do man. Is Blorkman's whatever a real disease? Winnie asks. I shake my head. So, the cinder beast is safe, and so are you, I say to Yassi. Who captured the beast of the east? And why? Were they preparing to set it loose on campus? Dewey asks. If you ask me, I say it was the Golden Hive Secret Society. They were going to sick it on us, trying to rid the school of what they call us mixed magicals. It already went after us once, I say. Why? Winnie says. I think she means she doesn't understand the threat of magicals, like us who are mixed, or at least not like them, Wyatt says astutely. I nod. The magical energy relative to magicals like witches, vampires, even nymphs is fairly well known among them. Then there are magicals with mixed abilities that aren't as studied. Comparatively, we're unknown. Those at risk of losing their power are afraid of the unknown because of what it could mean for them. We go deeper into this conversation, exploring the benefits of integration, of asking questions, and knowing each other better, reminding me of the unknown, ghosts, and JJ. Just then, I spot him across the dining hall, seated at a table with a group of fellow rumpus players, and flanked by two girls, each fawning over him. One of them is Honey. She flashes a smile in my direction. But he's not smiling. In fact, he's a black and white snapshot of misery. A week sneaks by during which I find out three important things. 1. Pierce Pierpont, the rumpus player attacked by a demon and sent to Cryer's clinic is okay and wasn't turned into a demon. However, he cannot speak except for the word kitten. They don't expect him to return to school but will continue to receive round-the-clock care, therapy, and the best magical healing available. 2. Tutoring Bobby Gold in arithmetic is completely unproductive because he's so distracting. The perfect smile, the golden glow, and his continued interest in me have me turned my brain backward and inside out. If waking up to find my grandmother at the end of my bed is the most frightening thing that's happened all month, okay, and discovering a giant, hairy, sharp-toothed beast in the basement of a school building, doing complicated equations with a cute boy is the most frustrating. Well, aside from JJ. But it's like Bobby works a spell over me, which does nothing to help me spy on him. 3. When apple pie isn't available, Pecan pie is a delicious substitute. Oh, and four, J.J. Thorne is old. I stuff another bite of pie in my mouth, careful not to get crumbs on Yassi's comforter, I snuck an extra slice from the dining hall. This must be someone else, I say, pointing at a familiar face in an old yearbook that she found. Another J.J. Thorne, she asks, dubiously. Thorne is a common last name. Junior Junior. Is that what JJ stands for? she asks. I don't know. Her eyes narrow. What happened between you two, anyway? You guys are cold, 
warm, freezing, lukewarm, hot. We've never been hot. She chuckles. I saw you holding hands. Demons. He escorts me to seminal seminar. Under the whispering willows, she sings songs. Oh. Caught, red-handed. She claps her hands together. Speaking of that, any leads on who locked the cinder beast? Don't go changing the subject. You've been preoccupied. You guard your thoughts. You started telling me about a friend with a problem over vacation, and I knew very well you were referring to yourself. I sigh and spill everything that happened over the holiday break, going to Scary Street, seeing JJ as a ghost, going back there with my friends, though that was unintentional. While Yassi listens intently, I have an unusual awareness of everything I'm saying, as though putting pieces of a puzzle together or solving a complicated arithmetic equation, minus the distraction by the captain of the rumpus team. Then Yassi slides the last piece of information into place as she points at the black and white image of the boy wearing a top hat in the yearbook. He was cursed. He's fading. He needs help. The prophecy comes to mind. Two stars, shining light. One dim. One bright. What came before cannot be undone unless the latter frees the sun. I don't know how to help the sun or if JJ is the sun. I don't know how to fix a brick wall, much less reverse a curse. I gaze at his black and white photo, it's somehow more solid than he is in real life. I got it over the break. Just getting around to it now. I was supposed to head up our yearbook committee this year, but I don't suppose a reform school has one of those. My sisters were excited for me, and when they were going through my Aunt Bertie's, they found it. I think of Moo Moo's ghost. JJ sent her to me. Why? To ignore me much like she did while living? To teach me to knit? To explain how to help JJ? I scratch my head, no closer to answers than before, but say, can I borrow this? When I return to my dorm room, a member of the Coven Constabulary waits for me. Chapter 16 A member of the Coven Constabulary escorts me from my dorm. He wears a modern, leather moto jacket and has a jagged scar that runs through his eyebrow. He also wears a tunic. His teeth tell me he's a vampire. A very old and powerful vampire. We step outside under a forbidding moon that slices the otherwise dark sky. My pulse pounds in my ears. Is he bringing me to Storch? Worse? I want to ask questions about where we're going and why. He moves smoothly and silently, all five senses, and probably a few extra, attuned to the winter night, tracking for demons. I hurry alongside him, thinking about poor Pierpont and hoping never to run into a demon again. We arrive at Nightingale Hall. I figured we'd be going to the admin building, or the Iron Tower. Instead of asking the obvious questions, I say, what would you do if we encountered a demon? His voice is low and distant as though reaching me from another time. Eat it. I laugh. He doesn't. My head tilts forward and my eyes widen. Eat it? He doesn't crack a smile. Destroy it. Must be CC humor. A figure approaches. I tense. He doesn't, but the pair merely nods at each other as JJ whisks past. He doesn't acknowledge me. Better get to class, I say, trotting up the stairs after my on-again, off-again, on-again, nemesis. In the classroom with the glass ceiling, Chancellor West quickly recaps where we left off on mind walls and windows. Before we move on to the next lesson, any questions? Gregor Zax, I have questions. Only about a million. Before I can prioritize them, I narrow it down to two. If my wish witchery has to be protected, why assign me to be a spy? West doesn't hesitate to answer. Because they won't suspect the witch they seek to be right under their noses. That doesn't make me feel comfortable. Anything else, before we move on? West asks. I blurt, there's been talk on campus about a secret society. His eyebrows lift and he steeples his fingers. This probably wasn't what he had in mind. Nevertheless, he answers, ah, uh, yes. 
I've heard murmurings. It does seem a contingent of this group might have found its way onto our campus. West's mouth forms a thin but reassuring smile. I tell him about the cloaked figures that I saw in the woods. The problem is the magical world is largely hidden from the non-magical world. We are in a global minority. Some are afraid of magic becoming a dying art, but they're also afraid of change and the unknown so they'd seek to eradicate the non-full-blood magicals and rule. Do you think that could be happening here? Fear disguised as self-righteousness and superiority is a dangerous thing. West gazes through the glass ceiling. I sneak a look at JJ, whose attention doesn't seem to be in the room. What can we do? Silence spreads frustratingly between us until West says, JJ, you've been unusually quiet. What are your thoughts on the matter? I interject, I saw you in the woods trailing them. JJ continues to look distant, a frayed piece of thread, a faded photograph, a boy who'd rather be anywhere but here. Mysterious, moody, and misunderstood? No, just infuriating. A dry laugh escapes my lips. West lifts his eyebrows as though to ask what's so funny. I shake my head, feeling like I'm spinning loose in the face of JJ's quiet. The night after my last birthday, I was at the beach. In the sky. I saw my name. Another laugh cuts itself loose like a howling wind. Then he shows up. I thumb, JJ. Knows my name and says he saw it written in the stars. I bust into a full-on fit of laughter. With each stomach-clenching laugh, something splits inside me, like I'm actually cracking up. West looks on with his characteristic seriousness. JJ is a snapshot of composure, revealing neither irritation nor amusement. Through my laughter, I repeat, I asked him how he knew my name. He said it was written in the stars. I'd asked him about a dozen questions since. I shake my head, coming to the end of my role. Good luck getting an answer out of him. JJ glares at me, his gray eyes on the edge of inflicting wounds. West nods slightly and folds his hands together. Maya, only wish witches get their names in the stars. JJ's jaw tightens and then he mutters, told you. I turn on him. That's the thing, you haven't told me anything, I retort. I'm having a bit of a hard time understanding all this, especially the part about being a wish witch. At the words, wish witch, JJ twitches. He opens his mouth to say something, but West cuts him off. Maya, you have a gift. But that's not to say you can't give it away or perhaps, given an unfortunate set of circumstances, have someone take it away. As your teacher, since I learned about your talent, I've struggled with whether to let you discover it on your own or instruct you. Is that why you let me set half the campus on fire with a wooden wand? West chuckles. Not quite half the campus. You see, our magic develops best when we learn how to use it through direct experience. Yes, we need schools. He gestures around us. But there are details that come through us organically. I'd like to know more. Learn more. I keep hearing all about Imogen Hawks and my wish witchery and then this prophecy and the secret society. It's like I have a role in it all, but I'm not sure what or even how to help. That's understandable, West says. I cut right to the point. So if I'm an important wish witch, how do I grant wishes, and which ones? JJ gets up and storms off. West says, wish witchery is a sore subject for some. To his back, I call, if you hate me so much, you should just wish to never have met me. It's easily the meanest thing ever to fall from my mouth. I instantly regret it. I turn to West and say, what if I try to wish that all Hollows Eve never happened? That was the beginning of all this craziness with the demons and... No, not the beginning, Maya. This started long before Hallow's Eve. I make a tiny gasp of surprise. Ah yes, I'm well aware this group is trying to use demons to put a stop to integration. I'm also aware your friend Yassi freed a cinder beast just recently. Trust me, I have thwarted several plans that are far more insidious. If our friend JJ were here, he'd have more to say on the subject. Yeah, but getting it out of him isn't going to be easy. You've mentioned. 
It's just that he doesn't like me. I say more to the glass ceiling and stars above than to west, because I can't make sense of how I feel. On that matter, I think you're mistaken. J.J. Thorne is a complicated young man, but it's my hope that soon will change. And you, Maya, play an important role in that. My eyes flash to West, searching for a hint of amusement, but he's as serious as my dead grandmother. Chapter 17 Curiosity cements me to the spot. Chancellor, with all due respect, could you please elaborate? On which subject? West asks slowly. All of the above. If you know there's a sinister plot by the Hive, Storch, or anyone else why haven't you done anything? He leans in. With all due respect, Maya, I've done many things. The attack on Pierpont was most unfortunate. I say this with great care, but he was out of his dorm at night, late at night. He knew the consequences with demons on the loose. Why was he out? We're inquiring. What about the missing building? The Cinder Beast? There are layers to what is going on. There's the group on campus. Then the larger umbrella group, the source of this mayhem, the Hive. We're uncertain whether an individual or several leads it. To get to the root of the problem, I found it best to let matters unfold as best we can without causing undue harm. I'm deeply involved and would like to see this resolved as quickly as possible. And my role? You are a wish witch. You've mentioned. Ah, we are right here. Well, here goes. No sense in keeping it from you any longer. West folds his hands together and draws a deep breath. Imogen Hawks performed a grim magic called an ad infinitum. It's a classification of spellwork that cannot be reversed except by another witch of her kind. However, she performed this magic on all witches of her kind, eradicating them, including her son. Well, almost. She worried that, because he was her son, he had a greater chance of being a wish witch as well. However, her worry was misplaced. Because of his magic, he didn't quite meet the same end as the wish witches. Am I correct in thinking Imogen Hawks is JJ's mother? I ask. West nods. And she tried to kill JJ? I ask, aghast. That she did. But he's not a wish witch? Quite the opposite. One of our early lessons in seminal seminar returns. The opposite of a wish in the magical world is a curse. He can perform curses, I say on an exhale. Isn't that risky? What if he curses someone here or me? My eyes widen. How has he not cursed me when clearly he hates me? West shakes his head. Firstly, he wouldn't. He's from another time and is very skilled in his abilities and talents. You, on the other hand, are the danger. Me? West nods. In the wrong hands, your wish-granting ability is a weapon. Isn't a curse a greater threat? JJ's mind is a fortress. Yours, I trust is better fortified than it was before, but your mind walls aren't quite as solid as they should be. It's then I feel the threads of energy surrounding a shift. I sense West nearer to my thoughts than he was before, even without eye contact. I put up walls, tucking thoughts behind doors, and closing windows of perception. Good, Maya. Continue to work on that. Never leave your mind unguarded. Your wishes are yours to grant. Be sure to choose wisely. Now, I think a young man is downstairs waiting to walk you back to your dorm. If you mean the Coven Constabulary, I hardly think he's young. With that tunic, he's from the Middle Ages, I'm sure of it. West chuckles and says, Good night, Maya. Keep your eyes on the stars and magic at your fingertips. Wait. I pause by the door. I saw the prophecy. I repeat what I learned. Two stars, shining light. One dim. One bright. What came before cannot be undone unless the latter frees the sun. Ah, uh, yes. Two stars. West smiles and says nothing more. In the following days, 
I replay the conversation with West until Spirit Week sweeps me into distraction. The rumpus game on Friday is against Tate, our biggest rival. On Monday, the dining hall serves apple pie, the official school dessert, and doubly delicious. On Tuesday, the dorms compete for most decorated, with red and apples being the theme, Stonebird Winsong, one of the girls' dorms across campus, wins because they used red glitter. This is all to Storch's consternation. But rebel in the face of reform school, we will. On Wednesday, the choir sings during breakfast, the orchestra plays during lunch, and a band made up of a cyclops, a war guy, and centaur, play rock music at dinner, they're named One-Eyed Wolf Hoof. They all get sent to detention and demoted to the red class. Rumor has it a vamp is one infraction away from being sent to the Iron Tower. Me too. Thursday, we wear hats, and I swear everyone goes for the top hat, girls and guys alike, JJ keeps a low profile. They're all magic, obviously. Friday, the big day, we wear casual dress instead of our uniforms as long as it's gold to show our support for the team. I wear a pair of goldish cheetah print pants. When Yassi, Winnie, Audra, the other girls from Penny House, and I step outside, a thin layer of snow covers the ground. It continues to fall, making the rest of the world feel like a secret. When we reach the field, the school band plays loudly and the fans are already wild in the stands. I quickly spot number 13, brooding on the sidelines. Everyone gathers around Bobby, doing their pre-game warm-up, and then the coach talks to them. Minutes later, a woman wearing a sequined gold dress steps to the middle of the field. If the crowd was crazy before it's nothing to the thunderous clapping when she waves and beams at the audience. That's Felicity Fox, Yassi says. That's Felicity Fox, Audra repeats. The name fills the stadium like an echo in a canyon. Dewey stares at her googly-eyed. Felicity Fox, he whispers. The most amazing singer ever. She sings the school song impeccably. After the last note rings out she smiles and says, Now, let the rumpus begin, but her voice isn't the melodious sound I'd expect. It almost reminds me of when I had the boarworm jinx last month and started barking on the very same field. Everyone seems to have understood what she said, but her voice was deep and frog-like if frogs could talk. Her cheeks turn as red as the flags blowing in the wind. The crowd is silent. Then little whispers and chortles chase her off the field. Dewey whispers, Gregor's axe. The ref's whistle blows, signaling the start of the game. The first half is a blur of fast passes, fouls, goals, cheering, and popcorn exploding from the stands like confetti. During halftime, the school band plays again and then the Fay and Elves put on a show involving acrobatic feats and lots of shimmery light. I wait expectantly for an explanation about Felicity Fox's voice or foible. Yassi shakes her head. We shall not speak of it. Was it a jinx, like what happened to me? I ask. Likely, Audra says. I guess I don't feel so singled out, I say. Someone will pay, Dewey says as though ready to take vengeance. No one messes with the fox. However, they do end up speaking of it and speculating for the next while. I'm sure it will be all over the Daily Vine, the magical newspaper, tomorrow. But so will our win when it comes down to the final seconds of the game. It's a narrow shave by three points, but we pull ahead despite the now thickly falling snow. JJ scores the winning points, making him the MVP. The crowd goes nuts. This time, he can't escape the excitement. The team hoists him onto their shoulders. The crowd showers him with popcorn as they parade around the stadium and across campus. By the time I arrive in the dining hall, a group of girls giggle and grope JJ. A bunch of guys wearing top hats clap him on the back when they pass, congratulating him. Others sing the school song in frog voices. I get a slice of apple pie and sit with my friends who excitedly replay the win, claiming it never would have happened with Pierpont. They compare JJ to some of the rumpus greats whose names I'm starting to recognize. The room is warm and filled with the kind of mirth that comes from being on the winning side. The snow continues to fall past the dining hall's round windows. I sneak a peek at JJ's reflection. He doesn't smile or frown, he's as impassive as ever. 
The subtle wrinkle of his brows tells me the attention makes him uncomfortable. I want to spirit him away to someplace quiet, maybe where we can watch the snow dance in the sky. A warm figure drops onto the bench beside me. Bobby Gold smothers me with a smolder. Hey, what are you doing over here all by yourself? I waggle my empty plate and then point at the snow. It's beautiful. Did you see the game? I saw the win, I say with a smile. I can't resist smiling at Bobby Gold. But it feels forced, not quite my own. It was tight, but as usual we came out on top, he says with confidence. You can thank the captain. He goes on to narrate his plays. Then, as if noticing that I can hardly tear myself from the mesmerizing scene outside he says, Do you want to take a walk? It's dark. He snaps his fingers. Oh, right. I'm always forgetting. Stupid rule. He glances at the group gathered around JJ. I wonder if they'll cancel the sweetheart dance. Lots of couples can't resist sneaking away, and I suppose that would be dangerous. Audra appears with a rosy-cheeked Winnie at her side. They can't cancel the sweetheart dance, she squeaks. I sure hope not, Bobby says, letting his eyes linger on me. Then he winks. Better go say hi to the guys. See you later, Maya. The girls and I coo and cluck over Bobby and what that look might have meant. What look? Yassi asks, taking Bobby's spot beside me. Audra goes on to describe the smolder, the wink, the look, all the Bobby Gold moves. They agree that he's sure to ask me to the sweetheart dance next month, leaving me feeling rather rosy myself. Storch suddenly storms in, rounds up the nearest ten students. Some cower and others glower. Rule breakers. The lot. Let this be an example. All of you are going to the Iron Tower. She glares at me and then shoves them roughly out the door, and that's the last we see of them. Nervousness winds down my spine like a snake or dragon about to strike. Chapter 18 I wake up with a honking sneeze. Then another. I worry I've been jinxed again, but my nose starts running and my head spins when I stand up. Bells ring in the distance. I overslept. I quickly get dressed, skip the dining hall, and rush to my first class. I have an exam with Popperwell. Although he's quirky and doddering, he takes test administering seriously. I catch up with Dewey in Hawthorne Hall. Any idea what he'll have us up to today, he asks. I shake my head slowly because it throbs. Last exam, we had to bring magic alive on the spot, role-playing and acting out the answers. Wasn't expecting that. I sneeze. Remember the time he had us pair off into groups and go around campus finding the answers. That was kind of fun, I say in a nasal voice. Are you sick, he asks. Trying not to be on an exam day. Naturally, we have to go out in the cold, hike through the orchard, and perform a series of bidding and dispelling patterns involving hidden magical objects, including in the cemetery, for the entire period. By the time the class is over, I shiver, and it's not only because of the memory of being attacked by demon race in this very spot last October. As we trudge back to the main campus, I consider going to the infirmary, but a nap would probably do the trick. Plus, I can't miss Darrington's class after lunch. I drag myself back to Hawthorne to get my bag and books for the next period. When I pass the statue of Imogen Hawks, I recall the map I found in her diary when I was in the infirmary. I think about JJ and what Wes told me. Knowing about the prophecy now, I should take a closer look at the diary. I'm deep in thought when I reach the statue of Professor Aerosmith, my original seminal seminar teacher. She's not simply a work of art, but underneath the stone, petrifaction from a gorgon spell. I stand there as if she has answers. Two stars, shining light. One dim. One bright. What came before cannot be undone unless the latter frees the sun. I meant to free JJ, but how? How do I use my wish witchery? Is it as simple as waving my wand and chanting be free? If I really, truly were a wish witch, couldn't I do great things like get my homework done with a flick of my wand? Or get rid of this cold? 
what about sending the cinder beast to safety or dispelling the demons? If I were a wish witch, couldn't I just make everything right with magic? A rock hits the tile floor with a little ping, as though punctuating my questions. I turn to the statue of Professor Aerosmith and gaze into her empty, stone eyes. If I'm a wish witch, I wish for you to be released from your stone bonds. I lift my chin and nothing happens. I exhale and when I breathe again, I feel the threads of magical energy winding and swimming invisibly around me. I energetically connect with one thread and then another, drawing the energy closer before having the sense that I should wrap it around the statue. I weave the threads together, like covering the stone with a magical quilt. To my surprise, a crack runs down the center. As the stone continues to split, a figure dressed in orange, red, and gold pushed through like a chick out of an egg. My mouth hangs open. Aerosmith's hair is a storm of frizz, but I don't think that's due to her being encased in stone for months. She coughs a few times and looks around as though coming out of a daze. In a gravelly voice she says, Dear, you don't look quite well. Her weak hand rises toward my forehead and then falls away. You should go to the nurse. Maybe we both should. She lifts her skirt slightly when trying to step out from the stone and she stumbles. I catch her elbow and help her forward. Please, professor, sit down. Trapped. Free. Trading. Magicals, she mutters. She tilts to the left, then right as though getting off a ship. She grips my arm, then stiffens, and her eyes go fuzzy. Professor Aerosmith, are you okay? I ask and then sneeze from the stone dust, or my cold, I'm not sure. She leans close, nearly resting her chin on my shoulder, and says, I told them. I warned them. Snatching is a dangerous business. They came and went. She survived, and they will not stop. Who? What? I ask, confused. She seemed relatively fine, despite her circumstances only a moment ago, but now she's muttering and staggering. Screven, Veda, Valerius, she exclaims. They're growing, amassing, consuming, destroying. I sneeze again, and Professor Aerosmith collapses. The bells toll as I rush to the nearest classroom for help. In moments, several teachers gather around Aerosmith as the hall floods with students during the passing period. Professor Frickman dismisses the crowd before presumably bringing Aerosmith to the infirmary. I'm in shock. I still have classes left, but now I could really, really use a nap. Mostly, though, I want answers. Chapter 19 Darrington sweeps past me as I walk in the opposite direction of my next class. I pause on the sidewalk, pull my hat lower over my ears, and sigh. I have to shake off what happened with Aerosmith, this cold I'm coming down with, and carry on. The fresh air helps, and I make myself a deal. I'll go to the dining hall and get some tea, I need something soothing for my throat. The stop will make me tardy for spell work, but that's better than absent, especially because I'll have notes to make up, they're hardest to take for a class that's largely abstract and I'll finish the day with Darrington, with the promise of that much-needed nap afterward as a reward. I square my shoulders and take a roundabout way toward the dining hall, passing Claremont Chapel, a fieldstone building on top of a small hill. I've never been inside, but candles glow, invitingly in the stained glass window. Since I'll already be late for my next class, popping my head in for a minute won't hurt. When I push open the thick wooden door, the scent of fur, candles, and honeyed resin greet my nose. Wooden pews, like the kind in a church, line the candlelit space. I step inside and feel suddenly lighter, almost like I could float. I hope I don't have a fever. I grip the back of the pew and then lower to sitting. My mind feels clear, yet almost disconnected from something vital. Perhaps I should have gone to the infirmary. My eyes flutter shut and I enter peaceful, dreamless sleep. When I wake up, the slant of the winter sun through the stained glass window suggests I missed Darrington's class after all. I draw a deep breath and feel slightly refreshed, but now my nose is stuffed up. Maybe it's from the air in the chapel, close, waxy, and warm. As I shuffle toward the door, one of the candles flickers and then goes out. 
I have the sense I should relight it so I draw my wand and use the one chant I'm expert at fire. It doesn't work. In fact, instead of feeling the pulsation of magical energy in my wand, it merely feels like a piece of stone in my hands. My confidence plummets, but perhaps being sick affects my talents. Popperwell has never mentioned anything like that, but I could have caught a magic on hold cold. Stranger things have happened. I pad to the front of the chapel, where I find a box of matches. When the candle comes back to life, it illuminates a note propped up against the brass candle holder. I unfold it and read. You'll find your strength in your vulnerabilities. Don't be afraid to shine. The signature is the same as the others. I glance around the small space, but I'm alone. This one is less affectionate than the others were. Strength in my vulnerabilities? Don't be afraid to shine? The candle flame grows for a moment and then goes out again. I exit the chapel. Someone wearing a top hat rounds the side of a hedge on the path a measure away. My heart revs and then stalls. Given our school uniforms and the fact that loads of boys are now sporting the prominent accessory, it could have been anyone. The rest of the day is one long string of fails, including me feeling better. I feel worse. So much so, I wish I could go home for the weekend. I wonder what would happen if I said this aloud. I wish I could go home, I whisper. Nothing happens. My head feels like a balloon stuffed with snot. Gross, I know. My body aches as though I've been stuck in stone for months. I'm hungry, but have no appetite except for one of my mom's chocolate chip cookies. My throat is swollen with what feels like shards of glass, and my mind swims between images of Aerosmith emerging from her stone prison, JJ's gray gimlet eyes, and the note I found in the chapel. Then it all combines and morphs and doesn't make any sense, not that any of it does in real life either. I'm in bed for a full day. I eat two bites of a cookie, thanks to Miss Mayweather's secret stash, if you know me at all, only taking two bites of anything means something is dreadfully wrong. The three thoughts linger and loiter in my head. I dream of eating a grilled cheese sandwich and tomato soup, watching movies, and snuggling with Filbert. It's kind of heaven. The dream shifts to Gurg loaf riddled with maggots, the vision I had of students fleeing the campus during the Hallow's Eve party, and instead of the cat, I cuddle with the cinder beast. It bites me, leaving me in a pain that doesn't so much come from the gashes, but as if it took something vital from me. Then I wake up, sweaty but clear-headed, minus the stuffy nose. The fever must be gone. I don't think about all my homework. I don't think about how I couldn't make a simple fire spell in the chapel. I don't think about life outside the four walls of my dorm room. I'm starting to feel better when a familiar voice carries from the hall. Yassi fills the doorway, her shining hair like she feels great. Nurse Yassi is here to cure what ails you. I have good news and bad news. Which do you want first? No joke, every time I hear the word which I think which. Or maybe I still have a fever. Good. I ask. I've never been overly enthusiastic about this question. Is there a right answer? Inevitably, I will have to hear the bad news and nobody likes bad news. The good news it is I think Wyatt is going to ask me to the sweetheart dance. I raise my eyebrows, which is about all I can muster. She bounces on her toes. Which makes me wonder who's going to ask you. She waggles her eyebrows. We talk about boys for a few minutes. For once, I don't gripe about JJ because I don't even want to think about him. But I quickly tire and rest on my pillows. Yassi eyes the window. The bad news, she asks. Let me have it. Quince has also been asking about you. My stomach flip-flops, but I know it's not because of the virus. You little heartbreaker. But you have nothing to worry about. Yassi lights up with a flash of inspiration. I'm going to set him up with someone. I appreciate that she's going along as if everything is fine, like we're at regular magic school. However, I have a feeling the world is about to implode. With her sight talent, she should know this. But I can't tell her I'm not concerned about having broken his heart. 
rather, having broken magical law if I follow through with what Storch asked of me. If I don't, I'm toast. What do I do? Chapter 20 Wearing a clean uniform, my hair freshly done, and confidence in my step, I return to classes feeling much better than I did before the weekend. I also have a stash of cookies from Miss Mayweather, who took pity on me, that I look forward to digging into while I spend what's likely to be the rest of the month catching up on homework and studying after missing classes. I wait in the lunch line and chat with Reese about the sweetheart dance. She's hoping Parker, who's in our futurism class, asks her. I think about the note I found in the chapel, and the look Bobby gave me after the rumpus game. A boy in a top hat juggles apples, but it isn't JJ. I spot someone in a top hat sneaking to the front of the line, but it isn't JJ. Top hats dot the dining hall, but none of them belong to Imogen Hawk's son. With the dance less than a month away, the girls at my table talk about what they want to wear. I learn that a formal floor-length dress is typical. If they hold it, I don't have anything that I could wear. A deep voice interrupts me mid-sentence. Is this seat taken? Bobby Gold lowers himself beside me without waiting for an answer. What are we talking about? He looks to me. The sweetheart dance, Winnie blurts, her cheeks blistering. She's been spending time with a guy named Louis Porter, but no one can resist, Bobby, well, except the nymphs it seems. Mmm, Bobby says as though the dance is delicious. His golden tiger eyes linger on me before he takes a lazy sip from his drink and slings his arm across the back of my chair. I think we're all drooling, and it's not from the scent of the pecan pie baking in the kitchen. After us girls get over our moment of being slightly starstruck, it is Bobby Gold, after all, the conversation shifts to last year's sweetheart dance. I'm not feverish, so I know I'm not imagining it, but Bobby inches closer and closer to me. I feel his warmth, radiating. Just before the bells ring, signaling lunch period is over, I find his arm hanging loosely over my shoulder. I stare at my lunch tray, not sure what to do. I can't be late for class, not after missing all afternoon on Friday. I turn my head in Bobby's direction. He licks his lips, smiles, and says, see you at dinner. I stay there for a full minute before thawing. For someone who glows so bright, he sure knows how to freeze a girl in her tracks. Then, as if we were all entranced, the other girls at my table say, Bobby Gold, around a swoony sigh. When I finally stand up, JJ stalks past and his shoulder brushes against me, jostling neither his top hat nor his scowl. But it riles me up, that's for sure. When I turn to ask what his problem is, he's gone. Throughout the day, each of my teacher's piles unloads more homework. When I get to Gould for futurism, there's a note on the door. I cross my fingers, hoping it's to cancel the class. Someone calls, we're meeting in the library. This can only mean one thing. Research. Everyone grumbles as we file out of the building and down the path to the library. There, Professor Collini meets us in good spirits, exclaiming this is the most fun we'll have all year. A few rounds of dissent follow. Collini goes on to describe a creative biography where we research someone famous from history and rewrite their story during the present time, with current laws and cultural practices in place. I call Hawks, Dewey says, rushing over to me. I did a project on her for another class so I can cut my research time in half using the notes I already have. He bounces on his toes, pleased with his resourcefulness. A list of historical figures goes around. Many of them have already been selected by other students ahead of me, so I scroll until I reach the bottom. Bingo. Ivanka Stormanoff. The detective who famously tried to take down Imogen Hawks. I elbow Dewey and say, it's on. I spend the rest of the period deep in a stack of books, taking notes. Dewey and I have played to the legendary rivalry, roasting our respective subjects in hushed tones. Then Dewey says, hey, check this out. He holds a magazine called The Modern Magician open to an article titled Famous Family Trees. I see that Felicity Fox is related to a prominent magical politician. Also, the relationship between several actresses, rumpus players, and other magical celebrities. Then my gaze lands on a pair of tiger eyes. I read the caption. 
That's Bobby Gold's mom. They share that golden glow and distinct eyes. Dewey adds, Belasha Stormanoff. Meaning she's related to Ivanka. We remain in the library after the bells ring, signaling the end of class, fervently researching and competing over our findings, also laughing because Dewey's a goofball, until dinner time. Yassi trails in after the rest of us, opening her mouth to say something, but either decides not to say it or someone interrupts her, I can't quite tell. I try to invite her to speak, but I'm interrupted. The first time, Quint starts droning on about lava stone composition. The second time, Wyatt distracts her with his mere presence and offers to get her some tea. And the third time, the kitchen staff announces the pecan pie is ready. Yassi, were you going to tell us something? I ask, unable to contain my interest. Finally, around a mouthful, she says, do you want the good news or bad news? Is this your new way to start a conversation? I ask around a laugh. There's a lot of both lately. The good news, they caught several demons. The bad news, apparently there were more than they originally thought. At least one demon is still on the loose. Maybe more. The news, both good and bad, settles over us and then everyone asks questions at once, where did you hear this? Who caught them? Where? What happened? She starts to answer when a woman wearing a thick, leather coat over a fitted brown uniform looms over the table, meets my eyes, and says, Maya Wessels, come with me. The last time this happened I went to Seminole Seminar, but by her grave expression, I have a feeling this is bad news. February Chapter 21 When someone uses your full name and says, come with me, it usually isn't a good thing like a trip to Disney or being nominated B.I.W very important which, or access to unlimited pie coming out of the oven in the dining hall kitchen. The woman wearing the fitted brown uniform under a thick, leather jacket, obviously coven constabulary, the magical police, leads me across campus to the administration building. Bad news for sure. I wait for what feels like an eternity. Well, any amount of time seems like an eternity when I could have been eating a slice of pecan pie. Then Ms. Storch marches in. In cartoons, when people have smoke coming out of their ears, it's a funny thing. When the head of admin, a dragon shifter does it, I feel like I might get cooked. Is this about her request to assassinate a ghost? The deadline is getting closer, Maya. Don't forget what you agreed to do. She hitches the worst kind of smile, then brings me to an empty room with bright lights shining overhead. Am I going to be interrogated? I didn't do anything wrong. Maybe it was the accidental use of magic when I fell down the bleacher stands at the rumpus game? I have a feeling whoever used the borework jinx on me was behind it. With a stern look at me, Miss Storch marches away. I listen to the heating system gurgling in the walls. And my breathing. And stare at the ceiling. And twiddle my thumbs. Bored yet? Yeah, me too. I still and wait, and wait. I start to fidget, curl a piece of hair around my finger, pick up my nails, anything not to completely obsess about why I was ushered out of the dining hall, away from the pie, and brought here. Finally, after waiting forever, seriously, the kitchen staff had just brought out the pecan pie, people. Priorities, the door opens. I brace myself for an interrogation like in the movies, but it's only Chancellor West, the head of school. When I say only, I mean that most respectfully because I've gathered he's one of the most powerful wizards alive. He's my seminal seminar professor, or was, considering Professor Aerosmith hatched like a baby chick from the Medusa-like stone statue that she'd been trapped inside since the beginning of the school year. I've spent enough time with West that the intimidation factor has dialed down a notch. Just a notch. His silver robes and silver streaked hair billow behind him as he crosses the room in a few strides. He sits down opposite me and produces a slice of pecan pie. Then another, plus two forks and napkins. I prickle, unsure of his angle. Conversations are always best had over pie, don't you think, he asks, taking a bite. And in private. A ripple moves through the air, as though he muted anyone from hearing what we might say. I take a bite of pie. 
as the rich cinnamon pecan goodness gives way on my tongue, my edges soften. It was well worth the wait. He looks around. Ah, I see the problem. He snaps his fingers and the room transforms with decor that would fit right in at Penny House, my dorm. A few overstuffed chairs materialize in the corner. The light is low. Framed cross-stitched notions cover the walls. There's a round, woven rug underfoot and a wooden table wedges itself between us. I set my plate on top and take another bite of pie. Almost as good as birthday cake. Though I do prefer the apple pie. West sets down his fork. We have a matter to discuss, Maya. At the birthday cake reminder, I panic. Around a mouthful, I ask, I never mentioned this, but is this about the wish I made on my birthday cake candles? He shakes his head. Those are not the same as wish which wishes. Relief sweeps through me, but leaves just as quickly. What about performing magic? Are you saying someone saw you perform magic? I'm not sure. My curtain was open. I lift my shoulder to shrug, but don't lower it as I wince. It depends on the intention. No ill intent. I was in my bedroom at home practicing some spell work. You see, my dead grandmother showed up and... Ah, an accidental infraction. We have more important matters on our hands, so we'll just see how that pans out, shall we, he says, folding his arms across his chest. Or when I skipped class last week. I was sick. I swear. Unfortunately, that happens to the best of us, West says patiently. Also I fell asleep in Claremont Chapel. It's as nice a place as any for a nap. It wasn't me who jinxed Felicity Fox, I blurt. I know. West settles into an exhaled breath. Also, I don't know anything more than I told you about the Marauders. Thank you for your confessions, Maya. My apologies for your detainment. He leans in. I assure you this is a formality, and insisted I question you rather than Storch. He winks. Unfortunately, as a witness to Aerosmith's return, the coven insisted we get your story. I thought at best we speak first, and if they have further questions, they can follow up. Oh. I loosen my white-knuckled grip on the fork. Tell me about Aerosmith. Exactly what happened. I was walking past the statue, and she hatched. Well, I kind of wished she could explain things to me, I say nervously. Relax, Maya. There was no evidence you wished her back into being. Sadly, you cannot claim responsibility. Anything else? She said something about vanilla, Veda, I don't remember exactly. Then she was saying things like growing, consuming, and destroying. I think. I'm sorry. It happened fast, and I was sick, flu or something, and kind of in shock, to tell you the truth. It's not every day you see a teacher emerge from a stone shell or be under a gorgon spell, to begin with. Ah uh, yes, petrifaction. Complicated magic. Few witches and wizards are capable of performing it. The gorgons, of course. Oh, he tilts his head and his eyebrows lift as though he's just realized something. Ah. Uh, funny thing, family trees, and the magic that comes through them. I recall the article I read in the magazine when I was studying with Dewey. Ivanka Stormanoff, the renowned detective who tried and failed to bring Imogen Hawks to justice, is related to none other than Bobby Gold. Maybe he has some old letters or stories about her I could use in my report. This thread of thought leads me to Imogen's diary, which I possess, thanks to J.J. I deliberate about whether to share it with Dewey. I'm not sure if it's an official record and since we're kind of competing with this assignment. Good pie, West says as though realizing my thoughts are racing a mile a minute away from the current conversation. Did he read them? Great pie, I emphasize, taking another bite. I'm glad you agree. There have been many changes here this year. They can take away many things, but not the pie. You were saying about gorgons? He moves on with a dismissive wave of his hand. Since you're here, there's another matter related to what we spoke about at your last seminal seminar class. The Marauders. 
the secret society. Not exactly. They're secret, sure, but they're more like a student group trying to make inroads with a secret society. The hive? I ask. Exactly. You heard several of the demons were apprehended. West waves his fork. Not all of them. It seems the hive has moved into the snatching business. I shiver. Does that mean they're employing the demons? In a matter of words, yes. Is that as bad as it sounds? Quite. As you know, when someone dies, they take a ghostly form before traveling on. I chase back another shiver. Ghosts aren't my slice of pie or cup of tea, as it were. Last autumn, during the ritual to ferry them to the beyond, the circle was broken and they transformed into demon race hungry for magical essence. That wasn't an accident. It was a test. I was under the impression the hive rejected the student group who called themselves the marauders. In reality, they've been toying with their admission into the secret society by giving them various tasks to test their allegiance and how far they'll go to further their cause, as well as do their dirty work. I shift uncomfortably. Is this public knowledge? West gives a subtle shake of his head. Then stop them. It's not that simple. I believe the hive is attempting to raise an army. My head jerks back. A demon army? Or a student army? Why would they? What for? To gain power, primarily and eradicate our world of mixed magicals. He folds his hands together. Why are you telling me this? Because the prophecy in which you're involved points directly to the source of their largest opportunity to grow their numbers, thereby gaining unstable ghosts to create demons. His voice is low, grave. My understanding falls into place with a thud in my stomach. The hive wants to use my wish to kill mixed magicals and non-magicals to obtain their ghosts and turn them into demons? West lifts and lowers his head in a single, swift nod. Chapter 22 the chills I get after hearing Chancellor West's theory don't leave me. Not even when I take my last bite of pecan pie. Ghosts are bad enough, but murder? An army of demons? Then a feverish thought rushes through me, and I blurt, but if the hive kills all of what they call mixed magicals, why do they need an army? To eradicate the world of non-magicals using an army made up of mixed magical demons. If you know who the marauders are, why not stop them and prevent the hive from raising the army? He pushes his plate away and politely wipes his mouth. Ah, this brings me to my point. I know who the students associating with the Golden Hive are. However, I don't know who they answer to. The marauders must. Yes and no. They have a contact within the society, but no one knows the identities of the leader or leaders plural, as it may be. I thought perhaps it was one of our very own, Storch. She is what they call a true magical. In my opinion, we're all true magicals, but they prefer to divide us up by purity of blood. I swallow thickly. I'm guessing I am not a true magical. West raises a finger. You are. We all are. However, your magic is rare. There aren't many wish witches left in the world. Some of my friends say I remind them of Imogen Hawks. You certainly don't look like her. Magic leaves traces. It has a unique signature, much like how you can tell one artist's work from another. In the case of Wish Witches, it's distinct. In the eyes mostly, but few know what they're noticing, so they may resort to saying you remind them of her or look like her. Best to keep it that way. I ask about Margaret the official from the OMM, who helped me get away from Storch. Yes, she's with us. Turns out she didn't recognize the djinn that was transporting you by broom until it had blocked her with a spell. By then, it was too late to get help. It seems like my wish witchery has become somewhat common knowledge when it seems like it's a hidden thing. It's not like I have a tattoo with the words wish witch across my forehead. West tilts his head as though taking a moment to process my joke. His eyes crinkle. No, I suppose not. As you know, magic can leave traces, but I think someone leaked the information or is more perceptive than I thought. 
he pauses as if trying to figure out who. Then it dawns on me. When the members of the OMM came to my house, my mother mentioned that I might be a wish witch. She probably thought it was safe to say in front of Dina and Margaret. Only, it turns out Dina was actually a djinn. He taps the air with his finger. Very astute. Yes, I imagine that is exactly how it was discovered. Djinn aren't known for discretion. If you're curious, the real Dina was discovered in Holland. Of course, we have JJ to thank for that. West folds his arms in front of his chest. Why does everyone end up there? West chuckles. Back to the hive. We know very little about them except that we recently confirmed that they go by the names Screven, Veda, and Valerius. Thanks to Professor Aerosmith, I say, recalling those were the names she said after she emerged from the stone. I thought she was muttering nonsense. He nods. She's recovering now, and we're hoping to speak in greater depth with her soon. Although she was trapped in stone, Aerosmith can leave this reality and enter the astral plane, precisely why she was targeted and why an attempt was made to prevent her from instructing you in seminal seminar. Fortunately, I'm a proficient teacher and recognized something was amiss. That's I've been so adamant about you blocking your thoughts and memories. Wait, you lost me. Astral? We are embodied beings, he gestures to himself and pats his arm, but some of us are also of the stars. We can communicate and travel within energy, the intangible, and between the realms, among the living and dead, immortal, and other less defined states of being. My mind swims with all of this information. What did they want with the professor? I'm still putting that together, but she must have had a powerful encounter, especially to confirm those three names. I have theories, and I'm tracking the marauders closely to find out as much as I can before taking action. I sit in silence, trying to sum up everything he said, but my mind is sluggish from the long day catching up after being sick, the fright when I encountered Aerosmith, and trying to put together the pieces of a sinister puzzle. It's getting on, and I expect you have homework, West says. And keep up with your, ahem, studies. He winks and I take this to mean spying on Bobby. Will the coven want to talk to me? I ask. They get a little carried away with procedures and protocols sometimes. Our conversation will suffice. It's well past dorm curfew when I return to Penny House. My head crashes on my pillow and I dream of clouds and stars and floating free. For the next week, I put my nose down and focus on not flunking my classes or landing in the Iron Tower. After my most recent visit to the administration building, I see Storch everywhere as if she really is watching me. I leave the questions and speculation about everything else to late at night, when I lay in bed, unable to sleep. I replay the conversations with West, what I witnessed, and different moments with JJ. They whirl in my mind, forming a confusing knot I can't untangle. However, during the daylight hours that follow, I'm more concerned with not finishing a reading the realm's report for Darrington. She's been on a tear lately, keeping half the class for detention at times. So far, I've evaded her wrath, but Dewey says that it's only a matter of time. He has a theory that she's involved in a conspiracy, not the marauder or demon one, though it has occurred to me, but in smuggling rare artifacts and tokens used for dark magic. She certainly seems the type with her stony, smileless face and a keen interest in the arcane so I wouldn't put it past her, but I don't want to be involved in any more plots and trouble. Speaking of which, I spot JJ across the dining hall. A changeling with whiskers and a tail leans in close to him while he doesn't eat his dinner. He rakes a pale hand through his dark hair. His gray eyes don't focus on anything in particular. I ignore the yearning within that wishes they'd land on me. Then again, it seems each night a different girl or group of girls joins him, Yassi says, startling me out of my skin. I turn from the scene and back to my slop that I tell myself almost looks like mashed potatoes, except for the gray bits. Do you think he secretly loves the attention and just puts on the moody, bored look because girls like playing the game, she asks, using air quotes around the last couple of words. I wouldn't know. You wouldn't, she asks with a lifted eyebrow. JJ and I are back to hating each other. She starts to delve deeper, but Dewey and Wyatt appear. 
The conversation detours to Rumpus, reminding me of JJ again. I gaze across the room to the boy with the top hat, a faded photograph. He's no longer alone like he was much of the first semester, but looks just as miserable and moody as ever, despite the newfound attention. Playing with your food, a coppery voice asks. I look from the mound of food in front of me forming a star shape and to the golden boy by my side. Bobby's at our table again, which is becoming more common. After the big rumpus win, he seems to be dropping by more often. Aside from being gorgeous, I've noticed Bobby has two temperature settings, warm, when he's the center of attention, all eyes are on him, he's leading the conversation, and gracing us with his presence. And hot. This is when he sits next to me and gets closer until the edges of our thighs or arms are touching. He leans as if he's going to share a secret. His smolder intensifies and his focus is entirely on me at the moment. I let the heat radiate through me as the bells ring, signaling it's time to return to our dorms. Bobby grips my hand as we cross campus with the chaperones, the heat of his palm presses against mine. When the lights of Penny House come into view, he squeezes tighter. I've never had a real boyfriend and someone like Bobby is irresistible. I don't think any girl at Riptivic would pass him up. A strange thought floats in and out of my mind. Maybe they couldn't resist him. I certainly can't. It almost seems like an unnatural pull, like invisible glue. The strange thoughts dissolve when he smiles at me. He's just charming and magnetic and perfect. And close. He's so close, he whispers in my ear, it's too bad we can't meet up after hours. With a glance at the chaperones, he says, things being as they are, why don't you come to the library Friday evening? Don't worry. No work, just leave room for dessert. He shrugs and smirks and leaves the rest to my imagination. What feels like a hot wind tints my cheeks as I rush inside the dorm. I have to tell Yassi, Winnie, anyone. Miss Mayweather, head of the dorm, intercepts me and my stomach plummets at the sight of a note in her hand. I worry I'm being summoned back to the administration building for questioning or by the coven for breaking magical law during the little spellwork incident in the rumpus stands. He did mention the coven is particular about their protocols. This was left for you, Maya, Miss Mayweather says and drops the note in my hand. A chill chases away the heat of Bobby's hand in mine. I blink a few times as though coming out of a daze. Chapter 23 The handwriting is familiar. Relief floods me, further dousing the fire of excitement from when Bobby asked me to meet him Friday and the chill that followed. I read this note. I will never give up on you. As long as we're under the same sky, swimming in the sea of stars, you're my point of stillness in the chaos. Someone plucks it from my hand. What do we have here? Yassi's familiar voice says from behind me. She scans the creamy paper. Another love note. My question is will he ask you to the sweetheart dance? I follow her laughter to the common room, trying to get the note back as she passes it from hand to hand and keeping it out of my reach. I say, don't get me wrong, notes from secret admirers are sweet, but Bobby had the courage to ask me outright. This distracts her, and I grab the note as she whirls around. Bobby asked you to the sweetheart dance, she says too loudly. I hedge. No, not exactly. He asked me to meet him Friday night. Given the circumstances on campus, it has to be in the library, but it's kind of like a... Even louder than before she says, a date? A date with Bobby Gold. She grips my hands and jumps up and down. The most important thing is what are you going to wear? She steers me from the common room where some of my friends gather and toward the stairs, but not before I spot Honey whose mouth curls into a snarl. Yassi takes notice and says, we don't have time for that. Come on, getting ready will be the best part. But it's not tonight. We need to prepare you, she says. Audra, Winnie, and even Reese join up and cluck with excitement. After pulling out the contents of three closets, I'm closest in size to Yassi and Audra, we settle on three outfit options. Number one, depending on the weather, a chunky sweater with leggings or a denim skirt. Number two, depending on my mood, a pair of skinny jeans and a slouchy t-shirt or button-down blouse. 
Number 3, depends on whether the remaining demon is captured and the curfew is lifted, in which case the girls invent a scenario where Bobby takes me on a moonlit picnic. In this situation, I'd wear a little red dress, Yassi's outfit from the sweetheart dance last year. While she experiments with my hair, the note goes around the circle of my friends, each one speculating about the sender. I'm ruling out Bobby. He's direct, Audra says. I agree. It could be anyone. Quince always tries to sit next to you at breakfast, Winnie points out. If Quince wrote the note, it would be a complicated formula involving wickets and progorithms, Reese says with a laugh. He wouldn't stop going on about progorithms yesterday, Audra says, falling back onto Yassi's bed as though she's faint. Winnie's right. It could be anyone, I say. Anyone? Yassi asks. You sure you don't mean someone? Well, yes someone. Anyone. Same thing, I reply. Anyone is general. Someone is specific, Yassi says pointedly. Either I'm tired, she has my hair in too tight a braid, or I'm missing something. Do you know who it might be? Audra asks, brightening. Yassi shrugs. I have an idea. Well, we all say it once. I may not be able to read everyone's mind, but body language speaks volumes. We all lean in, waiting. Then she shrugs. Let's see if he asks you to the sweetheart dance. If I'm right, you'll do my conservation homework for a week. And if you're wrong, I get your pie and you do my conservation homework. Yassi considers this and then says, pie for pie. Homework for homework. Deal. She writes the name on indelible paper, magics it into a butternote, and sends it fluttering to her topmost shelf. Friday can't come fast enough. I get through as much homework as I can, focusing in class, taking notes, and studying every night. I watch Bobby and JJ dominate on the rumpus field. The latter is better, much better, but Bobby is the captain and gets the most field time. I do everything I can to distract myself, but by my final period at the end of the week, the stubborn bells refuse to ring. Professor Naridin drones on about the impact of technology on magical energy. I wish I had my phone. I wish Bobby and I could go somewhere cooler than the library. I wish, I clap my hand over my mouth even though I haven't spoken aloud. My pen goes flying, hitting a bowl of something green and gooey with a clang. Miss Wessels, no spellcasting in class. I wasn't spellcasting I was, I stopped myself and retrieved my pen, feeling red-faced and foolish. I still don't know exactly how wish witchery works. I assure myself I've thought loads of wishes, things I wanted for Christmas, a pony when I was nine and that didn't happen, to know the answers to the last alchemy exam, I got five wrong, and that everyone on campus would just get along, apparently the fights in the boys' dorms between different magical beings have gotten so out of hand several more vamps were sent to the Iron Tower. When the bells finally toll, I rush from the building and back to my dorm eager to get out of my uniform, I like plaid, just not every day, and into the red dress. But no, when night settles and the curfew is still on. The girls meet me in my room for clothes, hair, and makeup. Each one advising Yassi, our resident makeover queen. A smoky eye, Audra says. At least if she's wearing the blouse. It says serious yet mysterious, alluring. She waggles her eyebrows. Yassi waves her wand, painting my face as instructed. I wrinkle my nose and put on the chunky sweater instead. Winnie says, go natural, but with a dark lip. Again, Yassi works her magic, literally, and stains my lips red. I shrug and eye my uniform. It does make getting dressed every day easier. No way, they all say it once. In the end, I wear skinny jeans and a chunky sweater with a dusting of eyeshadow and pale pink lipstick. You look darling, Yassi exclaims, proud of herself. I wish we could wear regular clothes every day, Audra says wistfully. Winnie nudges her and says, Dewey is a big fan of the knee socks, just saying. Audra mock rolls her eyes. I am not wearing knee socks to the sweetheart dance. Okay, okay. Time is, Yassi stops herself at the same time we all train our eyes on Audra. 
Does that mean you're going with him to the sweetheart dance? I ask. That depends, she answers. On, we ask, holding our collective breath. If he asks me, and more importantly how. Last year Alden Medfried walked up to me in the hall and said, Hey, wanna go to the dance? Foolishly, I said yes. Not again. Never again. He's cute though, and you had fun, Yassi says. Not really. I'd like a grand, sweeping, romantic gesture. Nothing wrong with that, I say, hoping that after tonight with Bobby, I'll soon have the opportunity to wear the little red dress. Chapter 24 The Coven Constabulary Officer missed a pick up at one of the dorms across campus, so hand in hand, seven of us, including Quince who'd just as soon live in the library, traipsed back the way we came, making me late for my date. Is it a date? Or does Bobby want help with arithmetic? I start to worry and question myself. I hope Bobby doesn't think I've stood him up. My palms sweat. As soon as I see the glow of the library, lit up against the night, I want to break loose, but holding hands is a safety measure against the remaining demon. As soon as I'm inside, I rush through the entry and past the librarian desk. When I turn the corner, I crash into a tall, dark figure. I gaze up into a pair of gray eyes. JJ grips my elbows, to steady me. Excuse me, I say, shaking him off. As I hurry down the hall to the private study rooms where Bobby indicated I meet him, I feel JJ watching me. I sneak a glance over my shoulder. He's still there when I knock on the door. I try to ignore him. If Bobby is warm, well, hot, JJ is the opposite. Cold, calculating, and cute in a mysterious kind of way. At least that's what I imagine all the girls who've been drooling and giggling over the rumpus MVP must think. Bobby steps through the doorway and leans over, pulling me into a hug before kissing me on each cheek. So glad you came. I can't tear my eyes from him as his lips lift into a grin, erasing JJ's scowl etched in my mind. I step inside, feeling rather self-satisfied that JJ saw the whole thing. I hope he's stewing and annoyed, and I stop short, confused. I thought Bobby was asking me on a dessert date. Well, there are cakes, tarts, and fancy chocolates on the table. But there is also Honey, the person, not the sweetener, along with several people I recognize from classes and the dining hall. Also, two members of the Rumpus team. Bobby passes me a glass of tan liquid. I take a sip, recognizing the sharp tang as the same kind of drink that flowed freely during the party on Hallow's Eve. Spiced cider, Bobby says, taking a sip and winking. Let's welcome Maya to our gathering, he adds, leading me to an empty chair. I stare at a layered trifle, but Honey's glare heats my cheeks. Bobby goes around the table and introduces me to Chilton, Rumpus Longfielder, Koakadayama, Alchemy Genius, Tucker Block, whose eyes are the same gold as Bobby's, Owen, who's as stony-faced as Darrington, and Griffin, he's remarkably hairy and sounds like he's from the South. Does everyone know Maya? Honey scoffs. The girl who started barking on the rumpus field? Of course, they know her. Who could have missed that humiliating moment? At least it was amusing. I shake my head. Felicity Fox wasn't amused. That was a completely different set of spellwork. The boarworm was an experiment and... I interrupt and stab the air with an accusatory finger. It was you who jinxed me? Play nice, Bobby chides honey. I told you to keep your spells to yourself. Wait, you didn't also jinx Felicity Fox, did you? Koa asks her. Honey's lips curl upward. Tucker whistles low and long. Honey shrugs. A girl has gotta do what a girl has gotta do. My anger flows upward, itching to be released. Bobby purrs, Maya is our guest. Let's welcome her. He eyes Honey. Want a tart, she asks. I'm feeling bitter enough, thank you, I reply sourly. Don't be like that, Honey says. It was a joke. A week of jinxes, causing me to have to spend a ridiculous amount of time in the infirmary? I say, putting it all together. 
consider it a favor. At least you got to miss class. I huff, about to lay into her when Bobby passes me a piece of the chocolate cake and says, despite Honey's lack of judgment, we invited you here because we think you're an exceptional witch. Our group is made up of the best, the elite. Those of us who will soon have a lot of power and influence in the magical world. I smile, glad he thinks so highly of me even though I was hoping for a less casual affair. My thoughts chirp over something. Spell. Does Bobby have some kind of spell that he works over girls? Is it the golden glow that radiates from him? I try to shake myself loose from the spiced cider and the Bobby gold lore. I'm a spy and am supposed to be gathering information. Most double agents get some training and probably instruction on how not to fall under the spell of their quarry. What are your plans if we ever get released? I ask. The response is a round of chuckling. Griffin says, things are changing. I'm going into the military. Is there a magical army? I ask, still unfamiliar with the entirety of magical society beyond Reptivic and hoping so if what West said about a demon army is true. There will be, he says. You see, we have to prepare ourselves, Bobby explains. Imagine the unrest on campus on a larger scale. We've grown accustomed to a certain way of life and we're at risk of losing that to mixed magicals, Tucker says. Bobby must notice the midge of confusion that flits across my face. Our respective families, our kind, have been in prominent positions for years. We have certain privileges and access to certain advantages. You know how it is. With the loss of true blood entering the political sphere, well, that complicates things. She comes from a couple of non-magicals, Honey says. How could she possibly know how it is? But we're talking about being on the inside, Bobby says vaguely. The inner circle, if you will. As far as I'm concerned one rotten apple has ruined the bunch, Owen says. What do you mean rotten apple? I ask. Werewolves, centaurs, cyclops. Rotten. 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 West and his ideas about integration. It won't end well, Owen says with distaste. What do you have against? Everyone jumps in, criticizing West and badmouthing the various magicals on campus. I try to interject a few times, but they're so strong in their opinions, I feel out of my depth. Instead, I have a bite of cake and then another. I almost feel invisible, golden fingers reaching out for mine, but Bobby's fold behind his head as he reclines in his chair and Owen, seated on my other side, pounds his fists into the table. They're openly hostile toward the administration, the policies on integration, and talk about how the magical world is better than the non-magical one. Mostly, they seem to disapprove of true blood magicals, mixing with anyone other than their kind. The word hive comes to mind. I cap my head from person to person as they talk over each other, my ears catching on how they believe Imogen Hawks had some solid ideas for social policy and education. You remind us of her, but I can't put my finger on it, Koa says. Heads nod and eyes probe. I feel like they're all looking to me to say something profound or confess we're long-lost cousins. I know my family tree, I had to do an extensive ancestry project in ninth grade, and I'm certain I'm in no way related to Imogen Hawks. We know the prophecy, and that you've had private classes with West, Honey says, meaningfully. I lift my shoulders in a noncommittal shrug. I certainly should have spoken up moments ago, but this time I have the sense to keep my mouth shut as I gather the information that might prove very useful to the Chancellor. Keep it elite, keep the others out of our world, Chilton says with finality. Bobby's mouth quirks, and then he claps his hands together. We didn't invite Maya here to listen to us complain and debate. No, she's here because Pierpont's chair is empty, honey spits. Bobby's jaw twitches. Maya, tell us what you think of the magical world. However, the hour is late, the bells toll, and I'm not so sure they'd like to hear my answer, at least insofar as it relates to their attitudes. Bobby leads me back through the library. While we wait for the chaperone, he eyes his friends and says, don't mind them. They get opinionated when there's cider involved. Honey doesn't like me. She's not sweet, he agrees. But you are and. 
he grips my hands and looks into my eyes. I'd like to take you to the sweetheart dance. The crowd, waiting with us to return to their dorms, gathers closer as though eager for me to answer. I meet the eyes of girls who'd do anything to be in my position right now, probably including using a boarworm jinx to make me embarrass myself. Bobby squeezes my hand, expectantly. Yes, I reply, beaming in his golden glow. Chapter 25 Multiple shadows trail me for the next days, the conversation in the library and the way Bobby's friends spoke harshly about the student body and Chancellor West. Along with how JJ's eyes flashed obsidian when I spotted him after I accepted Bobby's sweetheart dance proposal. And of course the demon still on the loose. This is a problem because anyone caught out of doors after dark risks being snatched, but also because Winnie just came up to my room to let me know JJ is waiting to escort me to Seminole Seminar. I come up with a dozen reasons not to go to class, none of which are reasonable. I consider magicking a dog and using the old my dog ate my homework trick, but neither pets nor familiars are permitted on campus. The truth is I haven't exactly been doing my seminal seminar homework, which last I heard was practicing how to block my thoughts and memories. In general, I've been doing a good job of that and keeping everyone, including Yassi, out of my head. But I'm supposed to be practicing with JJ, and I haven't seen him since I was leaving the library last week. Winnie calls my name from downstairs. I sigh, pull on my boots, jacket, and scarf, and leave my room. First, I stop by Yassi's room to drop off my conservation homework. After all, she did lose the bet. She wrote JJ's name on the indelible piece of paper. I feel confident he wouldn't ask me to the dance or even offer to dance with me if it were the only way to break a jinx or win a rumpus game or a curse. Yassi's face falls when she opens the door, and I pass her my notebook. The five charters of the Firebird, I say, telling her the assignment. She looks relieved. I know that like the back of my hand, but for your info, just because Bobby got to you first, that doesn't mean JJ wouldn't have asked you to the dance. Her eyebrow lifts at a severe angle. I shush her and rush downstairs, thankful JJ isn't waiting in the entryway. Good, he gave up. I find Winnie in the common room with Reese, Sadie, and Philomena. I'm not comfortable asking a boy to the dance, Reese says. I say ask whoever puts a skip in your step, Sadie says. I agree, I add, joining the conversation. Easy for you to say, you already have a date, Reese says. How exactly did Bobby ask you? Philomena says, stepping closer. We had cake and stuff and then when we were leaving the library, he took me by the hands, and in front of everyone, popped the question. I leave out select parts, like how we spent the evening with a group of idiots drinking cider. But Bobby isn't his friends. I give in to the swoon. Bobby is dreamy. They make a collective coup that's cut short when JJ walks into the room, looking slightly more rumpled than usual. He taps his hat against the side of his leg. Reese's cheeks burn red at his appearance and I realize her crush is a fellow member of the rumpus team. I thought you left, I say. Just then, Honey appears around the corner and links her arm in JJ's. His hand stiffens, and he presses it against his thigh. Into his ear, she whispers loud enough for us to hear, think about what I asked you. She winks. The sweetheart dance will be a night to remember. JJ doesn't reply then marches out of the room and down the hall. I shrug and then step closer to Reese. Do you want me to, um, say anything to him about the dance? I shimmy my shoulders in the universal sign for dancing. Ree swallows and glances at her feet. Would you really? Of course, I say with a wink. I'd rather they go together than he go with honey. JJ stands in the open doorway. He holds out his hand and a gust of wind chills me. His grip is cold and firm, not at all like when we walked under the snowy willows. I picture him and Reese slow dancing and say, you know Reese, right? Yeah. Number 32. Midfielder. Wicked kick. She's interested in going to the sweetheart dance with you. He snorts. Her, honey, and half your dorm. I instinctively try to pull my hand away, but his grip tightens. 
Less than half, I say pointedly. JJ stops mid-stride and turns to face me. His lips part. I expect him to say something nasty to me, but he merely exhales, looks up at the stars, and mutters. This is getting tedious. We pass through the halls of Nightingale in silence until we reach the seminal seminar room. Where I expect Wes to be waiting for us, a group of students gathered, two second years I've seen around, a girl from my alchemy class, a veil I saw in the infirmary with Belgrave blisters, and another girl I don't recognize. West claps his hands together and says, glad to see you made it. I glance at JJ whose face is as unreadable as ever. We all take various cushions and seats around the circle in the center of the room. West paces as usual. I gathered the seven of you here because you all have something in common. Namely, that you're all different. You each possess unique magical talents. Some of them quite developed and others less so. I'm pretty sure he directs that last part to me. I thought you might like the opportunity to get to know one another. West has us go around and introduce ourselves. I meet Misha, a giant, Althea, a shifter, Mia, a cyclops, Kyler, Faye, Manolo, Vamp, and of course, JJ, a mystery. I brought you all here tonight because you each have strengths held in high esteem at Reptivic Magical Academy. But it's a reform school. A veritable jail, Kyler says. West nods solemnly. I'm afraid that the leaders in the magical government have been compromised. Do you mean corrupt? I ask. Seems so, West says. Dewey would have a field day with knowing one of his conspiracy theories isn't far from the mark. There are problems on campus, Mia says. Yeah, I heard about a group, like, a secret society, Althea says. Manolo laughs. It's all just big talk. Maya, your thoughts? West asks. I get the sense he knows about the meeting in the library, but he couldn't possibly know that I didn't voice my opinion and objections about what they were saying about mixed magicals. JJ eyes me carefully as if he too knows, but I blocked my mind. I'd had a few unpleasant encounters with Storch and the official who brought me here was a gin. I return JJ's glare. West nods. Long ago, Reptivic and the other magical academies prepared our kind to be warriors and guardians. A few nod as if they know this. After the rift, we settled quietly into peace. As years passed, there was unrest, growing difficulty among magicals. They came out of hiding and then there was the wicked war. We were prepared. We fought valiantly and protected our kind. Things settled down and then demons began to appear. It was a dreadful time filled fear and the rending of face shadows to build an army. Kyler gazes at his hands. The false kings were destroyed along with Count Vlad. West sighs. We're up against something again. The demon wraiths. There is an entity that I believe is trying to eradicate magic and another altogether with the intent of weeding out the mixed magicals and then overthrowing the non-magicals. My stomach sink and the looks on everyone's faces ranging from fear to concern to shock suggest they feel much the same. My friends, the time has come for us to align, to prepare as warriors and guardians of our kind once more. I'd like you all to meet me in this challenge. It also means reclaiming Reptivic as a school and not whatever Storch is trying to turn it into. There may likely come a time when I have to ask much of you. To stand up for your school, the realm, and each other. There's a murmur of assent dotted with lingering shock. As the nearly full moon crests the glass ceiling, the conversation spins round and round as we discuss these grave matters. My thoughts repeatedly return to the table in the library. How my silence was a passive agreement. I should have spoken up, because West is trying to do the right thing, a difficult thing, but I understand his intentions. The bells toll eleven and a chaperone appears to escort us back to our dorms, but West divides us into two groups, sending Mia, Kyler, and me with JJ. We leave them at their respective dorms first and then it's just JJ and me, hand in hand. His is cold. Mine is clammy. When we're in front of Penny House, JJ says, why didn't you tell West about dinner with Bobby and the others? What's to tell? I ask. 
Maya, he says squarely. What? That they were drinking cider? I'm not a snitch. A muscle in his jaw ticks. After seeing him protect me in Tippleton with magic and crush it on the rumpus field, I have no doubt that he can also protect me the old-fashioned way with fists and fighting. But he can't protect me from this strange welling of feelings. He shakes his head and walks away, leaving me standing under the stark porch light with guilt and something more. Regret? Or maybe longing? Chapter 26 Sweetheart dance preparations are in full swing. The campus is a Twitter with excitement and gossip about who asked who, the yes, the no's, the maybes and the secret hopes kindling in timid hearts. I was going to wear the red dress Yassi thought would look great on me if I were going on a picnic with Bobby. As I strike a pose, she stares at me like I have two heads. I double-check in the mirror on the back of her door. You can never be too sure here at Riptivic, it's not out of the realm of possibility for me to have sprouted a second head. I turn to glimpse various angles. The red fabric clings to you in all the right places, but, she taps her chin, deep in thought. No. You look like a tomato. I thought the theme is red, white, and pink. Take it off, she says, leveling me with her gaze. We can do better. Her tone is that of determination as though we're scaling a mountain, writing a masterpiece, or on a great quest with valuable treasure. I take the dress off and start to put my uniform back on. I would love to go to the mall, I say absently when I feel a whoosh and a tug, a snug and a push. I look down and I'm wearing a dress made of delicate pale pink fabric woven with the finest beads, like miniature pearls. Yassi lowers her wand and takes me in. Now that is what I call a dress. I spin in a circle, and she performs the wand work to expand her mirror so I can see from every angle without having to move. When I do, the dress moves with me like sunshine glistening on water. It's beautiful, I whisper. If I do say so myself, Yassi breathes as astonished as I am. You sure you want to go into beast protection and rehabilitation? You'd be a successful fashion designer. She smiles. My heart belongs to creatures big and small, but you, my friend, belong on the cover of a magazine. You look stunning. You're going to knock Bobby out. I can't help but smile at Yassi, my version of a fairy, or rather nymph, godmother. Will I turn into a pumpkin at the stroke of midnight? I ask her. She gives me an odd sideways look. Cinderella. It's a fairy tale. Yassi shakes her head, unfamiliar with the classic story. Now, what am I going to wear? Not red again. Maybe white with red lips, she says as her grin widens with inspiration. Just wait. This is going to be spectacular. The next couple of days make everyone fizzy with anticipation. It's hard to focus on taking notes and assignments when all I can think about is me, in that dress, and dancing with Bobby Gold. I'm between classes, standing on the stairs of Hawthorne with Audra and Winnie, when from across the lawn, someone calls, Audra. Dewey rushes toward us, holding what looks like a bundle of candy wrappers. Audra, he repeats, catching his breath. He extends a bouquet of candy bars he must have got from the vending machine in the basement of his dorm. She looks at him expectantly. He nods at the chocolate bars and says, Will you go to the sweetheart dance with me? She breaks into a grin, reaches an arm around the candy bouquet, and hugs him. Yes, Dewey Dunkel. I'll go to the sweetheart dance with you. The three of us bounce up and down excitedly while he stands there grinning happily. Okay, Winnie. You're next, I say, letting the lovebirds bask in the moment. She shrugs. It's okay if no one asks me. I'm a modern dwarf. I'll go by myself and still have fun. We'll still be there, silly. I nudge her. Is the sweetheart dance a riptivic tradition, or? I ask. Dewey already stands a little more proudly and returns to the conversation. You don't know the story? Imogen Hawks, yes, the Imogen Hawks I'm doing my project on, he chuckles at our ongoing rivalry, she was the spirit director back in her day. 
Well, she heard about proms at non-magical schools and wanted to have something special for everyone here. She also had someone special here, Audra asks, gazing warmly at Dewey. She assembled a committee and they put on the first dance. From there it evolved into something extraordinary. I find it fascinating how Imogen was beloved and spirited, but also supposedly had a dark, sinister side. Early on, West said the two energies must always coexist, but I wonder why Imogen couldn't solely dwell in her light. The bells chime and we begrudgingly disperse to our classes. On my way, I'd overhear multiple sweetheart asks between a vamp and a changeling, she says no, a fay and a pixie, double no, a vamp and a wargirl, she says yes, and a shifter and a shifter, it's a maybe. I spot JJ walking away from a girl with long, flowing red hair, who's in tears. I wonder who he's going with. Later in the day, during arithmetic, gazing at Bobby, I remember my birthday wish. I wished that I'd fall in love, but I also sensed that I might have my heart broken. I remember feeling the fullness of it in my entire body, it smelled like mint, tasted sweet, and turned my tummy over in a fluttery kind of way. I also remember feeling my heart skip a beat like it risked shattering and that love, true love, could come at a great cost. It's possible I was being dramatic, that I'd read too many books and watched too many movies. But with the sweetheart dance a day away and a date who makes me swoon, I think again about how West taught that in magic there are always multiple sides, paradox, contrast, and often multiple unknowns. Chapter 27 It's the morning of the sweetheart dance, and I wake to a loud cry coming from the hallway. I rush out to find Winnie, Sadie, Audra, and others gathered around someone. They're all chattering at once, their voices rising and falling with panic and reassurance. What's going on? I ask. They fall silent and their eyes land on me. What? I ask. Audra says, well, I've seen worse. Sadie's forehead wrinkles as if she doesn't quite agree. Yassi can fix this, Winnie says confidently. Fix what? I ask. She's better at broad strokes, not fine details, Audra says, disagreeing. I gather she means makeovers. She did a great job on my makeup when I met with Bobby before, I say, confused. That's adding. Not subtracting. Audra shakes her head and exhales. What are you talking about? I ask, trying to see who they're gathered round, but before I do Audra steers me back into my room and stops me in front of the mirror. Gregor's axe, I say, bringing my hand to my mouth. My fingers travel up to the ginormous pimple that planted a flag on my face overnight. It's the skyscraper of pimples, the Mount Vesuvius, the King Kong. I collapse on my bed. What am I going to do? Winnie calls Audra from the hall. I get back in bed and pull the covers up to my eyes. Please send help, I mutter as she rushes from my room. Voices continue to rise and fall out in the hallway, but minutes later Yassi appears with her wand drawn. Where is it? Let me at it, she says. It's awful, I say, still concealing myself under the blankets. It can't be that bad. I have sisters and live in a dorm with a bunch of girls. I can handle a little pimple. In the same breath, she pulls the covers off me. Her eyes widen. Oh, it's bad. But I can fix it. We're going to need to prepare it first. She exits, and I take a moment to peek in the mirror again. There's nothing that can defeat this thing other than time. Yassi comes back saying, clear the way, coming through. I have an emergency here. I manage to squeak a laugh. That's more like it, she says. Pimples like this are no laughing matter. Actually, that's not a pimple. She plants one hand on her hip and the other grips her wand. What? Yes, it is. She shakes her head. No, it's a strasimpulus. Is that the magical word for acne? Or a jinx? I ask, thinking of honey. No, it's a very small, sesame seed-sized creature that seeks out stress. You're joking. Ha ha. There I left. Now please take care of it. 
We have to be very careful because when you stress, your body releases certain chemicals and this little guy feeds off of those. So really, laughter is the best medicine in this case. Yassi. Come on. We all have to get ready. Big night tonight. There's no time to. She sticks out her tongue at me. Then she puts on a pair of oversized glasses and starts tickling me. Yassi, what are you doing? De-stressing you. It's the only way to cut off the Strasimpulus's food supply. Then there's the matter of extracting it, but don't worry, I know the spell. I'm about to argue, but it's no use. Yassi is a good tickler. Laughter pours out of me. She also tells corny jokes, which distracts me. What's the problem with twin witches, she asks. You never know which witch is which. I giggle. What do you call a witch at the beach? A sandwich, I reply, remembering that one from a candy wrapper. She tells a few more, keeps me rolling with laughter, and then aims her wand. Don't move an inch. She chants a spell. I suddenly feel my face swelling like I was stung by a bee. Oops. She bites her lip. Oops. You're not supposed to say oops. She tries again. I feel like I'm going to burst from my skin. Yassi, I don't think it's working. She looks strained, grips my shoulders, and says. Whatever you do, don't look in the mirror. I've almost dislodged it. She does the spell one more time, and I flinch, catching a glimpse of myself in the mirror. I'm horrifying. My face is swollen like a balloon like I have the worst case of hives ever, but at the same time I register this, something comes loose and very quickly, there's a deflating sensation. Yassi moves her wand in a complicated flourish and then says, I got the little bugger. Suspended in the air between us is an itty-bitty, teeny-tiny, very angry impulus. I'm sorry I didn't warn you. Sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. I brush my hand over my cheek. It's still a bit red, but nothing like when I woke up. So are you stressed? She asks after she stores the creature in a jar. I stutter a breath. No, of course not. I only have a date with the cutest boy at Riptivic. But the words are hollow then filled with uncertainty because there's a strange lore, a pending prophecy, knowledge about the marauders, and the fringe group building an undead army. No, nothing to stress about. Good. You're going to stun in that dress. Yassi and I go out to the hall where a few girls still gather around someone. They're deep in conversation when Yassi interrupts. I just defeated a Strasimpulus. There's nothing I can't handle, she says boldly. We've tried everything, Winnie says. The small crowd parts to reveal Reese, seated on the floor with her knees tucked to her chest and rocking back and forth. She repeats, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Audra confides, she tried to make a love potion using Gerber daisies when it called for regular daisies. Now she's stuck. Reese, I say. She doesn't reply. She can't hear you. The love potion was supposed to catch his eye, and when it did, he'd realize he loves her. Who? I ask. Winnie shrugs. We don't know. If we did, we could break the spell. Then I realize exactly who. I crouch down and wave my hand in front of Reese's face. She doesn't respond. Reese, my friend. I don't think JJ is capable of loving anyone. JJ? Audra asks. She has a crush on JJ? I shrug. They're on the rumpus team together. Have you noticed all the girls chasing after him? I have. Audra rolls up her sleeves and pulls out her wand. It can't hurt to try. She says a long spell that's almost poetic, mentioning JJ, and incants for Reese to be free of him. Yeah, how about both of us? The air in the room seems to ripple as we watch and wait. Reese goes still and slowly, her eyes refocus. She looks up at us and says, What happened? Audra launches into her. I'm all for sweet romance, but no love potions. They're for the wicked. 
Risa's shoulders climb up toward her ears sheepishly. Yassi, a sweetheart dance veteran, places her hands on her hips and says, two crises averted. Anyone else have a problem or can we get ready for the dance? I still don't have anything to wear, Winnie says. Yassi places her arm around Winnie's back and says, that's an easy fix. Hours later, and I do mean hours, plus several outfit and makeup adjustments, not me, but the rest of the girls, once more, we gather in the hall. Perfume and excitement scents the air. Yassi is gorgeous in her white gown and with her hair braided into a crown on top of her head. Audra wears a shade of pink that's almost purple. Her hair is piled high and studded with little shimmery clips. Winnie wears a plum-colored dress with her hair straightened and smooth, Reese is in bright pink and Riley in reddish-orange that complements her green eyes. The three of them don't have dates, but are going together. Brief letters by, wearing a tiny white dress that reminds me of feathers and says, you look gorgeous, babes. Gotta fly. She's little more than a puff of twinkle when we reach the bottom of the stairs. Girls, it's showtime, Yassi whispers as our dates turn to greet us in the entryway. Chapter 28 Bobby steps forward from the crowd of dates gathered at the foot of the stairs. He wears a light gray, almost white, suit, highlighting his glow. He's a golden vision, to behold. You look beautiful, he says in a low voice and then holds up a small pink flower with white edges. It's a stargazer, he says, attaching it to my wrist. Thank you, I say, nearly breathless. Dewey gives Audra a piece of candy. To his credit, she peels the wrapper to reveal a chocolate rose. Wyatt and Yassi stand close as though whispering poetry to each other. I think they might kiss right here, there's so much in each other's business. A chaperone waits to escort our group across campus. Bobby holds out his elbow, and I link my arm through and grip his hand. The full moon lifts over the mountains in the distance. It's tinted red as if agreeing to contribute to the sweetheart dance decor. I'm not sure what to say to Bobby. The night is chilly, but his hand is warm in mine. Heat climbs slowly from our hands and up my arm. Thinking about him breaks me out in a full-body flush. I've never been on a real date before or gone to a dance with a guy. Riley, the boy next door, asked me freshman and sophomore years but he only ever talks about baseball. I'm about to ask Bobby a question when I hear Yassi say, nymphs, call it the blood moon. I like blush moon better, Winnie says. Wyatt says, it's called the blush moon because it's a night for love. Winnie giggles. I expect Yassi to reply with a lyrical line of verse, professing her undying love for him, but in a grave tone she says, we call it the blood moon because it's an omen. An omen for what? Winnie asks, glancing up at the red-hued moon. Bloodshed, violence, I don't hear the rest because Bobby says, did you see that play at the rumpus game yesterday? Brackman from Thistle cannot rob from this gold. He spends the remainder of the walk talking about rumpus. We reach a white tent in the moors down by the lake. From the outside, it looks like a regular covered tent used for events like weddings. But when I step through, the scene is enchanted, literally. Tiny lights twinkle, but they move around like fireflies and in and out of the gossamer fabric draping the ceiling. Sparkly chandeliers suspend from above like clusters of stars. Flowers scent the air and bloom before my eyes. Balloon-like orbs silently pop, emitting little puffs of sparkly confetti. Heart-shaped butterflies flutter through the air. One lands on my nose, and I'm pretty sure it kisses me, before flying away. There are fountains of chocolate, strawberries and whipped cream, heaps and piles of cakes and sweets, and the famed Riptivic Chocolate Caramel Sweetheart Pie. Students already make their way to the dance floor in the center. I spot Misha from the meeting with West along with her date, the warboy from the library. Bree is with Kyler, also from the meeting with West. A couple of Bobby's friends approach, each with a girl on their arm, Honey's minions Alicia and Polly. I see Sage, Bobby's sister, with Parker. The Fay are mostly with vamps, the vamps with changelings, and a lot of the elves with other elves, but I'm happy to see so much love in the air. The band starts a new song that gets everyone cheering. 
I'm about to ask Bobby if he'd like to dance when I spot JJ walking off the dance floor with honey. My heart craters. I think I'm going to get a slice of pie, I tell Bobby. My tone is flatter than I mean for it to be. He wraps his arm around my bare shoulder, and I feel that warmth penetrating me once more. After that, we're going to dance so don't wander off, he says, wagging his finger between us. My steps falter as I walk away, recalling the last time I danced with Bobby Gold and had that disturbing vision. I find the biggest slice of chocolate caramel sweetheart pie on the table and take a bite. I close my eyes. It's almost as delicious as my birthday cake, also chocolate with a layer of caramel in the middle. This brings to mind my wish and my original crush, Carter. I'm over him, but not the idea of falling in love. The song changes again to a slow tune. Wyatt and Yassi sway on the dance floor. Other couples move together, sweetly falling for each other on this special night. I look for Bobby. He's deep in conversation with his friends, probably about Rumpus and boring Alicia and Poppy, their dates, to the point where they start thinking about homework assignments due. Oh wait, that's me. I suppose what he lacks in personality, he makes up in good looks. I take the last bite of pie and make my way over to him. His smile lights me up. There you are. Ready to dance, he asks, bringing me out to the dance floor. The song is fast now, and we fall into a rhythm. I may not have the best singing voice, but I do have moves. Winnie, Reese, and Sadie also dance nearby, and we all groove in and out of each other's beat as one song turns into another and then another. When the band brings it down with a slow song, Bobby plants one hand on my shoulder and the other on my waist. May I have this dance, he asks formally. I meet his tiger eyes and feel his radiance burning through me. Having fun, he asks. We make small talk about how lovely the night is. I do well to direct him away from Rumpus and more toward collecting information that might be useful to West. Despite the strange hold he has on me, that is why I'm here. Then he says, I was hoping we'd be able to sneak away later. Find somewhere quiet. Just you and me, he says, eyeing the crowd. Sure, I say. That would be nice. The dance is great, but it's so crowded. Last year there were only half as many students. Before they made Reptivic a reform school? It was different then. He shrugs and leans in meaningfully. More intimate. My mind tells me to roll my eyes and say something snappy. However, my body responds with what sounds almost like a purr. How embarrassing. When the song ends, Bobby leads me off the dance floor and past the dessert tables where students gather for sweets and punch. Tables for two dot the perimeter of the space, but most of them are taken. We reach the back of the tent and a couple giggles in the near darkness. Bobby crouches and lifts the edge of the tent flap to exit when a cold hand grasps my wrist. I follow the hand to see it belongs to JJ. Two boys tug me in two different directions. JJ's eyes flash. Maya, I have to talk to you for a minute. The guys exchange a steely glare. I incline my head, waiting for JJ to speak. He says, privately. Bobby sighs with irritation. I stutter. Bobby, I'll be right back. I follow JJ back toward the crowd, but he stops abruptly, and I bump into him. He hisses, where were you going? None of your business. It is my business. There's still a demon on the loose. If you must know, we were going to find somewhere quiet. Outside the safety of the tent, with him, he asks, aghast. My brow wrinkles. Is that a problem? You're here with honey. I'm not. I came alone. I roll my eyes. Always playing the loner card, huh? Tall, dark, and handsome. His lips quirk. I freeze, catching my slip up. I meant mysterious. I cross my arms in front of my chest. There were loads of girls who wanted to go with you. A couple, walking arm in arm and laughing, brush into us. JJ looks around as though seeking a match to light his fuse. Anyone but him, Maya. 
Why do you even care? He gazes up at the ceiling and lets out a low growl. You hate me, JJ. It shouldn't make any difference who I go to the sweetheart dance with. And if it makes any difference, I'm supposed to be spying on him. I don't want you to get hurt, JJ says through gritted teeth. I bark a laugh at the irony. Then you of all people should try to be nice to me. A couple I notice drifting from the dance floor makes the remainder of the tent their ballroom and glide through the tables, not paying attention to the chairs or people. The girl steps on my foot. Ow, I say, hopping up and down. JJ grips my waist, steadying me. His hand is cold. I don't want you to get hurt by Bobby Gold, he corrects. So it's okay for you to be a jerk to me, but no one else? What about her? I say, pointing to the girl who just trampled me. I don't wait for him to answer. JJ, just leave me alone. I rush away from him and scan the crowd as I make my way back toward the tent flap. Then I see Bobby disappear through with someone else. A familiar female face leaves me with a smirk as the tent flap closes. Honey Oaks. My breath catches and there's a little fissure in my chest. Gregor's axe. JJ's cold hand circles my wrist. It's then I realize that Bobby's grip on girls is unnatural. It's the gold hold, something having to do with his magic, I'm sure of it. I almost feel feverish around him, out of control. If Bobby meant anything to me, my shoulders would quake and tears would fall. Instead, anger ices me over. Or maybe it's just the cold figure that comes closer. Maya, we have a job to do. I have a job for storage and I could never bring myself to do it. But if I don't, this is my last night at Riptivic. Possibly my last night alive. Chapter 29 JJ's voice cuts through the music in the tent and the noise in my head that repeatedly asks why would he leave with honey. JJ's presence is a point of stillness in the chaos inside my head and heart. There's a demon out there, he reminds me in his smug and accented voice. So you've said, I mumble, pulling away from him. It's not safe. But I'm somehow safe with you? I scoff. Unfortunately, he mumbles. Anger builds on top of anger, and I feel like punching something. Did you learn anything more about Bobby? JJ asks. You have the nerve to ask me questions? You think I'll talk to you? Believe it or not, I'm a good listener, he says in a low voice, brushing off my irritation. The last couple of days leading up to this, I let myself think I was normal, well magical, but normal within this world. Getting excited with Yassi and my friends, planning our outfits, doing our makeup, the Strasimpulus notwithstanding made it easy for me to forget that I'm at the middle of a prophecy, trapped at a reform school, and Storch and Bobby's target because of the kind of which I am. I glance back at the party in full fun mode, sigh at what I'm leaving behind, and follow JJ to the tent flap. Bobby and Honey are long gone. Probably off somewhere making out. Once outside and under the full, reddish moon, the music from the dance fades away. I shiver. Without a word, JJ drapes his coat over my shoulders. We walk, hand in hand until we reach the knoll, where Claremont Chapel sits aglow. As soon as we're inside, I snatch my hand away and sit down on a bench. Really, I'd rather be alone than with him of all people. He seems to sense this and gives me space. I'm quiet as I collect my thoughts. JJ lights a few more candles with an ordinary match. He closes his eyes and holds his hands over the flame as though warming them in front of a wood fire. I tried to light a candle in here once with my wand and it wouldn't work. He lifts his head slowly and says, that's because this is a sanctuary. No magic inside the walls. It's a relief, really. He seems dimmer in here, less boy and more shadow. He passes his hand into the flame and his skin brightens, like the difference between watching a black and white or color television. I get to my feet and take my hand in his, turning it over. His skin is colder. I look into his gray eyes. You scare me, JJ. I scare myself sometimes, he replies faintly before drawing me down to sit beside him. My mother, in her desire to remain youthful, 
took something vital from me because she was afraid I might share her talent as a wish witch. I was a threat. Ad infinitum. West told me. Did he tell you my talent is the inverse? JJ's eyes meet mine. Instead of stormy, they're sad. I'm twice cursed. Once by my mother who left me in this half-life state, part man and part ghost. I dwell in a liminal space. In between. And twice because my talent is to curse, to destroy, instead of create. His words fall dully, regretfully between us. I don't say anything because what does someone say after that? Gosh, that sucks. Or well, the good news is you haven't demolished the school or started a war, so that's a relief. I stopped aging when I reached 18 and have been stuck here ever since, moving through time, but never getting older. Instead, it's as though I'm fading. Each year I feel less myself and more like, he shrugs. Instead of the swell of fear that usually rises inside any time I so much as about ghosts, I truly do feel safe with JJ, not that I'd ever admit that to him. It's like I have an expiration date and without that vital part of myself, without breaking my mother's curse, I'll continue to diminish, getting colder and less alive until I truly cease to exist. I'm able to resist the demons, because she took a vital part of me. Every day I fight, resist giving in and disappearing. Here again is the contrast, the two sides of the same magical energy. The one his mother couldn't resist, in the end. I part my lips and say the only thing I can, I'm sorry, JJ. I'm sorry you have to carry that burden. I'm sorry I've been mean to you. I'm sorry I don't know how to help. The corners of his lips twitch as if long ago he smiled easily. He squeezes my hand and says, we should probably head back to the dance. When we step outside, I feel threads of his energy wrap protectively around me like a blanket. Maya, you never have to speak to me again, but despite what West asked you to do, all I ask is that you stay away from Bobby. The energy between us gets stronger, and I sense a door in JJ's mind open. He nods, and I step into one of his memories. A golden figure, a man, glows so brightly my eyes burn. We're in a small, dank room. The man says, let me in. His voice is a vaguely familiar echo, but I can't discern the source. A less faded version of JJ replies, I won't, but even if I did, you won't find what you're looking for. You're Imogen's son. Surely, you carry her power. It doesn't work that way. I can't grant a wish, he grinds out. We'll see about that, the voice says and then heat radiates from the man like invisible flames, licking everything in the room, including young JJ. He recoils as though being burned. He cries out in agony, twisting on the ground in pain. I feel the heat licking my skin, trying to get in. It broadens, deepens, surges harder. Give me the wish, the man says. JJ writhes in agony, but doesn't answer. The magic intensifies once more, but JJ still doesn't give anything away. Shortly after, the golden man grunts, steps over JJ, and leaves him crumpled on the floor of the empty room. The scene dissolves, and we're back on the moor. The music from the dance plays faintly in the background. You resisted. In a low voice, JJ says, I don't have a wish to give. Some people will try to infiltrate your thoughts and steal your wish. No one can know about my magic, because if they tried to channel my ability, that could be disastrous. So I let him think I was a wish witch. Who was that? I ask. JJ draws a deep breath. The father of your sweetheart dance date, years ago. I jerk my head back as a chill lifts the hairs on my neck. Anfury. Fallen angels. They want a wish. What are fallen angels? JJ snorts. Some say they're unnatural, like vampires. Subject to a curse. Sounds harsh. What do you think? I ask. Like anyone, they're governed by free will. It comes down to the choices they make. Much like Seelai and Unseelie Fay. Much like all of us. But they're dangerous? They lean more toward the shadow side ruled by greed, power, lust, and pride. 
Do you ever feel like he's trying to get into your head, but instead of threads of energy, it's heat, white hot light, burning its way in? I felt it in your memory. My shoulders fall. And yes, yes I have. Fear washes through me at the thought of Bobby trying to access my magic. JJ's eyes anchor mine in a way that makes my ears turn pink, despite the cold, full moon night. West should have told you everything, but he feared because you weren't yet strong in blocking access to your mind, they'd find out about you. They being Bobby and other fallen angels? I thought he was a mage, an alchemist. I've seen him shirtless and sweaty on the rumpus field, and he doesn't have wings. JJ's nostrils flare as the words plunge from his lips. Exactly. Fallen angels. They can entrance you, cause infatuations, desire, and trick you into thinking you want them. They're like a walking, talking love potion. I'm certain there is animosity between the two guys, but do I detect jealousy? And what about you, J.J. Thorne? Why didn't you tell me any of this? I ask. J.J. scrubs his hand down his face. I didn't tell you all this, because I'm fading, disappearing. Of course, I want my life back. But that's not likely to happen. I wanted you to know the truth, because when I'm with you, it's the only time I feel complete and like there might be hope for me. It's like you amplify all the good remaining inside of me. His fingers brush my jawline. Because I meant to break the curse. Because I have the wish, I say part question and part statement. JJ shakes his head and then leans in. No, Maya, that's not the reason. I want to protect you from myself. You know what I am now. A ghost? That doesn't change the way I feel, I whisper. Cursed, he says. We're just a breath apart. His lips land on mine. I feel the trueness of him in my entire body. His mouth is surprisingly soft, sweet, and he tastes faintly like mint. My tummy tumbles. I stretch onto my tiptoes to get closer. Unlike the first kiss, which was filled with desperate hunger, this kiss extends past everything I thought I knew about J.J. Thorne. He circles his arms around me, squeezing me against his chest. Instead of feeling cold, a flare of heat rushes through me. My fingers tangle in his hair, press against his neck, and then find the muscles of his back surprisingly toned, hidden under his jacket. Magic, unlike anything I've ever felt, crackles between us like miniature lightning strikes. If it weren't for the clear sky, I'd fear a storm. But this is the opposite. This is languid summer nights, this is dreamy lazy afternoons, and mornings, relaxing in the muzzy place of sleep. JJ inhales sharply, gripping my jaw, with one hand and the other pressing, against my low back. I curl into him, and the kiss deepens. Tingles turn into torrents as my desire grows. He growls slightly, and the kiss continues as my pulse races. When we part, JJ's fingers still lace tightly around mine. We look at each other, and then I follow his gaze up. It's as though the stars wink at us. He kisses me again, and I feel a welcome warmth ignite something in my heart. His hands gently cradle my jaw, and mine find their way back into his hair. I'm weak in the knees, but it's as though I'm drawing my strength from him and he from me as the kiss stretches into the corners of the night. It flies well past the moon and toward the stars. At last, he takes a deep breath, and I lower onto my heels. That's why I don't have a date tonight, he says. I'm left breathless. However, standing on the moor, all of a sudden, I get very, very cold and it's not because of JJ or the February night. An altogether different kind of chill works its way through me. Someone wearing a pink dress streaks by the edge of the tent, unescorted by a coven constabulary chaperone. A shadow crosses her, dyeing her dress the same color as the moon. The energy and air surrounding us tightens, darkens, and I feel cold in my bones. JJ orders, get inside. Then he rushes toward the girl and the demon. Instead, I grip his hand and draw my wand. I cast a flare into the sky, hoping a CC, professor, or someone who can help seize it. The demon looms over the student, a spectral mass drawing energy and life force from her. Strands of her blonde hair conceal her face, but I recognize Honey Oaks. No question. 
Magic issues from JJ's wand, warding off the demon, but it's too late. Honey lies lumply on the ground, the color gone from her except for the pink of her dress. The demon turns on us, but JJ repels it as we dash to the tent. Someone else must have already raised the alarm or seen mine. What was an enchanted, lovely school dance is now pandemonium. I call, keep calm. The demon is outside. We have to stay in here until it's safe. However, everyone races for the exits. JJ spins in a circle, sealing the tent. The screaming continues, and then I spot six figures standing back to back in the center of the space at evenly spaced intervals. Magic issues from their wands as they take aim at various intermagical couples, Yassi and Wyatt, Audra and Dewey, and numerous others. They fly apart, landing roughly on the ground. I take several steps backward, unable to understand how the marauders could do this and harm my friends. I take another step back, my wand still lifted. I bump into JJ. This has to stop, JJ says, taking aim at a chandelier over one of the marauders' heads with his wand, and loosening it from the ceiling. It lands on top of the marauder, who collapses to the ground. Meanwhile, the tension that's been brewing on campus since the beginning of the year between the various magicals from different backgrounds spills over. Two giants take on four vampires, a cyclops and a shifter go head to head, fey, elves, and dwarves are in a tussle. A marauder creeps near the dessert table, stalking a changeling. I send up a wave from the chocolate fountain, dowsing the black cloaked figure. JJ moves his arm overhead as if he's holding a lasso and draws all of the butterflies into a swarm before casting them at another marauder. Meanwhile, students grapple with the exits, confused and alarmed. The three marauders who we disarmed are now bound with magic. The three remaining marauders make their way toward us, the source of their impending defeat. I send the cookies and cakes in the direction of another marauder and then use an adherate spell to affix them to his black cloak. JJ raises the bass drum from the band into the air, along with several cymbals. They chase and then smash and clang into another marauder while I contend with the last one. We could still be great, you know, the figure hisses. My heart sinks when I meet Bobby's tiger eyes, peeking out from the low hood. You and me. What about you and Honey? Do you know what happened to her? I ask. She tried to interfere with our plans tonight. I told her to leave if she didn't want a part in it. And a demon got her. He scoffs. Right outside the tent, I add. Nonsense. She had a metal token to ward them off. JJ rushes over. The same way it did Pierpont? JJ's sarcasm is like a blade. Using a metal ward as protection doesn't work against demons. The only thing to protect someone from a demon is someone who's been fractured, who carries a curse. Someone like JJ. Just then, I feel an unpleasant heat surge toward me. I sense Bobby trying to pry into my thoughts, into the source of my wish witchery. I block my mind like the exits to the tent. I don't even know where exactly my magic resides within, but my one aim is to keep it safe. Bobby's energy probes, as though trying to find a weak spot. I resist, remembering the searing glow from JJ's memory. Bobby's father must be far more powerful, but his begins to singe and I feel the pain. My pulse pounds in my ears. JJ glances over at my flushed face as I continue to try to resist. He lays a cold hand on my arm. The pain lessens. JJ, you're a has-been, washed up, little more than a shadow in this world. And soon, I will become the most powerful, and you will be no more. I'll destroy you along with the mixed magicals and non-magicals in this realm. Once again, the Amphrey will rule. At the threat, red flashes behind my eyes, untapped heat belonging to me, buried deep within. A treasure not yet discovered. I dip into it and raise my wand. Fiery energy issues forth, sending Bobby flying backward and into the remains of the dessert table. I levitate the punch bowl and let it douse him just as teachers and several other members of the administration enter the tent. JJ and I are alone in the middle of the disarray as fingers point in our direction. Then chaos erupts, once more, as everyone tries to flee. 
Darrington is nearest, and I rush over to her. Honey Oaks was taken by a demon. But she doesn't listen to me. She casts spells in every direction, presumably protective measures. JJ's hand finds mine and he says, we better get out of here. Like earlier, we sneak through the flap in the back of the tent. As we step into the chill night, the moon is redder than ever. Chapter 30 A massive dragon stands on the moor outside the tent. Her amber eyes gleam in the low light. She snorts and a plume of smoke rises into the sky. I belatedly realized that it was strange that Storch didn't show up to defend the students when the marauders went off the map and attacked. Well, not strange, completely in character for the dragon shifter, but not for the head of administration. JJ, and I keep our wands lifted. I notice that the more I use my magic, the stronger it becomes. I feel it crackling on my fingertips, eager to be let out. A low growl comes from Storch. Either you defied me and didn't carry out my order or you waited to impress me with your skill and do it now. I have to admit that it's really weird that a dragon is talking to me right now, but it's not the time to reflect on this not-so-normal life of mine. I bite my lip and glance at JJ. His brow creases in confusion but the rest of his face remains stony. I have no intention of doing what you asked me to, I reply in a voice as strong as I can muster. Storch stomps the ground and steam rises from her as if she's stoking her inner fire. You gave me your word. Then I guess my word is no good. There are worse things, such as being a murderer. My anger comes at me red hot again. I wonder what my magic against her flame will be like. I have a feeling I'm about to find out. I made you a promise, which, Storch says. Then I will face it but not before you tell me why you wanted me to assassinate. The dragon laughs. For real. It's low and smoky, menacing, and quite frankly spooky. If I didn't have my wand as a weapon or know that I can do some damage with it, I'd be shaking right now. Well, I am a little, but the girl I was last summer would have run away. I stand my ground. We made a deal. Last chance. Do it now, and the Iron Tower will not be your fate, Storch says. I shake my head as I brace myself for her roar and flame. I don't imagine she'll send me to jail without toasting me a bit first. Then I will have to do it myself. She stalks toward JJ. What did she want you to do, Maya? JJ asks. I was afraid he'd ask. She asked me to assassinate a ghost. Apart from not knowing how to do that and having a deathly fear of ghosts, when I realized it was you, there was no chance I'd follow through. Not that I would have anyway. This is the part where I ought to hang my head in shame, but I don't dare tear my gaze from Storch. She laughs again, moving closer. JJ's wand doesn't lower. Storch's scales gleam and her eyes flash as heat emanates from the flames building withing. She's going to torch him. I have no idea what a ghost and dragon doing battle would look like. I don't want to know. I'd like to be a hardcore, but kicking witch that wields her power like nobody's business, slaying demons all night and setting everything right in the magical world. So that is what I will become. Starting now. I summon the depths of my energy, tugging at ribbons of power that had previously been almost out of my reach. I open windows in my mind, drawing on magic. Storch says, goodbye, cursed ghost boy. Without you, the wish witch will no longer have your counter-protection. She will be vulnerable and her wish will be exposed. JJ flinches as though this was a truth he was avoiding. I'm not sure you can set a ghost on fire, but as Storch rears up, we're not going to find out. Summoning all my magic, I throw myself between the dragon and JJ as she emits a scorching blast of fire. My magic acts as a shield and we both fly back onto the snow-covered ground. I blink my eyes a few times. Storch has turned as dark and crispy as a marshmallow, the kind Chelsea makes that are completely burnt. She's also completely still, stunned perhaps. Good. Her scales are matte black, her eyes covered in ash. It seems my magic caused her fire to rebound, but I don't think that can kill a dragon, not that I was intending to do so. Just maim and harm. 
show her that she may be a fear shifter, but I'm a witch and am not to be threatened or messed with. Not anymore. JJ helps me to my feet. His eyes show shock, but his lips reveal the hint of a smile. You protected me. We can talk about how awesome I am later. I'm not sure how long she's going to remain stunned. A chilling silver stream of magic shoots from JJ's wand and encapsulates the dragon in a snare. Long enough for the coven constabulary, or West, to get here and handle this. I lower my voice. I trust West, but I'm afraid our magical authorities have been compromised, corrupted. Not all. At that, the CC in the moto jacket and a few others appear along with Darrington. I eye her warily, afraid that I might still find my way to the Iron Tower, per Storch's orders. I take a deep breath of the soot-scented air, prepared to fight again if I have to. JJ takes control and explains what happened, the assassination order, and how Storch attacked. I don't expect them to believe him. A female CC, with thick braids and a violet and brown jacket, takes the lead. The only way Storch would end up like this is if she fired first and you blocked. It wasn't me, it was Maya, JJ says. Well done, she says in a low voice. Of course, there will be an investigation, but for now, you are free to go. Well, back to your dorms. She lifts her voice to the remaining students gathered around. I didn't realize we had an audience. Everyone find a chaperone and return to your dorms immediately. JJ's hand finds mine and grips tight. I don't think of you as a chaperone, you know. That would be kind of weird. I can't keep a smile out of my voice. Yes, despite the life-threatening near-death experience, we just had there's a flutter in my belly being so close to JJ, especially after our kiss outside the chapel. What do you think of me as, he asks. At that moment, Sage, Bobby's sister approaches. Her shoulders are hunched and she looks bashful. I didn't realize he was this far gone. Her tiger eyes, which are much like Bobby's, but darker meet mine. I didn't know it was so bad. I nod, feeling the sting of her betrayal when she went to Storch last fall, claiming that I was the one who ruined the Hallow's Eve ceremony, caused the demons to come into our realm, and broke the school and magical law. For the record, I didn't do it, I say this more to JJ than to her. I crack open the window to my mind and show him the memory of Bobby whispering the spell into my ear and then the moments in the cemetery when things went so wrong. Sage continues, I know that. I overheard him telling his friends that he was going to have you do it. He caught me, threatened me. I was afraid of what would happen, to me, if he got in trouble. It was selfish. I should have just told the truth. I'm sorry. There probably isn't anything I can do to make it better, but I'd like to try. If you ever need my help, or if there's anything I can do, please don't hesitate to ask. Find out who your brother is working with. I want names. It's bold, but other than going to the Iron Tower, at this point, I don't have much to lose. Sure, she says. The chaperones are calling the stragglers. Without another word, Sage hurries off. Strangely, that doesn't make me feel particularly better, considering Bobby attacked half the student body tonight, I say as we begin to walk toward the dorm. I have a feeling that it isn't over, JJ says. Not even if Storch and Bobby get in trouble. I've learned a lesson. When people I'm meant to be spying on ask me to do something that seems weird, tell someone. Trust in others to help. I'm used to doing things on my own and proving myself. I shrug not sure where I'm going with this. We're just outside the rumpus pitch. The flags hang limply under the blood moon. But the stars twinkle brightly. I wonder what would happen if I made a wish on one. I'm not going to try it now. JJ pauses in the shadow of the stands. You don't have to prove yourself. But thank you for not assassinating me. His lips quirk. How do you... Um, kill a ghost, anyway? The question feels wrong on my lips. He gives me a wary side eye, and then the corners crinkle with a smile. There are ways. But if I told you, I'd have to, he trails off. You saved me once. Now, you've saved me. 
We're even. Truce? I ask. His voice is low and husky when he says, I think we're well past a truce. Do you mean we're at war? Not with each other. But a war if hearts are involved. His gaze snags mine and holds. Maya, I will fight for you. Whatever comes, I am on your side. The way this makes my heart stutter and my stomach flutter almost causes me to tear my eyes away. Almost. What did Storch mean when she said if you're out of the picture, I'd feel vulnerable? Because that's precisely how I feel right now. It has to do with us being complementary opposites. The wish-curse connection. We were really good at hating each other. I'm glad you didn't follow Storch's orders. Should we keep hating each other? Did you really hate me? JJ asks with a sly note of knowing in his voice. Some of the time. I tease him with a smirk. It's then that it becomes crystal clear that I was pretending to like Bobby and pretending to hate JJ when really, it's the other way around. He shakes his head. We have two enemies, Storch who's connected to the corrupt Office of Magical Management. I believe, and West agrees, that they're working with non-magicals and moving to control us or eradicate us from the realm. There's also the Golden Hive, who are in the opposite position, trying to fortify their power and do away with mixed magicals and non-magicals. But for now, we don't have to worry about her. At least not directly. Then there are people like us, caught in the middle, and correction, we have three enemies if we count each other. I want to know where we stand. Let's not be enemies. Let's be allies. I was supposed to kill you. I need to know where we stand. I need to be sure of things between us. Instead, you kissed me. You kissed me, I correct. He waves his hand in the air, dismissively. Tomatoes, tomatoes, he says in his dreamy accent. Potatoes, I start to reply and was going to add potatoes, but his mouth lands on mine and we kiss under the blood moon and the stars. It's cold and warm, forbidden and filled with desire. JJ's hands find their way to my neck and then down my back, pulling me closer, I don't have to pretend or question any longer. I've definitely fallen for him. I'm certain there is more danger to come, but also a wish to make that might just save the day, as soon as I figure out how to do that. Thank you for listening. Be sure to listen to Book 3 in the series for the conclusion.